Chapter 63 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nick Gold, London. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter 63 The Lo Cha Country and the Sea Market Once upon a time there was a young man named Ma Chun, who was also known as Lung Mai. He was the son of a trader and a youth of surpassing beauty. His manners were courteous and he loved nothing better than singing and playing. He used to associate with actors and with an embroidered handkerchief round his head, the effect was that of a beautiful woman. Hence he acquired the sobriquet of the beauty. At fourteen years of age he graduated and began to make a name for himself, but his father, who was growing old and wished to retire from business, said to him, My boy, book learning will never fill your belly or put a coat on your back. You had better much stick to the old thing. Accordingly, Ma, from that time, occupied himself with scales and weights, with principle and interest and such matters. He made a voyage across the sea and was carried away by a typhoon. After being tossed about for many days and nights, he arrived at a country where the people were hideously ugly. When these people saw Ma, they thought he was a devil and all ran screeching away. Ma was somewhat alarmed at this, but finding that it was they who were frightened at him, he quickly turned their fear to his own advantage. If he came across people eating and drinking, he would rush upon them, and when they fled away for fear, he would regale himself upon what they had left. By and by he went to a village among the hills, and there the people had, at any rate, some facial resemblance to ordinary men. But they were all in rags and tatters like beggars. So Ma sat down to rest under a tree, and the villagers, not daring to come near him, contented themselves with looking at him from a distance. They soon found, however, that he did not want to eat them, and by degrees approached a little closer to him. Ma, smiling, began to talk, and, although their language was different, yet he was able to make himself tolerably intelligible and told them whence he had come. The villagers were much pleased and spread the news that the stranger was not a man-eater. Nevertheless, the very ugliest of them would only take a look and be off again. They would not come near him. Those who did go up to him were not very much like his own countrymen, the Chinese. They bought him plenty of food and wine. Ma asked them what they were afraid of. They replied, We had heard from our forefathers that 26,000 li to the west there is a country called China. We heard that people of that land were the most extraordinary in appearance that you can possibly imagine. Hitherto it has been hearsay. We can now believe it. He then asked them how it was that they were so poor. They answered, you see, in our country everything depends not on literary talent, but on beauty. The most beautiful are made ministers of state, the next handsomest are made judges and magistrates, and the third class in looks are employed in the palace of the king. Thus these that are enabled out of their pay to provide for their wives and families. But we, from our very birth, are regarded by parents as inauspicious, and are left to perish, some of us being occasionally preserved by more humane parents to prevent the extinction of the family. Ma asked the name of their country, and they told him it was Lo Cha, also that the capital city was some thirty li to the north. He begged them to take him there, and next day, at Cock Crow, he started thitherwards in their company, arriving just about dawn. The walls of the city were made of black stone, as black as ink, and the city gatehouses were about a hundred feet high. Red stones were used for tiles, 
and picking up a broken piece, Ma found that it marked his fingernail like a vermilion. They arrived just when the court was rising and saw all the equipage of the officials. The village people pointed out the one who they said was Prime Minister. His ears drooped forward in flaps. He had three nostrils and his eyelashes were just like bamboo screens hanging in front of his eyes. Then several came out on horseback and they said they were all privy councillors. So they went on telling him the rank of all those ugly uncouth fellows he saw. The lower he got down the official scales the less hideous the officials were. By and by Ma went back to the people in the streets marvelling very much to see him and tumbling helter-skelter one over another as if they had met a goblin. The villagers shouted out to reassure them and then they stood at a distance to look at him. When he got back there was not a man, woman or child in the whole nation but knew that there was a strange man at the village and the gentry and officials became very desirous to see him. However, if he went to any of their houses, the porter always slammed the door in his face, and the master, mistress and family in general would only peep at him and speak to him through the cracks. Not a single one dared receive him face to face, but, finally, the village people, at a loss what to do, bethought themselves of a man who had been sent by a former king on official business among strange nations. He, said they, having seen many kinds of men, will not be afraid of you. So they went to his house, where they were received in a very friendly way. He seemed to be about eighty or ninety years of age, his eyeballs protruded and his beard curled up like a hedgehog. He said, In my youth I was sent by the king to many nations, but I never went to China. I am now one hundred and twenty years of age, and that I should be permitted to see a native of your country is a fact which it will be my duty to report to the throne. For ten years and more I have not been to court, but have remained here in seclusion. Yet I will now make an effort on your behalf. Then followed a banquet, and when the wine had already circulated pretty freely, some dozen singing girls came in and sang and danced before them. The girls all wore white embroidered turbans and long scarlet robes, which trailed on the ground. The words they uttered were unintelligible, and the tunes they played perfectly hideous. The host, however, seemed to enjoy it very much and said to Ma, Have you music in China? He replied that they had, and the old man asked for a specimen. Ma hummed him a tune, beating time on the table, with which he was very much pleased, declaring that his guest had the voice of a phoenix and the notes of a dragon, such as he had never heard before. The next day he presented a memorial to the throne, and the king at once commanded Ma to appear before him, Several of the ministers, however, represented that his appearance was so hideous that it might frighten his majesty, and the king accordingly desisted from his intention. The old man returned and told Ma, being quite upset about it. They had remained together some time until they had drunk themselves into a tipsy. Then Ma, seizing a sword, began to attitudinize smearing his face all over with coal dust. He acted the part of Chang Fai, at which his host was so delighted that he begged him to appear before the Prime Minister in the character of Chang Fai. Ma replied, I don't mind a little amateur acting, but how can I play the hypocrite for my own personal advantage? On being pressed, he consented, and the old man prepared a great feast and asked some of the high officials to be present, telling Ma to paint himself as before. When the guests had arrived, Ma was brought out to see them, whereupon they all exclaimed, Ay, ya! How is it that he was so ugly before, and is now so beautiful? By and by, when they were all taking wine together, Ma began to sing them a most bewitching song, and they got so excited over it, but the next day they recommended him to the king. 
the king sent a special summons for him to appear and asked him many questions about the government of China, to all of which Ma replied in detail, eliciting sighs of admiration from his majesty. He was honoured with a banquet in the royal guest pavilion, and when the king had made himself tipsy, he said to him, I hear you are a very skilful musician. Will you be good enough to let me hear you? Ma then got up and began to attitudinize, singing a plaintive air like the girls with the turbans. The king was charmed, and at once made him a privy councillor, giving him a private banquet and bestowing other marks of royal favour. As time went on, his fellow officials found out the secret of his painted face, and whenever he was among them, they were always whispering together, besides which they avoided being near him as much as possible. Thus, Ma was left to himself, and found his position anything but pleasant in, in consequence. So he memorialised the throne, asking to be allowed to retire from office. Thus, Ma was left to himself, and found his position anything but pleasant in consequence. So he memorialised the throne, asking to be allowed to retire from office, but his request was refused. He then said his health was bad and got three months sick leave, during which he packed up his valuables and went back to the village. The villagers, on his arrival, went down on their knees to him and he distributed gold and jewels amongst his old friends. They were very glad to see him and said, Your kindness shall be repaid when we go to the sea market. We will bring you some pearls and things. Ma asked them where that was. They said it was at the bottom of the sea where the mermaids kept their treasures and that as many as twelve nations were accustomed to go thither to trade. Also that it was frequented by spirits and that to get there it was necessary to pass through red vapours and great waves. Dear sir, they said, do not yourself risk this great danger but let us take your money and purchase these rare pearls for you. The season is now at hand. Ma asked them how they knew this. They said, Whenever we see red birds flying backwards and forwards over the sea, we know that within seven days the market will be open. He asked when they were going to start, that he might accompany them, but they begged him not to think of doing so. He replied, I am a sailor, how can I be afraid of wind and waves? Very soon after this, people came with merchandise to forward, and Ma packed up and went aboard the vessel that was going. This vessel held some tens of people, was flat-bottomed with a railing all round, and rowed by ten men. It cut through the water like an arrow. After a voyage of three days, they saw a far-off, faint outlines of towers and minarets and crowds of trading vessels. They soon arrived at the city, the walls of which were made of bricks as long as a man's body, the tops of its buildings being lost in the Milky Way. Having made fast their boat, they went in and saw laid out in the market rare pearls and wondrous precious stones of dazzling beauty such as are quite unknown amongst men. Then they saw a young man come forth riding upon a beautiful steed. The people of the market stood back to let him pass, saying he was the third son of the king. But when the prince saw Ma, he exclaimed, This is no foreigner. And immediately an attendant drew near and asked his name and country. Ma made a bow and standing at one side, told his name and family. The prince smiled and said, For you have honoured our country, thus is no small piece of good luck. He then gave him a horse and begged him to follow. They went out of the city gate and down to the seashore, whereupon their horses plunged into the water. Ma was terribly frightened and screamed out, but the sea opened dry before them and formed a wall of water on either side. In a little time they reached the king's palace, the beams of which were made of tortoise shell and tiles of fish scales. 
The four walls were of crystal and dazzled the eye like mirrors. They got down off their horses and went in, and Ma was introduced to the king. The young prince said, Sire, I have been to the market and have got a gentleman from China. Whereupon Ma, Ma made obeisance before the king, who addressed him as follows. Sir, from a talented scholar like yourself, I venture to ask for a few stanzas upon our sea market. Pray do not refuse. Ma, thereupon, made a cot owl and undertook the king's command. Using an ink slab of crystal, a brush of dragon's beard, paper as white as snow, and ink scented like the larkspur, Ma immediately threw off some thousand odd verses, which he laid at the feet of the king. When his majesty saw them, he said, Sir, your genius does honour to these marine nations of ours. Then, summoning the members of the royal family, the king gave a great feast in the coloured cloud pavilion, and when the wine had circulated freely, seizing a great goblet in his hand, the king rose and said before all the guests, It is a thousand pities, sir, that you are not married. What say you to entering the bonds of wedlock? Ma rose, blushing, and stammered out his thanks, upon which the king, looking round, spoke a few words to the attendants, and in a few moments in came a bevy of court ladies, supporting the king's daughter, whose ornaments went tinkle-tinkle as she walked along. Immediately the nuptial drums and trumpets began to sound forth, and bride and bridegroom worshipped heaven and earth together. Stealing a glance, Ma saw that the princess was endowed with a fairy-like loveliness. When the ceremony was over, she retired, and by and by the wine party broke up. Then came several beautifully dressed waiting maids, who, with painted candles, escorted Ma within. The bridal couch was made of coral, adorned with eight kinds of precious stones, and the curtains were thickly hung with pearls as big as acorns. Next day, at dawn, a crowd of young slave girls trooped into the room to offer their services. Whereupon Ma got up and went off to court to pay his respects to the king. He was then duly received as royal son-in-law and made an officer of state. The fame of his poetical talents spread far and wide and the kings of the various seas sent officers to congratulate him, vying with each other in their invitations to him. Ma dressed himself in gorgeous clothes and went forth riding on a superb steed with a mounted bodyguard, all splendidly armed. There were musicians on horseback and musicians in chariots, and in three days he had visited every one of the marine kingdoms, making his name known in all directions. In the palace there was a jade tree, about as big and round as a man could clasp. Its roots were as clear as glass, and up the middle ran, as it were, a stick of pale yellow. The branches were the size of one's arm, the leaves like white jade, as thick as copper cash. The foliage was dense, and beneath its shade the ladies of the palace were wont to sit and sing. The flowers which covered the tree resembled grapes, and if a single petal fell to the earth it made a ringing sound. Taking one up, it would be found to be exactly like carved cornelian, very bright and pretty to look at. From time to time a wonderful bird came and sang there. Its feathers were of a golden hue, and its tail as long as its body. Its notes were like the tinkling of jade, very plaintive and touching to listen to. When Ma heard this bird sing, it called up in him recollections of his old home, and accordingly he sang to the princess. I have now been away from my own country for three years, separated from my father and mother. Thinking of them, my tears flow, and the perspiration runs down my back. Can you return with me? His wife replied, The way of immortals is not that of men. I am unable to do what you ask, but I cannot allow the feelings of husband and wife to break the tie of parent and child. Let us devise some plan. 
When Ma heard this, he wept bitterly, and the princess sighed and said, We cannot both stay or both go. The next day the king said to him, I hear that you are pining for your old home. Will tomorrow suit you for taking leave? Ma thanked the king for his great kindness, which he declared he could never forget, and promised to return very shortly. That evening the princess and Ma talked over their wine of their approaching separation. Ma said they would soon meet again, but his wife averred that their married life was at an end. Then he wept afresh, but the princess said, Like a filial son, you are going home to your parents. In the meetings and separations of this life, a hundred years seem but a single day. Why then should we give way to tears like children? I will be true to you, and do you be faithful to me, and then, though separated, we shall be united in spirit, a happy pair. Is it necessary to live side by side in order to grow old together? If you break our contract, your next marriage will not be a propitious one. But if loneliness overtakes you, then choose a concubine. There is one point more of which I would speak with reference to our married life. I am about to become a mother, and I pray you give me a name for your child. To this, Ma replied, If a girl, I would have her called Lung Kung. If a boy, then give him the name Fu Hai. The princess asked for some token of remembrance, and Ma gave her a pair of jade lilies that he had got during his stay at the Marine Kingdom. She added, on the eighth of the fourth moon, three years hence, when you once more steer your course for this country, I will give you up your child. She next packed a leather bag full of jewels and handed it to Ma, saying, Take care of this, it will be a provision for many generations. When the day began to break, a splendid farewell feast was given him by the king, and Ma bade them all adieu. The princess, in a car drawn by snow-white sheep, escorted him to the boundary of the marine kingdom, where he dismounted and stepped ashore. Farewell, cried the princess, as her returning car bore her rapidly away, and the sea, closing over her, snatched her from her husband's sight. Ma returned to his home across the ocean. Some had thought him long since dead and gone. All marvelled at his story. Happily, his father and mother were yet alive, though his former wife had married another man, and so he understood why the princess had pledged him to constancy, for she already knew that this had taken place. His father wished him to take another wife, but he would not. He only took a concubine. Then, after the three years had passed away, he started across the sea on his return journey, when, lo, he beheld... Riding on the wave crests and splashing about in the water in playing, two young children. On going near, one of them seized hold of him and sprung up into his arms, upon which the elder cried until he too was waken up. On going near, one of them seized hold of him and sprung into his arms, upon which the elder cried until he too was taken up. They were a boy and a girl, both very lovely, and wearing embroidered caps adorned with jade lilies. On the back of one of them was a worked case, in which Ma found the following letter. I presume my father and mother-in-law are well. Three years have passed away, and destiny still keeps us apart. Across the great ocean, the letter bird would find no path. I have been with you in my dreams, until I am quite worn out. Does the blue sky look down upon any grief like mine? Yet Chang Go lives solitary in the moon, and Chi Nu laments that she cannot cross the Silver River. Who am I that I should expect happiness to be mine? Truly, this thought turns my tears into joy. Two months after your departure, I had twins, who can already prattle away in the language of childhood. At one moment, snatching a date, at another a pair. Had they no mother, they would still live. These I now send to you, with the jade lilies that you gave me in their hats, in token of the sender. When you take them upon your knee, think that I am standing by your side. I know that you have kept your promise to me, and I am happy. I shall take no second husband, even unto death. 
All thoughts of dress and finery are gone from me. My looking glass sees no new fashions. My face has long been unpowdered, my eyebrows unblacked. You are my Ulysses, I am your Penelope. Though not actually leading a married life, how can it be said that we are not husband and wife? Your father and mother will take their grandchildren upon their knees, though they have never set eyes upon the bride. Alas, there is something wrong in this. Next year your mother will enter upon the long night. I shall be there by the side of the grave, as is becoming in her daughter-in-law. From this time forth our daughter will be well. Later on she will be able to grasp her mother's hand. Our boy, when he grows up, may possibly be able to come to and fro. Adieu, dear husband, adieu, though I am leaving much unsaid. Ma read the letter over and over again, his tears flowing all the time. His two children clung round his neck and begged him to take them home. Ah, my children, he said, where is your home? Then they all wept bitterly, and Ma, looking at the great ocean stretching away to meet the sky, lovely and pathless, embraced his children and proceeded sorrowfully to return. Knowing too that his mother could not last long, he prepared everything necessary for the ceremony of interment and planted a hundred young pine trees at her grave. The following year the old lady did die, and her coffin was borne to its last resting place, when lo, there was the princess standing by the side of the grave. The onlookers were much alarmed, but in a moment there was a flash of lightning, followed by a clap of thunder, and a squall of rain, and she was gone. It was then noticed that many of the young pine trees which had died, were one and all brought to life. Subsequently, Fu Hai went in search of the mother for whom he pined so much, and after some days' absence, returned. Lung Kung, being a girl, could not accompany him, but she mourned much in secret. One dark day, her mother entered and bid her dry her eyes, saying, My child, you must get married. Why these tears? She then gave her a tree of coral, eight feet in height, some barus camphor, one hundred valuable pearls, and two boxes inlaid with gold and precious stones as her dowry. Ma, having found out she was there, rushed in, and seizing her hand, began to weep for joy, when suddenly a violent peal of thunder rent the building, and the princess had vanished. End of chapter 63 Recording by Nick Gold, London Chapter 64 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935 Chapter 64 The Fighting Cricket During the reign of Suan Te, cricket fighting was very much in vogue at court, levies of crickets being exacted from the people as a tax. On one occasion, the magistrate of Hua Yin, wishing to make friends with the governor, presented him with a cricket, which, on being set to fight, displayed very remarkable powers, so much so that the governor commanded the magistrate to supply him regularly with these insects. The latter, in his turn, ordered the beetles of his district to provide him with crickets, and then it became a practice for people who had nothing else to do to catch and rear them for this purpose. Thus the price of crickets rose very high, and when the beetles' runners came to exact even a single one, it was enough to ruin several families. Now in the village of which we are speaking, there lived a man named Chang, a student who had often failed for his bachelor's degree, and, being a stupid sort of fellow, his name was sent in for the post of Beetle. He did all he could to get out of it, but without success, and by the end of the year his small patrimony was gone. Just then came a call for crickets, and Chang, not daring to make a like call upon his neighbors, was at his wit's end, 
and in his distress determined to commit suicide. "'What's the use of that?' cried his wife. "'You'd do better to go out and try to find some.' So off went Chang in the early morning with a bamboo tube and a silk net, not returning till late at night, and he searched about in tumble-down walls, in bushes, under stones, and in holes, but without catching more than two or three, do what he would. Even those he did catch were weak creatures, and of no use at all, which made the magistrate fix a limit of time, the result of which was that in a few days Cheng got one hundred blows with the bamboo. This made him so sore that he was quite unable to go after the crickets any more, and as he lay tossing and turning on the bed, he determined once again to put an end to his life. About that time, a hump-backed fortune-teller of great skill arrived at the village, and Cheng's wife, putting together a trifle of money, went off to seek his assistance. The door was literally blocked up, fair young girls and white-headed dames crowding in from all quarters. A room was darkened and the bamboo screen hung at the door, an altar being arranged outside at which the fortune-seekers burnt incense in a brazier and prostrated themselves twice while the soothsayer stood by the side and, looking up into vacancy, prayed for a response. His lips opened and shut, but nobody heard what he said, all standing there in awe, waiting for the answer. In a few moments, a piece of paper was thrown from behind the screen, and the soothsayer said that the petitioner's desire would be accomplished in the way he wished. Cheng's wife now advanced, and placing some money on the altar, burnt her incense and prostrated herself in a similar manner. In a few moments the screen began to move, and a piece of paper was thrown down, on which there were no words but only a picture. In the middle was a building like a temple, and behind this a small hill, at the foot of which were a number of curious stones, with the long spiky feelers of innumerable crickets appearing from behind. Hard by was a frog, which seemed to be engaged in putting itself into various kinds of attitudes. The good woman had no idea what it all meant, but she noticed the crickets, and accordingly went off home to tell her husband. Ah, said he, this is to show me where to hunt for crickets, and on looking closely at the picture, he saw that the building very much resembled a temple to the east of their village. So he forced himself to get up, and leaning on a stick, went out to seek crickets behind the temple. Rounding an old grave, he came upon a place where stones were lying scattered about as in the picture, and then he set himself to watch attentively. He might as well have been looking for a needle or a grain of mustard seed, and by degrees he became quite exhausted without finding anything, when suddenly an old frog jumped out. Cheng was a little startled, but immediately pursued the frog, which retreated into the bushes. He then saw one of the insects he wanted sitting at the root of a bramble, but on making a grab at it, the cricket ran into a hole from which he was unable to move it until he poured in some water, when out the little creature came. It was a magnificent specimen, strong and handsome, with a fine tail, green neck, and golden wings, and putting it in his basket, he returned home in a high glee to receive the congratulations of his family. He would not have taken anything for this cricket, and proceeded to feed it up carefully in a bowl. Its belly was the color of a crab's, its back that of a sweet chestnut, and Cheng tended it most lovingly, waiting for the time when the magistrate should call upon him for a cricket. Meanwhile, a son of Cheng's, age nine, one day took the opportunity of his father being out to open the bowl. Instantaneously, the cricket made a spring forward and was gone, and all efforts to catch it again were unavailing. At length, the boy made a grab at it with his hand, but only succeeded in seizing one of its legs, which thereupon broke, and the little creature soon afterwards died. Cheng's wife turned deadly pale when her son, with tears in his eyes, told her what had happened. "'Oh, won't you catch it when your father comes home?' said she, at which the boy ran away, crying bitterly. Soon after, Cheng arrived, and when he heard his wife's story, he felt as if he had been turned to ice, and went in search of his son, who, however, was nowhere to be found, 
until at length they discovered his body lying at the bottom of a well. Their anger was thus turned to grief, and death seemed as though it would be a pleasant relief to them as they sat facing each other in silence in their thatched and smokeless hut. At evening they prepared to bury the boy, but on touching the body, lo, he was still breathing. Overjoyed, they placed him upon the bed, and towards the middle of the night he came round, but a drop of bitterness was mingled in his parents' cup when they found that his reason had fled. His father, however, caught sight of the empty bowl in which he had kept the cricket, and ceased to think any more about his son, never once closing his eyes all night, and as day gradually broke, There he lay, stiff and stark, until suddenly he heard the chirping of a cricket outside the house door. Jumping up in a great hurry to see, there was his lost insect. But on trying to catch it, away it hopped directly. At last he got it under his hand, though when he came to close his fingers on it, there was nothing in them. So he went on, chasing it up and down, until finally it hopped into a corner of the wall and then, looking carefully about, he espied it once more, no longer the same in appearance, but small and of a dark red color. Cheng stood looking at it, without trying to catch such a worthless specimen, when all of a sudden the little creature hopped into his sleeve, and, on examining it more nearly, he saw that it really was a handsome insect, with well-formed head and neck, and forthwith took it indoors. He was now anxious to try its prowess, and it so happened that a young fellow of the village, who had a fine cricket, which used to win every bout it fought, and was so valuable to him that he wanted a high price for it, called on Cheng that very day. He laughed heartily at Cheng's champion, and, producing his own, placed it side by side to the great disadvantage of the former. Cheng's countenance fell, and he no longer wished to back his cricket. However, the young fellow urged him, and he thought that there was no use in rearing a feeble insect, and that he had better sacrifice it for a laugh. So they put them together in a bowl. The little cricket lay quite still like a piece of wood, at which the young fellow roared again, and louder than ever when it did not move, even though tickled with a pig's bristle. By dint of tickling it was roused at last, and then it fell upon its adversary with such fury that in a moment the young fellow's cricket would have been killed outright had not its master interfered and stopped the fight. The little cricket then stood up and chirped to Chang as a sign of victory, and Chang, overjoyed, was just talking over the battle with the young fellow when a cock caught sight of the insect and ran up to eat it. Chang was in a great state of alarm, but the cock luckily missed its aim and the cricket hopped away, its enemy pursuing at full speed. In another moment, it would have been snapped up, when, lo, to his great astonishment, Cheng saw his cricket seated on the cock's head, holding firmly onto its comb. He then put it into a cage, and by and by sent it to the magistrate, who, seeing what a small one he had provided, was very angry indeed. Cheng told the story of the cock, which the magistrate refused to believe, and set it to fight with other crickets, all of which it vanquished without exception. He then tried it with a cock, and, as all turned out as Cheng had said, he gave him a present, and sent the cricket in to the governor. The governor put it into a golden cage and forwarded it to the palace, accompanied by some remarks on its performances, and when there it was found that of all the splendid collection of his imperial majesty, not one was worthy to be placed alongside of this one. It would dance in time to music and thus became a great favorite, the emperor in return bestowing magnificent gifts of horses and silks upon the governor. The governor did not forget whence he had obtained the cricket, and the magistrate also well rewarded Chang by excusing him from the duties of beetle and by instructing the literary chancellor to pass him for the first degree. A few months afterwards, Cheng's son recovered his intellect, and said that he had been a cricket, and had proved himself a very skillful fighter. The governor, too, rewarded Cheng handsomely, and in a few years he was a rich man, with flocks and herds and houses and acres, 
quite one of the wealthiest of mankind. End of chapter 64 The Fighting Cricket Recording by Holly Jensen Chapter 65 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Soling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 65, Taking Revenge. Sang Kao, otherwise called Shutan, was a Taiyuan man, and deeply attached to his half-brother Shang. Shang himself was desperately enamored of a young lady named Po Su, who was also very fond of him, but the mother wanted too much money for her daughter. Now a rich young fellow named Chuang thought he should like to get Po Su for himself, and proposed to buy her as a concubine. No, no, said Po Su to her mother. I prefer being Shang's wife to becoming Chuang's concubine. So her mother consented and informed Shang, who had only recently buried his first wife, at which he was delighted, and made preparations to take her over to his own house. When Chuang heard this, he was infuriated against Shang for thus depriving him of Su, and chancing to meet him out one day, set to and abused him roundly. Shang answered him back, and then Chuang ordered his attendants to fall upon Shang and beat him well, which they did, leaving him lifeless on the ground. When Sang heard what had taken place, he ran out, and found his brother lying dead upon the ground. Overcome with grief, he proceeded to the magistrates, and accused Chuang of murder. But the latter bribed so heavily that nothing came of the accusation. This worked Sang to frenzy, and he determined to assassinate Chuang on the high road, with which intent he daily concealed himself with a sharp knife about him among the bushes on the hillside, waiting for Chuang to pass. By degrees, this plan of his became known far and wide, and accordingly Chuang never went out except with a strong bodyguard, besides which he engaged at a high price the services of a very skillful archer named Chiao Tung, so that Xiang had no means of carrying out his intention. However, he continued to lie in wait day after day, and on one occasion it began to rain heavily, and in a short time Tsang was wet through to the skin. Then the wind got up, and a hailstorm followed, and by and by Tsang was quite numbed with the cold. On the top of the hill there was a small temple wherein lived a Taoist priest, whom Tsang knew from the latter having occasionally begged alms in the village, and to whom he had often given a meal. This priest, seeing how wet he was, gave him some other clothes, and told him to put them on. But no sooner had he done so than he crouched down like a dog, and found that he had been changed into a tiger, and that the priest had vanished. It now occurred to him to seize this opportunity of revenging himself upon his enemy, and away he went to his old ambush, where, lo and behold, he found his own body lying stiff and stark. Fearing lest it should become food for birds of prey, he guarded it carefully, until at length one day Chuang passed by. Out rushed the tiger and sprang upon Chuang, biting his head off and swallowing it upon the spot, at which Chiao Tung, the archer, turned round and shot the animal through the heart. Just at that moment, Tsang wakened as though from a dream, but it was some time before he could crawl home, where he arrived to the great delight of his family, which didn't know what had become of him. Tsang said not a word, lying quietly on the bed, until some of his people came in to congratulate him on the death of his great enemy Twang. Tsang then cried out, I was that tiger, and proceeded to relate the whole story, which thus got about until it reached the ears of Twang's son, who immediately set to work to bring his father's murderer to justice. The magistrate, however, did not consider this wild story as sufficient evidence against him, and thereupon dismissed the case. End of chapter 65 Recording by Todd Chapter 66 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Soling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 66. The Tipsy Turtle. At Lin Tiao there lived a Mr. Feng, 
whose other name the person who told me the story could not remember. He belonged to a good family, though now somewhat falling into decay. Now a certain man, who caught turtles, owed him some money which he could not pay, but whenever he captured any turtles he used to send one to Mr. Fang. One day he took an enormous creature with a white spot on its forehead, but Fang was so struck with something in its appearance that he let it go again. A little while afterwards he was returning home from his son-in-law's, and had reached the banks of the river when in the dusk of the evening he saw a drunken man come rolling along, attended by two or three servants. No sooner did he perceive Fang than he called out, Who are you? To which Fang replied that he was a traveller. And haven't you got a name? shouted out the drunken man in a rage. That you must call yourself a traveller? To this Fang made no reply, but tried to pass by, whereupon he found himself seized by the sleeve and unable to move. His adversary smelt horribly of wine, and at length Fang asked him, saying, And pray who are you? Oh, I am the late magistrate of none too, answered he. What do you want to know for? A nice disgrace to society you are too, cried Fang. However, I am glad to hear you are only late magistrate, for if you had been present magistrate, there would have been bad times in store for travellers. This made the drunken man furious, and he was proceeding to use violence, when Fang cried out, My name is so-and-so, and I'm not the man to stand this sort of thing from anybody. No sooner had he uttered these words than the drunken man's rage was turned into joy, and falling on his knees before Fang, he said, My benefactor, please excuse my rudeness. And getting up, he told his servants to go on ahead and get something ready. Fang, at first, declining to go with him, but yielding on being pressed. Taking his hand, the drunken man led him along a short distance until they reached a village, where there was a very nice house and grounds, quite like the establishment of a person of position. As his friend was now getting sober, Fang inquired what might be his name. "'Don't be frightened when I tell you,' said the other. "'I am the eighth prince of the Tiao River. I have just been out to take wine with a friend, and somehow I got tipsy. Hence my bad behavior to you, which please forgive.' Fang now knew that he was not of mortal flesh and blood, but seeing how kindly he himself was treated, he was not a bit afraid. A banquet followed with plenty of wine, of which the eighth prince drank so freely that Fang thought he would soon be worse than ever, and accordingly said he felt tipsy himself, and asked to be allowed to go to bed. "'Never fear,' answered the prince, who perceived Fang's thoughts. "'Many drunkards will tell you that they cannot remember in the morning the extravagances of the previous night,' but I tell you this is all nonsense, and that in nine cases out of ten those extravagances are committed wittingly and with malice prepense. Now, though I am not the same order of being as yourself, I should never venture to behave badly in your good presence, so pray do not leave me thus. Fang then sat down again, and said to the prince, Since you are aware of this, why not change your ways? Ah, uh, replied the prince, when I was a magistrate, I drank much more than I do now. But I got into disgrace with the emperor and was banished here, since which time, ten years and more, I have tried to reform. Now, however, I am drawing near the wood, and being unable to move about much, the old vice has come upon me again. I have found it impossible to stop myself. But perhaps what you say may do me some good." While they were thus talking, the sound of a distant bell broke upon their ears, and the prince, getting up and seizing Feng's hand, said, We could not remain together any longer, but I will give you something by which I may in part requite your kindness to me. It must not be kept for any great length of time. When you have attained your wishes, then I will receive it back again. Thereupon he spit out of his mouth a tiny man, no more than an inch high, and scratching Feng's arm with his nails until Feng felt as if the skin was gone, he quickly laid the little man upon the spot. When he let go, the latter had already sunk into the skin, and nothing was to be seen but a cicatrix well healed over. Fang now asked what it all meant, but the prince only laughed and said, It's time for you to go, and forthwith escorted him to the door. The prince here bade him adieu, and when he looked round, prince, village, and house had all disappeared together, leaving behind a great turtle which waddled down into the water, and disappeared likewise. He could now easily account for the prince's present to him, and from this moment his sight became intensely keen. He could see precious stones lying in the bowels of the earth, 
and was able to look down as far as hell itself, besides which he suddenly found that he knew the names of many things of which he had never heard before. From below his own bedroom he dug up many hundred ounces of pure silver, upon which he lived very comfortably, and once, when a house was for sale, he perceived that in it lay concealed a vast quantity of gold, so he immediately bought it, and so became immensely rich in all kinds of valuables. He secured a mirror, on the back of which was a phoenix, surrounded by water and clouds, and portraits of the celebrated wives of the Emperor Shun, so beautifully executed that each hair of the head and eyebrows could easily be counted. If any woman's face came upon the mirror, there it remained indelibly fixed and not to be rubbed out. But if the same woman looked into the mirror again, dressed in a different dress, or if some other woman chanced to look in, then the former face would gradually fade away. Now the third princess in Prince Su's family was very beautiful, and Fang, who had long heard of her fame, concealed himself on the Katong Hill, when he knew the princess was going there. He waited until she alighted from her chair, and then getting the mirror full upon her, he walked off home. Laying it on the table, he saw therein a lovely girl in the act of raising her handkerchief, and with a sweet smile playing over her face. Her lips seemed about to move, and a twinkle was discernible in her eyes. Delighted with his picture, he put the mirror very carefully away. But in about a year his wife had let the story leak out, and the prince, hearing of it, threw Fang into prison, and took possession of the mirror. Fang was to be beheaded. However, he bribed one of the prince's ladies to tell his highness that if he would pardon him all the treasures of the earth might easily become his. Whereas, on the other hand, his death could not possibly be of any advantage to the prince. The prince now thought of confiscating all his goods and banishing him. But the third princess observed that, as he had already seen her, were he to die ten times over, it would not give her back her lost vase, and that she had much better marry him. The prince would not hear of this, whereupon his daughter shut herself up and refused all nourishment, at which the ladies of the palace were dreadfully alarmed and reported it at once to the prince. Fang was, accordingly, liberated, and was informed of the determination of the princess, which, however, he declined to fall in with, saying that he was not going thus to sacrifice the wife of his days of poverty, and would rather die than carry out such an order. He added that if his highness would consent, he would purchase his liberty at the price of everything he had. The prince was exceedingly angry at this, and seized Fang again, and meanwhile one of the concubines got Fang's wife into the palace, intending to poison her. Feng's wife, however, brought her a beautiful present of a coral stand for a looking-glass, and was so agreeable in her conversation that the concubine took a great fancy to her, and presented her to the princess, who was equally pleased, and forthwith determined that they would both be Feng's wives. When Feng heard of this plan, he said to his wife, With a prince's daughter there can be no distinctions of first and second wife. But Mrs. Feng paid no heed to him, and immediately sent off to the prince such an enormous quantity of valuables that it took a thousand men to carry them, and the prince himself had never before heard of such treasures in his life. Feng was now liberated once more, and solemnized his marriage with the princess. One night after this he dreamt that the eighth prince came to him and asked him to return his former present, saying that to keep it too long would be injurious to his chances of life. Feng asked him to take a drink, but the eighth prince said that he had forsworn wine, acting under Fang's advice, for three years. He then bit Fang's arm, and the latter waked up with a pain to find the circuitrix on his arm was no longer there. End of chapter 66 Recording by Todd Chapter 67 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to Chapter 67. The Magic Path. In the province of Kuang Tung, there lived a scholar named Kuo, who was one evening on his way home from a friend's when he lost his way among the hills. He got into a thick jungle, where after about an hour's wandering, he suddenly heard the sound of laughing and talking on the top of the hill. Hurrying up in the direction of the sound, he beheld some ten or a dozen persons sitting on the ground, engaged in drinking. 
No sooner had they caught sight of Kuo than they all cried out, Come along, just room for one more. You're in the nick of time. So Kuo sat down with the company, most of whom he noticed, belonged to the literati, and began by asking them to direct him on his way home. But one of them cried out, A nice sort of fellow you are to be bothering about your way home and paying no attention to the fine moon we have got tonight. The speaker then presented him with a goblet of wine of exquisite bouquet, which Kuo drank off at a draught, and another gentleman filled up again for him at once. Now Kuo was pretty good in that line, and being very thirsty, withal from his long walk, tossed off bumper after bumper, to the great delight of his hosts, who were unanimous in voting him a jolly good fellow. He was, moreover, full of fun, and could imitate exactly the note of any kind of bird. So all of a sudden he began on the sly to twitter like a swallow, to the great astonishment of the others, who wondered how it was a swallow could be out so late. He then changed his note to that of a cuckoo, sitting there laughing and saying nothing, while his hosts were discussing the extraordinary sounds they had just heard. After a while he imitated a parrot and cried, Mr. Kuo was very drunk. You'd better see him home. And then the sounds ceased, beginning again by and by, when at last the others found out who it was, and all burst out laughing. They screwed up their mouths and tried to whistle like Kuo, but none of them could do so, and soon one of them observed, What a pity Madame Chiang isn't with us. We must rendezvous here again at mid-autumn, and you, Mr. Kuo, must be sure and come. Kuo said he would, whereupon another of his hosts got up and remarked that as he had given them such an amusing entertainment, they would try to show him a few acrobatic feats. They all arose, and one of them, planting his feet firmly, a second jumped up to his shoulders, a third onto the second's shoulders, and a fourth onto his, until it was too high for the rest to jump up, and accordingly they began to climb as though it had been a ladder. When they were all up, and the topmost head seemed to touch the clouds, the whole column bent gradually down until it lay along the ground, transformed into a path. Kuo remained for some time in a state of considerable alarm, and then, setting out along this path, ultimately reached his own home. Some days afterward, he revisited the spot and saw the remains of a feast lying about on the ground, with dense bushes on all sides, but no sign of a path. At mid-autumn he thought of keeping his engagement, However, his friends persuaded him not to go. End of chapter 67。Chapter 68 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935. The Faithless Widow. Mr. Neal was a Kiangsi man, who traded in peace goods. He married a wife from the Chang family, by whom he had two children, a boy and a girl. When thirty-three years of age, he fell ill and died. His son Chung, being then only twelve, and his little girl, eight or nine. His wife did not remain faithful to his memory, but selling off all the property, pocketed the proceeds and married another man, leaving her two children almost in a state of destitution with their aunt, Niu's sister-in-law, an old lady of sixty, who had lived with them previously and had now nowhere to seek a shelter. A few years later, this aunt died, and the family fortunes began to sink even lower than before. Chung, however, was now grown up and determined to carry on his father's trade. Only he had no capital to start with. His sister, marrying a rich trader named Mao, she begged her husband to lend Chung ten ounces of silver, which he did, 
and Chang immediately started for Nanking. On the road, he fell in with some bandits who robbed him of all he had, and consequently he was unable to return. But one day when he was at a pawn shop, he noticed that the master of the shop was wonderfully like his late father, and on going out and making inquiries, he found that this pawnbroker wore precisely the same names. In great astonishment, he forthwith proceeded to frequent the place with no other object than to watch this man, who, on the other hand, took no notice of Chung, and by the end of three days, having satisfied himself that he really saw his own father, and yet not daring to disclose his own identity, he made application through one of the assistants, on the score of himself being a Kyangsi man, to be employed in the shop. Accordingly, an indenture was drawn up, and when the master noticed Chung's name and place of residence, he started and asked him whence he came. With tears in his eyes, Chung addressed him by his father's name, and then the pawnbroker became lost in a deep reverie, by and by asking Chung how his mother was. Now, Chung did not like to allude to his father's death, and turned to question by saying, My father went away on business six years ago, and he never came back. My mother married again and left us, and had it not been for my aunt, our corpses would long ago have been cast out in the kennel. Then the pawnbroker was much moved and cried out, I am your father, seizing his son's hand and leading him within to see his stepmother. This lady was about twenty-two, and having no children of her own, was delighted with Chung, and prepared a banquet for him in the inner apartments. Mr. New himself was, however, somewhat melancholy and wished to return to his old home. But his wife, fearing that there would be no one to manage the business, persuaded him to remain. So he taught his son the trade, and in three months was able to leave it all to him. He then prepared for his journey, whereupon Chang informed his stepmother that his father was really dead, to which she replied in great consternation that she knew him only as a traitor to the place, and that six years previously, he had married her, which proved conclusively that he couldn't be dead. He then recounted the whole story, which was a perfect mystery to both of them. Twenty-four hours afterwards, in walked his father, leading a woman whose hair was all disheveled. Chung looked at her, and saw she was his own mother. But Niu took her by the ear and began to revile her, saying, Why did you desert my children? To which the wretched woman made no reply. He then bit her across the neck, at which she screamed to Chung for assistance, and he, not being able to bear the sight, stepped in between them. His father was more than ever enraged by this, when, lo, Chung's mother had disappeared. While they were lost in astonishment at this strange scene, Mr. New's collar changed. In another moment his empty clothes had dropped upon the ground, and he himself became a black vapor, and also vanished from their sight. Stepmother and son were much overcome. They took New's clothes and buried them, and after that Chung continued his father's business, and soon amassed great wealth. On returning to his native place, he found that his mother had actually died on the very day of the above occurrence, and that his father had been seen by the whole family. End of chapter 68、Chapter、sixty nine of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mary s c a r n e l Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume Two by Song Ling Pu. Translated By Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter sixty nine The Princess of Tong Ting Lake. Chan Pi Chiao was a Pekingese, and being a poor man, he attached himself as secretary to the suite of a high military official named Chia. On one occasion, while anchored on the Tong Ting Lake, they saw a dolphin floating on the surface of the water. And General Cha took his bow and shot at it, wounding the animal in the back. A fish was hanging on to its tail and would not let go, so both were pulled out of the water together and attached to the mast. There they lay gasping, the dolphin opening its mouth as if pleading for life, 
until at length young chen begged the general to let them go again and then he himself half jokingly put a piece of plaster upon the dolphin's wound and had the two thrown back into the water where they were seen for some time afterwards diving and rising again to the surface about a year afterwards chen was once more crossing the tung ting lake on his way home when the boat was upset in a squall and he himself only saved by clinging to a bamboo crate which finally after floating about all night caught in the overhanging branch of a tree and thus enabled him to scramble on shore by and by another body floated in and this turned out to be his servant but on dragging him out he found life was already extinct in great distress he sat himself down to rest and saw beautiful green hills and waving willows but not a single human being of whom he could ask the way from early dawn till the morning was far advanced he remained in that state and then thinking he saw his servant's body move he stretched out his hand to feel it and before long the man threw up several quarts of water and recovered his consciousness they now dried their clothes in the sun and by noon these were fit to put on at which period the pangs of hunger began to assail them and accordingly they started over the hills in the hope of coming upon some habitation of man as they were walking along an arrow whizzed past and the next moment two young ladies dashed by on handsome palfreys each had a scarlet band round her head and with a bunch of pheasant's feathers stuck in her hair and wore a purple riding jacket with small sleeves confined by a green embroidered girdle round the waist one of them carried a crossbow for shooting bullets and the other had on her arm a dark-coloured bow and arrow case reaching the brow of the hill chen beheld a number of riders engaged in beating the surrounding cover all of whom were beautiful girls and dressed exactly alike afraid to advance any further he inquired of a youth who appeared to be in attendance and the latter told him that it was a hunting party from the palace and then having supplied him with food from his wallet he bade him retire quickly adding that if he fell in with them he would assuredly be put to death thereupon chen hurried away and descending the hill turned into a copse where there was a building which he thought would in all probability be a monastery on getting nearer he saw that the place was surrounded by a wall and between him and a half-open red door was a brook spanned by a stone bridge leading up to it pulling back the door he beheld within a number of ornamental buildings circling in the air like so many clouds and for all the world resembling the imperial pleasure grounds and thinking it must be the park of some official personage he walked quietly in enjoying the delicious fragrance of the flowers as he pushed aside the thick vegetation which obstructed his way after traversing a winding path fenced in by balustrades chen reached a second enclosure wherein were a quantity of tall willow trees which swept the red eaves of the buildings with their branches the note of some bird would set the petals of the flowers fluttering in the air and the least wind would bring the seed vessels down from the elm trees above and the effect upon the eye and heart of the beholder was something quite unknown in the world of mortals passing through a small kiosk chen and his servant came upon a swing which seemed as though suspended from the clouds while the ropes hung idly down in the utter stillness that prevailed thinking by this 
that they were approaching the ladies' apartments, Chen would have turned back. But at that moment, he heard sound of horses' feet at the door and what seemed to be the laughter of a bevy of girls. So he and his servant hid themselves in a bush. And by and by, as the sounds came nearer, he heard one of the young ladies say, We've had but poor sport today. Whereupon another cried out, If the princess hadn't shot that wild goose, we should have taken all this trouble for nothing. Shortly after this, a number of girls dressed in red came in escorting a young lady who went and sat down under the kiosk. She wore a hunting costume with tight sleeves and was about 14 or 15 years old. Her hair looked like a cloud of mist at the back of her head, and her waist seemed as though a breath of wind might snap it. Incomparable for beauty, even among the celebrities of old. Just then, the attendants handed her some exquisitely fragrant tea and stood glittering round her like a bank of beautiful embroidery. In a few moments, the young lady arose and descended the kiosk, at which one of her attendants cried out, Is your highness too fatigued by riding to take a turn in the swing? The princess replied that she was not, and immediately some supported her under the shoulders, while others seized her arms, and others again arranged her petticoats and brought her the proper shoes. Thus they helped her into the swing, she herself stretching out her shining arms and putting her feet into a suitable pair of slippers. And then away she went, light as a flying swallow, far up into the fleecy clouds. As soon as she had enough, the attendants helped her out, and one of them exclaimed, Truly your highness is a perfect angel. At this, the young lady laughed and walked away. Chen, gazing after her in a state of semi-consciousness until at length the voices died away and he and his servant crept forth. Walking up and down near the swing, he suddenly espied a red handkerchief near the paling which he knew had been dropped by one of the young ladies. And thrusting it joyfully into his sleeve, he walked up and entered the kiosk. There, upon a table, lay writing materials, and taking out the handkerchief, he indicted upon it the following lines. What form divine was just now sporting nigh? Twas she I trow of golden lily fame. Her charms, the moon's fair denizens, might shame. Her fairy footsteps bear her to the sky. Humming the stanza to himself, Chen walked along, seeking for the path by which he had entered. But every door was securely barred, and he knew not what to do. So he went back to the kiosk, when suddenly one of the young ladies appeared, and asked him in astonishment what he did there. I have lost my way, replied Chen. I pray you lend me your assistance. Do you happen to have found a red handkerchief? said the girl. I have indeed, answered Chen, but I fear I have made it somewhat dirty. And suiting the action to the word, he drew it forth and handed it to her. A wretched man! cried the young lady. You are undone. This is a handkerchief the princess is constantly using, and you have gone and scribbled all over it. What will become of you now? Chen was in great fright, and begged the young lady to intercede for him, to which she replied, It was bad enough that you should come here and spy about. However, being a scholar and a man of refinement, I would have done my best for you, but after this, how am I to help you? Off she then ran with the handkerchief, while Chen remained behind in an agony of suspense and longing for the wings of a bird to bear him away from his fate. By and by, the young lady returned and congratulated him, saying, 
there is some hope for you. The princess read your verses several times over and was not at all angry. You will probably be released. But meanwhile, wait here and don't climb the trees or try to get through the walls or you may not escape after all. Evening was now drawing on and Chen knew not for certain what was about to happen. At the same time, he was very empty. And, what with hunger and anxiety, death would have been almost a happy release. Before long, the young lady returned with a lamp in her hand, and followed by a slave girl bearing wine and food, which she forthwith presented to Chen. The latter asked if there was any news about himself, to which the young lady replied that she had just mentioned his case to the princess who, not knowing what to do with him at that hour of the night, had given orders that he should at once be provided with food, which at any rate, added she, is not bad news. The whole night long, Chen walked up and down, unable to take rest, and it was not till late in the morning that the young lady appeared with more food for him. Imploring her once more to intercede on his behalf, she told him that the princess had not instructed them either to kill or to release him, and that it would not be fitting for such as herself to be bothering the princess with suggestions. So there Chen still remained, until another day had almost gone, hoping for the welcome moment. And then the young lady rushed hurriedly in, saying, you are lost someone has told the queen and she in a fit of anger threw the handkerchief on the ground and made use of very violent language oh dear oh dear i'm sure something dreadful will happen chen threw himself on his knees his face as pale as ashes and begged to know what he should do but at that moment sounds were heard outside and the young lady waved her hand to him and ran away. Immediately, a crowd came pouring in through the door with ropes ready to secure the object of their search. And among them was a slave girl who looked fixedly at our hero and cried out, Why, surely you are Mr. Chen, aren't you? At the same time, stopping the others from binding him until she should have reported to the queen. In a few minutes, she came back and said the queen requested him to walk in. And in he went, through a number of doors, trembling all the time with fear, until he reached a hall, the screen before which was ornamented with green jade and silver. A beautiful girl drew aside the bamboo curtain at the door and announced, Mr. Chen, and he himself advanced and fell down before a lady, who was sitting upon a dais at the other end, knocking his head upon the ground and crying out, Thy servant is from a far-off country. Spare, oh, spare his life. Sir, replied the queen, rising hastily from her seat, and extending a hand to Chen, but for you, I shall not be here today. Pray excuse the rudeness of my maids. Thereupon, a splendid repast was served, and wine was poured out in chaste goblets, to the no small astonishment of Chen, who could not understand why he was treated thus. Your kindness, observed the queen, in restoring me to life, I am quite unable to repay. However, as you have made my daughter the subject of your verse, the match is clearly ordained by fate and I shall send her along to be your handmaid. Chen hardly knew what to make of this extraordinary accomplishment of his wishes, but the marriage was solemnized there and then. Bands of music struck up wedding airs. Beautiful mats were laid down for them to walk upon, and the whole place was brilliantly lighted with a profusion of colored lamps. Then Chen said to the princess, that a stray and unknown traveller like myself, guilty of spoiling your highness's handkerchief, should have escaped the fate he deserved. 
was already more than could be expected. But now, to receive you in marriage, this indeed far surpasses my wildest expectations. My mother, replied the princess, is married to the king of this lake, and is herself a daughter of the river prince. Last year, when on her way to visit her parents, she happened to cross the lake, and was wounded by an arrow. But you saved her life, and gave her plaster for the wound. Our family, therefore, is grateful to you, and can never forget your good act. And do not regard me as of another species than yourself. The Dragon King has bestowed upon me the elixir of immortality, and this I will gladly share with you. Then Chen knew that his wife was a spirit, and by and by he asked her how the slave girl had recognized him, to which she replied that the girl was the small fish which had been found hanging to the dolphin's tail. He then inquired why, as why they didn't intend to kill him. He had been kept so long a prisoner. I was charmed with your literary talent, answered the princess. But I did not venture to take the responsibility upon myself, and no one saw how I tossed and turned the livelong night. Dear friend, said Chen, but come, tell me who was it that brought my food? A trusty waiting maid of mine, replied the princess. Her name is Anyin. Chen then asked how he could ever repay her, and the princess told him there would be plenty of time to think of that. And when he inquired where the king, her father, was, she said he had gone off with the god of war to fight against Chi Hu, and had not returned. A few days passed, and Chen began to think his people at home would be anxious about him. So he sent off his servant with a letter to tell them he was safe and sound, at which they were all overjoyed, believing him to have been lost in the wreck of the boat, of which event news had already reached them. However, they were unable to send him any reply, and were considerably distressed as to how he would find his way home again. Six months afterwards, Chen himself appeared, dressed in fine clothes and riding on a splendid horse, with plenty of money and valuable jewels in his pocket, evidently a man of wealth. From that time forth, he kept up a magnificent establishment, and in seven or eight years had become the father of five children. Every day he kept open house, and if any one asked him about his adventures, he would readily tell them without reservations. Now a friend of his named Liang, whom he had known since they were boys together, and who, after holding an appointment for some years in Nanfu, was crossing the Tung Ting Lake on his way home, suddenly beheld an ornamental barge with carved woodwork and red windows, passing over the foamy waves to the sound of music and singing from within. Just then, a beautiful young lady leaned out of one of the windows, which she had pushed open, and by her side, Liang saw a young man sitting, in a negligee attitude, while two nice-looking girls stood by and shampooed him. Liang, at first, thought it must be the party of some high official, and wondered at the scarcity of attendants. But on looking more closely at the young man, he saw it no other than his old friend Chen. Thereupon, he began almost involuntarily to shout out to him. And when Chen heard his own name, he stopped the rowers and walked out towards the figurehead, beckoning Liang to cross over into his boat, where the remains of their feast was quickly cleared away, and fresh supplies of wine and tea and all kinds of costly foods spread out by handsome slave girls. It's ten years since we met, said Liang, and what a rich man you have become in the meantime. Well, replied Chen, do you think that's so very extraordinary for a poor fellow like me? 
Liang then asked him who was the lady with whom he was taking wine, and Chen said she was his wife, which very much astonished Liang, who further inquired whither they were going. Westwards, answered Chen, and prevented any further questions by giving a signal for the music, which effectually put a stop to all further conversation. By and by, Liang found the wine getting into his head and seized the opportunity to ask Chen to make him a present of one of his beautiful slave girls. You are drunk, my friend, replied Chen. However, I will give you the price of one as a pledge of our old friendship. And turning to a servant, he bade him present Liang with a splendid pearl saying, Now you can buy a green pearl. You see, I'm not stingy. Adding forth with, But I am pressed for time and can stay no longer with my old friend. So he escorted Liang back to his boat and having let go the rope, proceeded on his way. Now, when Liang reached home and called at Chen's house, whom should he see but Chen himself drinking with a party of friends? Why, I saw you only yesterday, cried Liang. Upon the Tung Ting, how quickly you have got back. Chen denied this, and then Liang repeated the whole story, at the conclusion of which Chen laughed and said, <laughs> you must be mistaken. Do you imagine I can be in two places at once? The company were all much astonished and knew not what to make of it. And subsequently, when Chen, who died at the age of 80, was being carried to his grave, the bearers thought the coffin seemed remarkably light, and on opening it to see, found that the body had disappeared. End of chapter 69 Recording by Mary Escano Chapter 70 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Lufer Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Pu Song Ling Translated by Herbert Allen Giles Chapter 70 The Princess Lily At Jiao Chao, there lived a man named Tu Shun, otherwise known as Shao Hui. One day, he had just dropped off to sleep, when he beheld a man in serge clothes standing by the bedside, and apparently anxious to communicate something to him. Tu inquired his errand, to which the man replied that he was the bearer of an invitation from his master. "'And who is your master?' asked Tu. "'Oh, he doesn't live far off,' replied the other. So away they went together, and after some time came to a place where there were innumerable white houses rising one above the other, and shaded by dense groves of lemon trees. They threaded their way past countless doors, not at all similar to those usually used, and saw a great many official-looking men and women passing and repassing, each of whom called out to the man in Surge, "'Has Mr. Tu come?' to which he always replied in the affirmative. Here a mandarin met them and escorted Tu into the palace, upon which the latter remarked, "'This is really very kind of you, but I haven't the honor of knowing you, and I feel somewhat diffident about going in. Our prince, answered his guide, has long heard of you as a man of good family and excellent principles, and is very anxious to make your acquaintance. Who is your prince? inquired Tu. You'll see for yourself in a moment, said the other. And just then out came two girls with banners, and guided Tu through a great number of doors until they came to a throne, upon which sat a prince. His highness immediately descended to meet him and made him take the seat of honor, after which ceremony exquisite viands of all kinds were spread out before them. Looking up, Tu noticed a scroll, on which was inscribed, The Cassia Court. And he was just beginning to feel puzzled as to what he should say next, when the prince addressed him as follows. 
the honor of having you for a neighbor is as it were a bond of affinity between us let us then give ourselves up to enjoyment and put away suspicion and fear two murmured his acquiescence and when the wine had gone round several times there arose from a distance the sound of pipes and singing unaccompanied however by the usual drum and very much subdued in volume thereupon the prince looked about him and cried out we are about to set a verse for any of you gentlemen to cap here you are genius seeks the cassia court while the courtiers were all engaged in thinking of some fit antithesis footnote in this favorite pastime of the literati in china the important point is that each word in the second line should be a due and proper antithesis of the word in the first line to which it corresponds while the courtiers were all engaged in thinking of some fit antithesis two added refinement loves the lily flower upon which the prince exclaimed how strange lily is my daughter's name and after such a coincidence she must come in for you to see her in a few moments the tinkling of her ornaments and a delicious fragrance of musk announced the arrival of the princess who was between sixteen and seventeen and endowed with surpassing beauty the prince bade her make an obeisance to two at the same time introducing her as his daughter lily and as soon as the ceremony was over the young lady moved away two remained in a state of stupefaction and when the prince proposed that they should pledge each other another bumper paid not the slightest attention to what he said then the prince perceiving what had distracted his guest's attention remarked that he was anxious to find a consort for his daughter but that unfortunately there was the difficulty of species and he didn't know what to do but again two took no notice of what the prince was saying until at length one of the bystanders plucked his sleeve and asked him if he hadn't seen that the prince wished to drink with him and had just been addressing some remarks to him thereupon two started and recovering himself at once rose from the table and apologized to the prince for his rudeness declaring that he had taken so much wine he didn't know what he was doing besides said he your highness has doubtless business to transact i will therefore take my leave I am extremely pleased to have seen you, replied the prince, and only regret that you are in such a hurry to be gone. However, I won't detain you now, but if you don't forget all about us, I shall be very glad to invite you here again. He then gave orders that two should be escorted home, and on the way one of the courtiers asked the latter why he had said nothing when the prince had spoken of a consort for his daughter, as his highness had evidently made the remark with an eye to securing two as his son-in-law. The latter was now sorry that he had missed his opportunity. Meanwhile, they had reached his house, and he himself awoke. The sun had already set, and there he sat in the gloom, thinking of what had happened. In the evening he put out his candle, hoping to continue his dream, but, alas, the thread was broken, and all he could do was to pour forth his repentance in sighs. One night he was sleeping at a friend's house, when suddenly an officer of the court walked in and summoned him to appear before the prince. So up he jumped and hurried off at once to the palace, where he prostrated himself before the throne. The prince raised him and made him sit down, saying that since they had last met, he had become aware that two would be willing to marry his daughter, and hoped that he might be allowed to offer her as a handmaid. Two rose and thanked the prince, who thereupon gave orders for a banquet to be prepared, and when they had finished their wine, it was announced that the princess had completed her toilet. Immediately a bevy of young ladies came in with the princess in their midst, a red veil covering her head, and her tiny footsteps sounding like rippling water as they led her up to be introduced to two. 
When the ceremonies were concluded, Tu said to the princess, In your presence, madam, it would be easy to forget even death itself. But, tell me, is not this all a dream? And how can it be a dream, asked the princess, when you and I are here together? The next morning, Tu amused himself by helping the princess to paint her face, and then, seizing a girdle, began to measure the size of her waist and the length of her fingers and feet. "'Are you crazy?' cried she, laughing, to which Tu replied, "'I have been deceived so often by dreams that I am now making a careful record. If such it turns out to be, I shall still have something of a souvenir of you.' While they were thus chatting, a maid rushed into the room, shrieking out, Alas, alas, a great monster has got into the palace. The prince has fled into a side chamber. Destruction is surely come upon us. Tu was in a great fright when he heard this, and rushed off to see the prince, who grasped his hand and, with tears in his eyes, begged him not to desert them. Our relationship, cried he, was cemented when heaven sent this calamity upon us, and now my kingdom will be overthrown. What shall I do? Tu begged to know what was the matter, and then the prince laid a dispatch upon the table, telling Tu to open it and make himself acquainted with its contents. This dispatch ran as follows. The Grand Secretary of State, Black Wings, to His Royal Highness, announcing the arrival of an extraordinary monster and advising the immediate removal of the court in order to preserve the vitality of the empire. A report has just been received from the officer in charge of the Yellow Gate, stating that ever since the sixth of the fifth moon, a huge monster, ten thousand feet in length, has been lying coiled up outside the entrance to the palace and that it has already devoured thirteen thousand eight hundred and odd of your highness's subjects, and is spreading desolation far and wide. On receipt of this information, your servant proceeded to make a reconnaissance, and there beheld a venomous reptile with a head as big as a mountain and eyes like vast sheets of water. Every time it raised its head, whole buildings disappeared down its throat, and— on stretching itself out, walls and houses were alike laid in ruins. In all antiquity, there is no record of such a scourge. The fate of our temples and ancestral halls is now a mere question of ours. We therefore pray your royal highness to depart at once with the royal family and seek somewhere else a happier abode. When Tu had read this document, his face turned ashy pale, and just then a messenger rushed in, shrieking out, Here is the monster! At which the whole court burst into lamentations as if their last hour was at hand. The prince was beside himself with fear. All he could do was to beg to, to look to his own safety without regarding the wife through whom he was involved in their misfortunes. The princess, however, who was standing by, bitterly lamenting the fate that had fallen upon them, begged to not to desert her, and, after a moment's hesitation, he said he should be only too happy to place his own poor home at their immediate disposal if they would only deign to honor him. "'How can we talk of deigning?' cried the princess. "'At such a moment as this! I pray you, take us there as quickly as possible!' So. Tu gave her his arm, and in no time they had arrived at Tu's house, which the princess at once pronounced to be a charming place of residence, and better even than their former kingdom. "'But I must now ask you,' she said to Tu, "'to make some arrangement for my father and mother that the old order of things may be continued here.' Tu at first offered objections to this, whereupon the princess said that a man who would not help another in his hour of need was not much of a man, and immediately went off into a fit of hysterics from which too was trying his best to recall her when all of a sudden he awoke and found that it was all a dream. 
However, he still heard a buzzing in his ears, which he knew was not made by any human being, and on looking carefully about, he discovered two or three bees, which had settled on his pillow. He was very much astonished at this, and consulted with his friend, who was also greatly amazed at his strange story. And then the latter pointed out a number of other bees, on various parts of his dress, none of which would go away even when brushed off. His friend now advised him to get a hive for them, which he did without delay, and immediately it was filled by a whole swarm of bees, which came flying from over the wall in great numbers. On tracing whence they had come, it was found that they belonged to an old gentleman who lived near, and who had kept bees for more than thirty years previously. Two thereupon went and told him the story, and when the old gentleman examined his hive, he found the bees all gone. On breaking it open, he discovered a large snake inside, of about ten feet in length, which he immediately killed, recognizing in it the huge monster of Two's adventure. As for the bees, they remained with Two, and increased in numbers every year. End of chapter. Chapter 71 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935. Chapter 71. The Donkey's Revenge. Chung Ching Yu was a scholar of some reputation who lived in Manchuria. When he went up for his master's degree, he heard that there was a Taoist priest at the capital who would tell people's fortunes and was very anxious to see him. And at the conclusion of the second part of the examination, he accidentally met him at Pao Tu Chuan. The priest was over sixty years of age and had the usual white beard flowing down over his breast. Around him stood a perfect wall of people inquiring their future fortunes, and to each the old man made a brief reply. But when he saw Chung among the crowd, he was overjoyed, and seizing him by the hand said, Sir, your virtuous intentions command my esteem. He then led him up behind a screen and asked if he did not wish to know what was to come. And when Chung replied in the affirmative, the priest informed him that his prospects were bad. You may succeed in passing this examination, continued he, but on returning covered with honor to your home, I fear that your mother will be no longer there. Now Chung was a very filial son, and as soon as he heard these words, his tears began to flow and he declared that he would go back without competing any further. The priest observed that if he let this chance slip, he could never hope for success. To which Chung replied that, on the other hand, if his mother were to die, he could never hope to have her back again, and that even the rank of viceroy would not repay him for her loss. Well, said the priest, you and I were connected in a former existence, and I must do my best to help you now. So he took out a pill which he gave to Chung and told him that if he sent it post-haste by someone to his mother, it would prolong her life for seven days, and thus he would be able to see her once again after the examination was over. Chung took the pill and went off in very low spirits, but he soon reflected that the span of human life is a matter of destiny, and that every day he could spend at home would be one more day devoted to the service of his mother. Accordingly, he got ready to start at once, and, hiring a donkey, actually set out on his way back. When he had gone about half a mile, the donkey turned round and ran home, and when he used his whip, the animal threw itself down on the ground. Chung got into a great perspiration, and his servant recommended him to remain where he was. But this he would not hear of, and hired another donkey, which served him exactly the same trick as the other one. The sun was now sinking behind the hills, and his servant advised his master to stay and finish his examination while he himself went back home before him. 
Chung had no alternative but to assent, and the next day he hurried through with his papers, starting immediately afterwards, and not stopping at all on the way, either to eat or to sleep. All night long he went on, and arrived to find his mother in a very critical state. However, when he gave her the pill, she so far recovered that he was able to go in and see her. Grasping his hand, she begged him not to weep, telling him that she had just dreamt she had been down to the infernal regions, where the king of hell had informed her with a gracious smile that her record was fairly clean, and that in view of the filial piety of her son she was to have twelve years more of life. Chung was rejoiced at this, and his mother was soon restored to her former health. Before long the news arrived that Chung had passed his examination, upon which he bade adieu to his mother and went off to the capital, where he bribed the eunuchs of the palace to communicate with his friend the Taoist priest. The latter was very much pleased and came out to see him, whereupon Chung prostrated himself at his feet. Ah, said the priest, this success of yours and the prolongation of your good mother's life is all a reward for your virtuous conduct. What have I done in the matter? Chung was very much astonished that the priest should already know what had happened. However, he now inquired as to his own future. You will never rise to high rank, replied the priest, but you will attain the years of an octogenarian. In a former state of existence, you and I were once traveling together, when you threw a stone at a dog and accidentally killed a frog. Now, that frog has reappeared in life as a donkey, and according to all principles of destiny, you ought to suffer for what you did. But your filial piety has touched the gods. A protecting star influence has passed into your nativity sheet, and you will come to no harm. On the other hand, there is your wife. In her former state, she was not as virtuous as she might have been, and her punishment in this life was to be widowed quite young. You, however, have secured the prolongation of your own term of years, and therefore I fear that before long your wife will pay the penalty of death. Chung was much grieved at hearing this, but after a while he asked the priest where his second wife-to-be was living. At Chung Chao, replied the latter, she is now fourteen years old. The priest then bade him adieu, telling him that if any mischief should befall him, he was to hurry off towards the southeast. About a year after this, Chung's wife did die, and his mother, then desiring him to go and visit his uncle, who was a magistrate in Kiangxi, on which journey he would have to pass through Chung Chao, it seemed like a fulfillment of the old priest's prophecy. As he went along, he came to a village on the banks of a river, where a large crowd of people was gathered together round a theatrical performance which was going on there. Chung would have passed quietly by had not a stray donkey followed so close behind him that he turned round and hit it over the ears. This startled the donkey so much that it ran off full gallop and knocked a rich gentleman's child, who was sitting with its nurse on the bank, right into the water before any one of the servants could lend a hand to save it. Immediately there was a great outcry against Chung, who gave his mule the rein and dashed away, mindful of the priest's warning, towards the southeast. After riding about seven miles, he reached a mountain village, where he saw an old man standing at the door of a house, and, jumping off his mule, made him a low bow. The old man asked him in, and inquired his name, and whence he came, to which Chung replied by telling him the whole adventure. Never fear, said the old man. You can stay here, while I send out to learn the position of affairs. By the evening his messenger had returned, and then they knew for the first time that the child belonged to a wealthy family. The old man looked grave and said, Had it been anybody else's child, I might have helped you. As it is, I can do nothing. Chung was greatly alarmed at this. However, the old man told him to remain quietly there for the night and see what turn matters might take. Chung was overwhelmed with anxiety and did not sleep a wink, and next morning he heard that the constables were after him, and that it was death to anyone who should conceal him. The old man changed countenance at this, and went inside, 
leaving Chung to his own reflections. But towards the middle of the night, he came and knocked at Chung's door, and, sitting down, began to ask how old his wife was. Chung replied that he was a widower, at which the old man seemed rather pleased, and declared that in such case help would be forthcoming. For, said he, my sister's husband has taken the vows and become a priest, and my sister herself has died, leaving an orphan girl who has now no home. And if you would only marry her... Chung was delighted, more especially as this would be both the fulfillment of the Taoist priest's prophecy and a means of extricating himself from his present difficulty. At the same time, he declared he should be sorry to implicate his future father-in-law. Never fear about that, replied the old man. My sister's husband is pretty skillful in the black art. He has not mixed much with the world of late, but when you are married, you can discuss the matter with my niece. So Chung married the young lady, who was sixteen years of age, and very beautiful. But whenever he looked at her, he took occasion to sigh. At last, she said, I may be ugly, but you needn't be in such a hurry to let me know it. Whereupon Chung begged her pardon, and said he felt himself only too lucky to have met with such a divine creature, adding that he sighed because he feared some misfortune was coming on them which would separate them forever. He then told her his story, and the young lady was very angry that she should have been drawn into such a difficulty without a word of warning. Chung fell on his knees and said he had already consulted with her uncle, who was unable himself to do anything, much as he wished it. He continued that he was aware of her power, and then, pointing out that his alliance was not altogether beneath her, made all kinds of promises if she would only help him out of this trouble. The young lady was no longer able to refuse, but informed him that to apply to her father would entail certain disagreeable consequences, as he had retired from the world, and did not any more recognize her as his daughter. That night they did not attempt to sleep spending the interval and patting their knees with thick felt concealed beneath their clothes, and then they got into chairs and were carried off to the hills. After journeying some distance, they were compelled by the nature of the road to alight and walk, and it was only by a great effort that Chung succeeded at last in getting his wife to the top. At the door of the temple they sat down to rest, the powder and paint on the young lady's face having all mixed with the perspiration trickling down. But when Chung began to apologize for bringing her to this pass, she replied that it was a mere trifle compared with what was to come. By and by they went inside, and threading their way to the wall beyond, found the young lady's father sitting in contemplation, his eyes closed and a servant boy standing by with a chowry. Everything was beautifully clean and nice, but before the days were sharp stones scattered about as thick as the stars in the sky. The young lady did not venture to select a favorable spot. She fell on her knees at once, and Chung did likewise behind her. Then her father opened his eyes, shutting them again almost instantaneously. Whereupon the young lady said, For a long time I have not paid my respects to you. I am now married, and I have brought my husband to see you. A long time passed away, and then her father opened his eyes and said, You're giving a great deal of trouble, immediately relapsing into silence again. There the husband and wife remained until the stones seemed to pierce into their very bones. But after a while the father cried out, Have you brought the donkey? His daughter replied that they had not, whereupon, they were told to go and fetch it at once, which they did, not knowing what the meaning of this order was. After a few more days kneeling, they suddenly heard that the murderer of the child had been caught and beheaded, and were just congratulating each other on the success of their scheme, when a servant came in with a stick in his hand, the top of which had been chopped off. This stick, said the servant, died instead of you. Bury it reverently that the wrong done to the tree may be somewhat atoned for. Then Chung saw that at the place where the top of the stick had been chopped off, there were traces of blood. He therefore buried it with the usual ceremony, 
and immediately set off with his wife and returned to his own home. End of chapter 71 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 72 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935 Chapter 72 The Wolf Dream Mr. Pai was a native of Cher Li, and his eldest son was called Chera. The latter had been some two years holding an appointment as magistrate in the south, but because of the great distance between them, his family had heard nothing of him. One day a distant connection named Ting called at the house, and Mr. Pai, not having seen this gentleman for a long time, treated him with much cordiality. Now Ting was one of those persons who are occasionally employed by the judge of the infernal regions to make arrests on earth, and as they were chatting together, Mr. Pai questioned him about the realms below. Ting told him all kinds of strange things, but Pai did not believe them, answering only with a smile. Some days afterward, he had just lain down to sleep when Ting walked in and asked him to go for a stroll. So they went off together, and by and by reached the city. There, said Ting, pointing to a door, lives your nephew, alluding to a son of Mr. Pai's elder sister, who was a magistrate in Honan. And when Pai expressed his doubts as to the accuracy of this statement, Ting led him in, when, lo and behold, there was his nephew, sitting in his court, dressed in his official robes. Around him stood the guard, and it was impossible to get near him, but Ting remarked that his son's residence was not far off, and asked Pai if he would not like to see him too. The latter assenting, they walked along until they came to a large building, which Ting said was the place. However, there was a fierce wolf at the entrance, and Mr. Pai was afraid to go in. Ting bade him enter, and accordingly they walked in, when they found that all the employees of the place, some of whom were standing about and others lying down to sleep, were all wolves. The central pathway was piled up with whitening bones, and Mr. Pai began to feel horribly alarmed, but Ting kept close to him all the time, and at length they got safely in. Pai's son, Chira, was just coming out when he saw his father accompanied by Ting, he was overjoyed, and asking them to sit down, bade the attendants serve some refreshment. Thereupon a great big wolf brought in, in his mouth, the carcass of a dead man, and set it before them, at which Mr. Pye rose up in consternation and asked his son what this meant. "'It is only a little refreshment for you, father,' replied Chira. But this did not calm Mr. Pye's agitation, who would have retired precipitately had it not been for the crowd of wolves which barred the path. Just as he was at a loss what to do, there was a general stampede among the animals, which scurried away, some under the couches and some under the tables and chairs, and while he was wondering what the cause of this could be, in marched two knights in golden armor, who looked sternly at Chira, and producing a black rope, proceeded to bind him hand and foot. Chira fell down before them, and was changed into a tiger with horrid fangs, and then one of the knights drew a glittering sword, and would have cut off its head, had not the other cried out, Not yet, not yet. That is for the fourth month next year. Let us now only take out its teeth. Immediately that knight produced a huge mallet, and with a few blows scattered the tiger's teeth all over the floor, the tiger roaring so loudly with pain as to shake the very hills and frightening all the wits out of Mr. Pye, who woke up with a start. He found he had been dreaming, and at once set off to invite Ting to come and see him, 
but Ting sent back to say he must beg to be excused. Then Mr. Pai, pondering on what he had seen in his dream, dispatched his second son with a letter to Chira, full of warnings and good advice, and lo, when his son arrived, he found that his elder brother had lost all his front teeth, these having been knocked out, as he averred, by a fall he had from his horse, when tipsy, and on comparing dates, the day of that fall was found to coincide with the day of his father's dream. The younger brother was greatly amazed at this, and took out their father's letter, which he gave to Chera to read. The latter changed color, but immediately asked his brother what there was to be astonished at in the coincidence of a dream. And just at that time, he was busily engaged in bribing his superiors to put him first on the list for promotion, so that he soon forgot all about the circumstance, while the younger, observing what harpies cheer his subordinates were, taking presents from one man and using their influence for another in one unbroken stream of corruption, sought out his elder brother, and with tears in his eyes implored him to put some check upon their rapacity. My brother, replied Chira, your life has been passed in an obscure village. You know nothing of our official routine. We are promoted or degraded at the will of our superiors and not by the voice of the people. He, therefore, who gratifies his superiors is marked out for success, whereas he who consults the wishes of the people is unable to gratify his superiors as well. Chira's brother saw that his advice was thrown away. He accordingly returned home and told his father all that had taken place. The old man was much affected, but there was nothing that he could do in the matter, so he devoted himself to assisting the poor and such acts of charity, daily praying the gods that the wicked son alone might suffer for his crimes and not entail misery on his innocent wife and children. The next year it was reported that Chira had been recommended for a post in the board of civil office, and friends crowded the father's door, offering their congratulations upon the happy event. But the old man sighed and took to his bed, pretending he was too unwell to receive visitors. Before long, another message came informing them that Chira had fallen in with bandits while on his way home, and that he and all his retinue had been killed. Then his father arose and said, Verily, the gods are good unto me, for they have visited his sins upon himself alone. And he immediately proceeded to burn incense and return thanks. Some of his friends would have persuaded him that the report was probably untrue, but the old man had no doubts as to its correctness, and made haste to get ready his son's grave. But Chiara was not yet dead, in the fatal fourth moon he had started on his journey, and had fallen in with bandits, to whom he had offered all his money and valuables, upon which the latter cried out, We have come to avenge the cruel wrongs of many hundreds of victims. Do you imagine we want only that? Then they cut off his head, and the head of his wicked secretary, and the heads of several of his servants, who had been foremost in carrying out his shameful orders, and were now accompanying him to the capital. They then divided the booty between them, and made off with all speed. Chiera's soul remained near his body for some time, until at length a high mandarin passing by asked who it was that was lying there dead. One of his servants replied that he had been a magistrate at such and such a place, and that his name was Pai. What? said the Mandarin, the son of old Mr. Pye. It is hard that his father should live to see such sorrow as this. Put his head on again. Then a man stepped forward and placed Chira's head upon his shoulders again, when the Mandarin interrupted him, saying, A crooked-minded man should not have a straight body. Put his head on sideways. By and by Chira's soul returned to its tenement, and when his wife and children arrived to take away the corpse, they found that he was still breathing. Carrying him home, they poured some nourishment down his throat, which he was able to swallow, 
but there he was at an out-of-the-way place without the means of continuing his journey it was some six months before his father heard the real state of the case and then he sent off the second son to bring his brother home chira had indeed come to life again but he was able to see down his own back and was regarded ever afterwards more as a monstrosity than as a man subsequently the nephew who old mr pye had seen sitting in state surrounded by officials actually became an imperial censor so that every detail of the dream was thus strangely realized end of chapter seventy two Chapter 73 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Songling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845-1935. Chapter 73. The Unjust Sentence. Mr. Chu is a native of Yangku and as a young man was much given to playing tricks and talking in a loose kind of way. Having lost his wife, he went off to ask a certain old woman to arrange another match for him, and on the way he chanced to fall in with a neighbor's wife, who took his fancy very much. So he said in joke to the old woman, Get me that stylish-looking handsome lady, and I shall be quite satisfied." i'll see what i can do replied the old woman also joking if you will manage to kill her present husband upon which chu laughed and said he certainly would do so now about a month afterward the said husband who had gone out to collect some money due him was actually killed in a lonely spot and the magistrate of the district immediately summoned the neighbors and beetle and held the usual inquest but was unable to find any clue to the murderer. However, the old woman told the story of her conversation with Chu, and suspicion at once fell upon him. The constables came and arrested him, but he stoutly denied the charge, and the magistrate now began to suspect the wife of the murdered man. Accordingly, she was severely beaten and tortured in several ways until her strength failed her, and she falsely acknowledged her guilt. Chu was then examined, and he said, This delicate woman could not bear the agony of your tortures. What she has stated is untrue, and even should her wrong escape the notice of the gods, for her to die in this way, with a stain upon her name, is more than I can endure. I will tell the whole truth. I killed the husband that I might secure the wife. She knew nothing at all about it. And when the magistrate asked for some proof, Chu said his bloody clothes would be evidence enough, but when they sent to search his house, no bloody clothes were forthcoming. He was then beaten till he fainted. Yet when he came around, he still stuck to what he had said. It is my mother, cried he, who will not sign the death warrant of her son. Let me go myself, and I will get the clothes." So he was escorted by a guard to his home, and there he explained to his mother that whether she gave up or withheld the clothes, it was all the same, that in either case he would have to die, and it was better to die early than late. Thereupon his mother wept bitterly, and going into the bedroom brought out, after a short delay, the required clothes, which were taken at once to the magistrates. There was now no doubt as to the truth of Chu's story, and as nothing occurred to change the magistrate's opinion, Chu was thrown into prison to await the day for his execution. Meanwhile, as the magistrate was one day inspecting his jail, suddenly a man appeared in the hall who glared at him fiercely and roared out, Dull-headed fool, unfit to be the guardian of the people's interests whereupon the crowd of servants standing around rushed forward to seize him, but with one sweep of his arms he laid them all flat on the ground. The magistrate was frightened out of his wits and tried to escape, but the man cried out to him, I am one of Quan Ti's lieutenants. If you move an inch, you are lost. So the magistrate stood there, shaking from head to foot with fear, while his visitor continued, The murderer is Kung Piao, 
Chi had nothing to do with it. The lieutenant then fell down on the ground and was to all appearance lifeless. However, after a while he recovered, his face having quite changed, and when they asked him his name, lo, it was Kung Piao. Under the application of the bamboo he confessed his guilt. Always an unprincipled man, he had heard that the murdered man was going out to collect money, and thinking he would be sure to bring it back with him, he had killed him. But he had found nothing. Then when he learnt that Chi had acknowledged the crime as his own doing, he had rejoiced in secret at such a stroke of luck. How he had got into the magistrate's hall he was quite unable to say. The magistrate now called for some explanation of Chu's bloody clothes, which Chu himself was unable to give. But his mother, who was at once sent for, stated that she had cut her own arm to stain them, and when they examined her they found on her left arm the scar of a recent wound. The magistrate was lost in amazement at all of this. Unfortunately for him, the reversal of his sentence cost him his appointment, and he died in poverty, unable to find his way home. As for Chu, the widow of the murdered man married him in the following year, out of gratitude for his noble behavior. End of chapter 73「Chapter seventy four of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five. Chapter seventy four. A Rip Van Winkle. The story runs that a Mr. Chia was obtaining, with the assistance of a mysterious friend, his master's degree, became alive to the vanity of mere earthly honors, and determined to devote himself to the practice of Taoism in the hope of obtaining the elixir of immortality. So early one morning Chia and his friend, whose name was Lang, stole away together, without letting Chia's family know anything about it and by and by they found themselves among the hills, in a vast cave where there was another world and another sky. An old man was sitting there in great state, and Lang presented Chia to him as his future master. "'Why have you come so soon?' asked the old man, to which Lang replied, "'My friend's determination is firmly fixed. I pray you receive him amongst you.' "'Since you have come,' said the old man, turning to Chia, you must begin by putting away from you your earthly body. Chia murmured his assent, and was then escorted by Lang to sleeping chamber, where he was provided with food, after which Lang went away. The room was beautifully clean, the doors had no panels and the windows no lattices, and all the furniture was one table and one couch. Chia took off his shoes and lay down, with the moon shining brightly into the room, and beginning soon to feel hungry, he tried one of the cakes on the table, which he found sweet and very satisfying. He thought Lang would be sure to come back, but there he remained hour after hour by himself, never hearing a sound. He noticed, however, that the room was fragrant with a delicious perfume. His viscera seemed to be removed from his body, by which his intellectual faculties were much increased, and every one of his veins and arteries could be easily counted. Then, suddenly, he heard a sound like that of a cat scratching itself, and looking out of the window he beheld a tiger sitting under the veranda. He was horribly frightened for the moment, but immediately recalling the admonition of the old man, he collected himself and sat quietly down again. The tiger seemed to know that there was a man inside, for it entered the room directly afterwards, and, walking straight up to the couch, sniffed at Chia's feet whereupon there was a noise outside, as if a fowl were having its legs tied, and the tiger ran away. Shortly afterwards a beautiful young girl came in, suffusing an exquisite fragrance around, and going up to the couch where Chia was, she bent over him and whispered, Here I am. Her breath was like the sweet odor of perfumes, but as Chia did not move, she whispered again, Are you sleeping? 
the voice sounded to Chia remarkably like that of his wife. However, he reflected that these were all probably nothing more than tests of his determination. So he closed his eyes firmly for a while. But by and by, the young lady called him by his pet name, and then he opened his eyes wide to discover that she was no other than his own wife. On asking her how she had come there, she replied that Mr. Lang was afraid her husband would be lonely, and had sent an old woman to guide her to him. Just then they heard the old man outside in a towering rage, and Chia's wife, not knowing where to conceal herself, jumped over a low wall nearby, and disappeared. In came the old man, and gave Lang a severe beating before Chia's face, bidding him at once to get rid of his visitor. So Lang led Chia away over the low wall, saying, I know how anxious you were to consummate your immortality, and accordingly I tried to hurry things on a bit. But now I see that your time has not yet come. Hence this beating I have had. Goodbye. We shall meet again some day. He then showed Chia the way to his home, and waving his hand bade him farewell. Chia looked down, for he was in the moon and beheld the old familiar village, and, recollecting that his wife was not a good walker, and would not have got very far, hurried on to overtake her. Before long he was at his own door, but he noticed that the place was all tumbled down and in ruins, and not as it was when he went away. As for the people he saw, old and young alike, he did not recognize one of them. And, recollecting the story of how Liu and Yuan came back from heaven, he was afraid to go in at the door. So he sat down and rested outside. And after a while, an old man leaning on a staff came out, whereupon Chia asked him which was the house of Mr. Chia. This is it, replied the old man. You probably wish to hear the extraordinary story connected with the family. I know all about it. They say that Mr. Chia ran away just after he had taken his master's degree when his son was only seven or eight years old, and that about seven years afterwards the child's mother went into a deep sleep from which she did not awake. As long as her son was alive, he changed his mother's clothes for her according to the seasons, but when he died, her grandsons fell into poverty and had nothing but an old shanty to put the sleeping lady into. Last month she awakened, having been asleep for over a hundred years. People from far and near have been coming in great numbers to hear the strange story. Of late, however, there have been rather fewer. Chia was amazed when he heard all this, and turning to the old man said, I am Chia Feng Chi. This astonished the old man very much, and off he went to make the announcement to Chia's family. The eldest grandson was dead, and the second, a man of about fifty, refused to believe that such a young-looking man was really his grandfather. But in a few moments out came Chia's wife, and she recognized her husband at once. They then fell upon each other's necks and mingled their tears together. After which, the story is drawn out to a considerable length, but is quite devoid of interest. End of Chapter 74 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 75 of Strange Stories from the Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis. Strange Stories from the Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to Chapter 75. The Three States of Existence. A certain man of the province of Hunan could recall what had happened to him in three previous lives. In the first, he was a magistrate, and on one occasion when he had been nominated assistant examiner, a candidate named Xing was unsuccessful. Xing went home dreadfully mortified, and soon after died. But a spirit appeared before the king of purgatory, and read aloud the rejected essay, whereupon thousands of other shades, all of whom had suffered in a similar way, thronged around and unanimously elected Xing as their chief. The examiner was immediately summoned to take his trial, 
and when he arrived the king asked him saying as you are appointed to examine the various essays how is it that you throw out the able and admit the worthless sire replied he the ultimate decision rests with the grand examiner i only pass them on to him the king then issued a warrant for the apprehension of the grand examiner and as he appeared he was told what just now had been said against him to which he answered i am only able to make a general estimate of the merits of the candidates valuable essays may be kept back from me by my associate examiners in which case i am powerless but the king cried out it's all very well for you two thus to throw the blame on each other you are both guilty and both of you must be bambooed according to law this sentence was about to be carried into effect when shing who was not at all satisfied with its lack of severity set up such a fearful screeching and howling in which he was well supported by all the other hundreds and thousands of shades that the king stopped short and inquired what was the matter thereupon shing informed his majesty that the sentence was too light and that the examiners should both have their eyes gouged out so as not to be able to read essays any more the king would not consent to this explaining to the noisy rabble that the examiners did not purposely reject good essays but only because they themselves were naturally wanting in capacity the shades then begged that at any rate their hearts might be cut out and to this the king was obliged to yield so the examiners were seized by the attendants their garments stripped off and their bodies ripped open with sharp knives the blood poured out on the ground and the victim screamed with pain at which all the shades rejoiced exceedingly and said here we have been pent up with no one to redress our wrongs but now mr shing has come our injuries are washed away they then dispersed with great noise and hubbub as for our associate examiner after his heart had been cut out he came to life again as the son of a poor man in shang -Chi and when he was twenty years old he fell into the hands of the rebels who were at that time giving great trouble to the country by and by a certain official was sent at the head of some soldiers to put down the insurrection and he succeeded in capturing a large number of the rebels among whom was our hero the latter reflected that he himself was no rebel and he was hoping that he would be able to obtain his release in consequence when he noticed that the officer in charge was also a man of his own age and on looking more closely he saw that it was his old enemy shing alas cried he such is destiny and so indeed it turned out for all the other prisoners were forthwith released and he alone was beheaded once more his spirit stood before the king of purgatory this time with an accusation against shing the king however would not summon shing at once but said he should be allowed to complete his term of official life on earth and it was not until thirty years afterward that Shing appeared to answer to the charge. Then, because he had made light of the lives of his people, he was condemned to be born again as a brute beast. And our hero, too, inasmuch as he had been known to beat his father and mother, was sentenced to a similar fate. The latter, fearing the future vengeance of Shing, persuaded the king to give him the advantage of size and accordingly orders were issued that he was to be born again as a big and shing as a little dog the big dog came to life in a shop in shen tian fu and was one day lying down in the street when a trader from the south arrived bringing with him a little golden-haired dog about the size of a wild cat which lo and behold turned out to be shing the other thinking shing's size would render him an easy prey seized him at once but the little one caught him from underneath by the throat and hung there firmly like a bell the big dog tried hard to shake him off and the people of the shop did their best to separate them but all was of no avail and in a few moments both dogs were dead upon their spirits presenting themselves as usual before the king each with its grievance against the other the king cried out when will ye have done with your wrongs and your animosities i will now settle the matter finally for you and immediately commanded that shing should become the other son-in-law in the next world the latter was then born at ching yun and when he was twenty-eight years of age took his master's degree he had one daughter a very pretty girl whom many of his wealthy neighbors would have been glad to get for their sons 
but he would not accept any of their offers. On one occasion, he happened to pass through the prefectural city just as the examination for bachelor's degree was over, and the candidate who had come out at the top of the list, though named Li, was no other than Mr. Shing. So he led this man away and took him to an inn where he treated him with the utmost cordiality, finally arranging that, as Mr. Li was still unmarried, he should marry his pretty daughter. Everyone, of course, thought that this was done in admiration of Li's talents, ignorant that destiny had already decreed the union of the young couple. No sooner were they married than Li, proud of his own literary achievements, began to slight his father-in-law, and often passed many months without going near him, all of which the father-in-law bore very patiently. And when at length Li had repeatedly failed to get on any further in his career, he even went so far as to set to work by all manner and means to secure his success, after which they lived happily together as father and son. End of chapter 75 The Three States of Existence Chapter 76 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maya. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. In the Inferno Regions. Shi Fang Ping was a native of Tungan. His father's name was Shi Yin, a hasty tempered man, who had quarrelled with a neighbor named Yang. By and by, Yang died, and some years afterwards, when Lin was on his deathbed, he cried out that Yang was bribing the devils in hell to torture him. His body then swelled up and turned red, and in a few moments he had breathed his last. His son wept bitterly and refused all food, saying, Alas, my poor father is now being maltreated by cruel devils. I must go down and help to redress his wrongs. Thereupon he ceased speaking and sat for a long time like one dazed his soul having already quitted its tenement of clay to himself he appeared to be outside the house not knowing in what direction to go so he inquired from one of the passers-by which was the way to the district city before long he found himself there and directing his steps towards the prison found his father lying outside in a very shocking state when the latter beheld his son he burst into tears and declared that the jailers had been bribed to beat him which they did both day and night until they had reduced him to his present sorry plight then fang ping turned round in a great rage and began to curse the jailers out upon you cried he if my father is guilty he should be punished according to law and not at the will of a set of scoundrels like you thereupon he hurried away and prepared a petition which he took with him to present at the morning session of the city god but his enemy young had meanwhile set to work and bribed so effectually that the city god dismissed his petition for want of corroborative evidence fang ping was furious but could do nothing so he started at once for the prefectural city where he managed to get his plaint received though it was nearly a month before it came on for hearing and then all he got was a reference back to the district city where he was severely tortured and escorted back to the door of his own home for fear he should give further trouble however he did not go in 
but stole away and proceeded to lay his complaint before one of the ten judges of purgatory whereupon the two mandarins who had previously ill-used him came forward and secretly offered him a thousand ounces of silver if he would withdraw the charge this he positively refused to do and some days subsequently the landlord of the inn where he was staying told him he had been a fool for his pains and that he would now get neither money nor justice the judge himself having already been tampered with fang ping thought this was mere gossip and would not believe it but when his case was called the judge utterly refused to hear the charge and ordered him twenty blows with the bamboo which were administered in spite of all his protestations he then cried out ah it's all because i have no money to give you which so incensed the judge that he told the lictors to throw fang ping on the fire bed this was a great iron couch with a roaring fire underneath which made it red hot and upon that the devils cast fang ping having first stripped off his clothes pressing him down on it until the fire ate into his very bones though in spite of that he could not die after a while the devils said he had had enough and made him get off the iron bed and put his clothes on again he was just able to walk and when he went back into court the judge asked him if he wanted to make any further complaints alas cried he my wrongs are still unredressed and i should only be lying were i to say i would complain no more the judge then inquired what he had to complain of to which fang ping replied that it was of the injustice of his recent punishment this enraged the judge so much that he ordered his attendants to saw fang ping in two he was then led away by devils to a place where he was thrust in between a couple of wooden boards the ground on all sides being wet and sticky with blood just at that moment he was summoned to return before the judge who asked him if he was still of the same mind and on his replying in the affirmative he was taken back again and bound between the two boards the saw was then applied and as it went through his brain he experienced the most cruel agonies which however he managed to endure without uttering a cry he's a tough customer said one of the devils as the saw made its way gradually through his chest to which the other replied truly this is filial piety and as the poor fellow has done nothing let us turn the saw a little out of the direct line so as to avoid injuring his heart fang ping then felt the saw make a curve inside him which caused him even more pain than before and in a few moments he was cut through right down to the ground and the two halves of his body fell apart along with the boards to which they were tied one on either side the devils went back to report progress and were then ordered to join fang ping together again and bring him in this they accordingly did the cut all down fang ping's body hurting him dreadfully and feeling as if it would reopen every minute but as fang ping was unable to walk one of the devils took out a cord and tied it round his waist as a reward he said for his 
filial piety the pain immediately ceased and fang ping appeared once more before the judge this time promising that he would make no more complaints the judge now gave orders that he should be sent up to earth and the devils escorting him out of the north gate of the city showed him his way home and went away fang ping now saw that there was even less chance of securing justice in the infernal regions than upon the earth above and having no means of getting at the great king to plead his case he bethought himself of a certain upright and benevolent god called er lang who was a relative of the great kings and him he determined to seek so he turned about and took his way southwards but was immediately seized by some devils sent out by the judge to watch that he really went back to his home these devils heard him again into the judge's presence where he was received contrary to his expectation with great affability the judge himself praising his filial piety but declaring that he need trouble no further in the matter as his father had already been born again in a wealthy and illustrious family and upon you added the judge i now bestow a present of one thousand ounces of silver to take home with you as well as the old age of a centenarian with which i hope you will be satisfied he then showed fang ping the stamped record of this and sent him away in charge of the devils the latter now began to abuse him for giving them so much trouble but fang ping turned sharply upon them and threatened to take them back before the judge they were then silent and marched along for about half a day until at length they reached a village where the devils invited fang ping into a house the door of which was standing half open fang ping was just going in when suddenly the devils gave him a shove from behind and there he was born again on earth as a little girl for three days he pined and cried without taking any food and then he died but his spirit did not forget ere long and set out at once in search of that god he had not gone far when he fell in with the retinue of some high personage and one of the attendants seized him for getting in the way and hurried him before his master he was taken to a chariot where he saw a handsome young man sitting in great state and thinking that now was his chance he told the young man who he imagined to be a high mandarin all his sad story from beginning to end his bones were then loosed and he went along with the young man until they reached a place where several officials came out to receive them and to one of these he confided fang ping who now learnt that the young man was no other than god himself the officials being the nine princes of heaven and the one to whose care he was entrusted no other than er lang this last was very tall and had a long white beard not at all like the popular representation of a god and when the other princes had gone he took fang ping into a courtroom where he saw his father and their old enemy young besides all the lictors and others who had been mixed up in the case by and by some criminals were brought in in cages and these turned out to be the judge prefect and magistrate the trial was then commenced the three wicked officers trembling and shaking in their shoes and when he had heard the evidence ere long proceeded to pass sentence upon the prisoners each of whom he sentenced after enlarging upon the enormity of their several crimes to be roasted boiled 
and otherwise put to most excruciating tortures as for fang ping he accorded him three extra decades of life as a reward for his filial piety and a copy of the sentence was put in his pocket father and son journeyed along together and at length reached their home that is to say fang ping was the first to recover consciousness and then bade the servants open his father's coffin which they immediately did and the old man at once came back to life but when fang ping looked for his copy of the sentence lo it had disappeared as for the young family poverty soon overtook them and all their lands passed into fang ping's hands for as sure as any one else bought them they became sterile forthwith and would produce nothing but fang ping and his father lived on happily both reaching the age of ninety and odd years End of chapter seventy six in the infernal regions Chapter seventy seven of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two by Songling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five. Chapter seventy seven. Singular Case of Ophthalmia. A Mr. Ku of Chang Nan was stopping in an inn at Chi Xia when he was attacked by a very severe inflammation of the eyes. Day and night he lay on his bed groaning, no medicines being of any avail, and when he did get a little better, his recovery was accompanied by a singular phenomenon. Every time he closed his eyes, he beheld in front of him a number of large buildings with all their doors wide open and people passing and repassing in the background, none of whom he recognized by sight. One day he had just sat down to have a good look, when all of a sudden he felt himself passing through the open doors. He went on through three courtyards without meeting anyone, but on looking into some rooms on either side he saw a great number of young girls sitting, lying, and kneeling about on a red carpet which was spread on the ground. Just then a man came out from behind the building, and seeing Ku said to him, Ah, the prince said there was a stranger at the door. I suppose you were the person he meant. He then asked Ku to walk in, which the latter was at first unwilling to do. However, he yielded to the man's instances and accompanied him in, asking whose palace it was. His guide told him it belonged to the son of the ninth prince, and that he had arrived at the nick of time, for a number of friends and relatives had chosen this very day to come and congratulate the young gentleman on his recent recovery from a severe illness. Meanwhile, another person had come out to hurry them on, and they soon reached a spot where there was a pavilion facing the north, with an ornamental terrace and red balustrades supported by nine pillars. Ascending the steps, they found the palace full of visitors, and then espied a young man seated with his face to the north, whom they at once knew to be the prince's son, and thereupon they prostrated themselves before him, the whole company rising as they did so. The young prince made Ku sit down to the east of him and caused wine to be served, after which some singing girls came in and performed the Hua Feng Chu. They had got to about the third scene when all of a sudden Ku heard the landlord of the inn and his servant shouting out to him that dinner was ready and was dreadfully afraid that the young prince too had heard. No one, however, seemed to have noticed anything, so Ku begged to be excused a moment as he wished to change his clothes and immediately ran out. He then looked up and saw the sun low in the west and his servant standing by his bedside, whereupon he knew that he had never left the inn. He was much chagrined at this and wished to go back as fast as he could, 
he therefore dismissed his servant and on shutting his eyes once more he found everything just as he had left it except that where on the first occasion he had observed the young girls there were now none to be seen but only some dishevelled humpback creatures who cried out at him and asked him what he meant by spying about there ku didn't dare reply but hurried past them as quickly as he could and on to the pavilion of the young prince there he found him still sitting but with a black beard over a foot in length and the prince was anxious to know where he had been saying that seven scenes of the play were already over he then seized a big goblet of wine and made ku drink it as a penalty by which time the play was finished and the list was handed up for a further selection the marriage of peng tzu was selected and the singing girls began to hand round the wine in coconuts big enough to hold about five quarts which ku declined on the ground that he was suffering from weak eyes and was consequently afraid to drink too much if your eyes are bad cried the young prince the court physician is at hand and can attend to you thereupon one of the guests sitting to the east came forward and opening ku's eyes with his fingers touched them with some white ointment which he applied from the end of a jade pin he then bade ku close his eyes and take a short nap so the prince had him conducted into a sleeping room where he found the bed so soft and surrounded by such delicious perfume that he soon fell into a deep slumber by and by he was awakened by what appeared to be the clashing of cymbals and fancied that the play was still going on but on opening his eyes he saw that it was only the inn dog which was licking an oilman's gong his ophthalmia however was quite cured and when he shut his eyes again he could see nothing end of chapter seventy seven recording by holly jensen Chapter 78 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maya. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chu Ko Chang and His Ghost. At Huai Shang, there lived a graduate named Chu Chien Ni, who, though fifty years of age, had but one son, called Ku Chang, whom he loved very dearly. This boy, when about thirteen or fourteen, was a handsome, well-favored fellow, strangely averse to study, and often playing truant from school, sometimes for the whole day, without any remonstrance on the part of his father one day he went away and did not come back in the evening neither after a diligent search could any traces of him be discovered his father and mother were in despair and hardly cared to live but after a year and more had passed away lo and behold ku chang returned saying that he had been beguiled away by a taoist priest who however had not done him any harm and that he had seized a moment while the priest was absent to escape and find his way home again his father was delighted and asked him no more questions but set to work to give him an education and ku chang was so much cleverer and more intelligent than he had been before that by the following year he had taken his bachelor's degree and had made quite a name for himself immediately all the good families of the neighborhood wanted to secure him as a son-in-law among others proposed there was an extremely nice girl the daughter of a gentleman named chao who had taken his doctor's degree and ku chang's father was very anxious that he should marry the young lady the youth himself would not hear of it but stuck to his books and took his master's degree quite refusing to entertain any thought of marriage 
and this so exasperated his mother that one day the good lady began to rate him soundly ku chang got up in a great rage and cried out i have long been wanting to get away and have only remained for your sakes i shall now say farewell and leave miss chow for any one that likes to marry her at this his mother tried to detain him but in a moment he had fallen forwards on the ground and there was nothing left of him but his hat and clothes they were all dreadfully frightened thinking that it must have been ku chang's ghost who had been with them and gave themselves up to weeping and lamentation however the very next day ku chang arrived accompanied by a retinue of horses and servants his story being that he had formerly been kidnapped and sold to a wealthy trader who being then childless had adopted him but who when he subsequently had a son born to him by his own wife sent ku chang back to his old home and as soon as his father began to question him as to his studies his utter dullness and want of knowledge soon made it clear that he was the real ku chang of old but he was already known as a man who had got his master's degree that is the ghost of him had got it so it was determined in the family to keep the whole affair secret this ku chang was only too ready to espouse miss chow and before a year had passed over their heads his wife had presented the old people with the much longed for grandson End of Chu Ku Chang and His Ghost Chapter seventy nine of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maya. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two by Song Ling Pu translated by herbert allen giles the spirits of the pu yang lake an official named chai was appointed to a post at jiao chou and on his way thither crossed the pu yang lake happening to visit the shrine of the local spirits he noticed a carved image of the patriotic ting pu lang and another of a namesake of his own the latter occupying a very inferior position come come said chai my patron saint shan't be put in the background like that so he moved the image into a more honourable place and then went back on board his boat again soon after a great wind struck the vessel and carried away the mast and sails at which the sailors in great alarm set to work to howl and cry however in a few moments they saw a small skiff come cutting through the waves and before long they were all safely on board the man who rowed it was strangely like the image in the shrine the position of which chai had changed but they were hardly out of danger when the squall had passed over and skiff and men had both vanished end of the spirits of the pu yang lake Chapter 80 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories by a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. Chapter 80. 
the stream of cash. A certain gentleman's servant was one day in his master's garden, when he beheld a stream of cash flowing by, two or three feet in breadth and of about the same depth. He immediately seized two large handfuls and then threw himself down on the top of the stream in order to try and secure the rest. However, when he got up, he found that it had all flowed away from under him, none being left except what he had got in his two hands. Ha, says a commentator, money is properly a circulating medium and is not intended for a man to lie upon and keep all to himself. End of chapter 80「Chapter 81 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Sung Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 81, The Injustice of Heaven. Mr. Xu was a magistrate at Shantung. A certain upper chamber of his house was used as a storeroom but some creature managed so frequently to get in and make havoc among the stores for which the servants were always being scolded that at length some of the latter determined to keep watch by and by they saw a huge spider as big as a peck measure and hurried off to tell their master who thought it so strange that he gave orders to the servants to feed the insect with cakes it thus became very tame and would always come forth when hungry returning as soon as it had taken enough to eat years passed away and one day mr Hsu was consulting his archives when suddenly the spider appeared and ran under the table thinking it was hungry he bade his servants give it a cake but the next moment he noticed two snakes of about the thickness of a chopstick lying one on each side the spider drew in its legs as if in mortal fear, and the snakes began to swell out until they were as big round as an egg at which Mr. Shu was greatly alarmed, and would have hurried away when crash went a peal of thunder, killing every person in the house. Mr. Shu himself recovered consciousness after a little while, but only to see his wife and servants, seven persons in all, lying dead, and after a month's illness he too departed this life. Now Mr. Shu was an upright, honorable man who really had the interests of the people at heart. A subscription was accordingly raised to pay his funeral expenses, and on the day of his burial the air was rent from miles round with cries of weeping and lamentation. End of chapter 81 Chapter 82 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. The Sea Serpent A trader named Shia was voyaging on the South Seas, when one night it suddenly became as light as day on board his ship. Jumping up to see what was the matter, he beheld a huge creature with its body half out of the water, towering up like a hill. Its eyes resembled two suns, and threw a light far and wide. And when the trader asked the boatman what it was, there was not one who could say. They all crouched down and watched it and by and by the monster gradually disappeared in the water again, leaving everything in darkness as before. And when they reached port, they found all the people talking about a strange phenomenon of a great light that had appeared in the night, the time of which coincided exactly with the strange scene they themselves had witnessed. End of chapter 82 Chapter 83 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio. 
Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 83. The Magic Mirror. But if you would really like to have something that has belonged to me, said she, you shall. Whereupon she took out a mirror and gave it to him, saying, Whenever you want to see me, you must look for me in your books, otherwise I shall not be visible. And in a moment she had vanished. Liu went home very melancholy at heart, but when he looked in the mirror, there was Fang Xian, standing with her back to him, gazing, as it were, at someone who was going away and about a hundred paces from her. He then bethought himself of her injunctions and settled down to his studies, refusing to receive any visitors, and a few days subsequently, when he happened to look in the mirror, there was Feng Xian, with her face turned towards him and smiling in every feature. After this, he was always taking out the mirror to look at her. However, in about a month, his good resolutions began to disappear, and he once more went out to enjoy himself and waste his time as before. When he returned home and looked in the mirror, Feng Xian seemed to be crying bitterly, and the day after, when he looked at her again, she had her back turned towards him, as on the day he received the mirror. He now knew that it was because he had neglected his studies, and forthwith set to work again with all diligence, until in a month's time she had turned round once again. Henceforward, whenever anything interrupted his progress, Feng Xian's countenance became sad. But whenever he was getting on well, her sadness was changed to smiles. Night and morning, Liu would look at the mirror, regarding it quite in the light of a revered preceptor. And in three years' time, he took his degree in triumph. Now, cried he, I shall be able to look Feng Xian in the face. And there, sure enough, she was, with her delicately penciled arched eyebrows, and her teeth just showing between her lips, as happy-looking as she could be, when all of a sudden she seemed to speak, and Liu heard her say, A pretty pair we make, I must allow. And the next moment, Feng Xian stood by his side. End of chapter 83 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista Chapter 84 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Sung Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 84. Courage Tested. Mr. Tung was a Xu Chao man, very fond of playing broadsword, and a light-hearted, devil-may-care fellow, who was often involving himself in trouble. One day he fell in with a traveler who was riding on a mule and going the same way as himself, whereupon they entered into conversation and began to talk to each other about feats of strength and so on. The traveler said his name was Tsung, and he belonged to Liao Yang, and that he had been twenty years away from home, and had just returned from beyond the sea. And I venture to say, cried Tung, that in your wanderings on the four seas you have seen a great many people, but have you seen any supernaturally clever ones? As a footnote, the four seas are supposed by the Chinese to bound the habitable portions of the earth, which, by the way, they further believe to be square. In the center of all is China, extending far and wide in every direction, the eye of the universe, the middle kingdom. Away at a distance from her shores lie a number of small islands wherein dwell such barbarous nations as the English, French, Dutch, etc., Tung asked him to what he alluded, and then Tung explained what his own particular hobby was, adding how much he would like to learn from them any tricks in the art of broadsword. Supernaturals, replied the traveler, 
are to be found everywhere it needs but that a man should be a loyal subject of a filial son for him to know all that the supernaturals know right you are indeed cried tung as he drew a short sword from his belt and tapping the blade with his fingers began to accompany it with a song he then cut down a tree that was by the wayside to show to own how sharp it was at which to own smoothed his beard and smiled begging to be allowed to have a look at the weapon tung handed it to him and when he had turned it over two or three times he said this is a very inferior piece of steel now though i know nothing about broadsword myself i have a weapon which is really of some use he then drew from beneath his coat a sword of a foot or so in length and with it he began to pare pieces of tung sword which seemed as soft as a melon and which he cut quite away like a horse's hoof tung was greatly astonished and borrowed the other sword to examine it, returning it after carefully wiping the blade. He then invited Tung to his house and made him stay the night, and after begging him to explain the mystery of his sword, began to nurse his leg and sit listening respectfully without saying a word. It was already pretty late, when suddenly there was a sound of scuffling next door where Tung's father lived and on putting his ear to the wall he heard an angry voice saying tell your son to come here at once and then i will spare you this was followed by other sounds of beating and a continued groaning in a voice which tung knew to be his father's he therefore seized a spear and was about to rush forth but tung held him back saying you'll be killed for a certainty if you go let us think of some other plan Tung asked what plan he could suggest, to which the other replied, The robbers are killing your father. There is no help for you. But as you have no brothers, just go and tell your wife and children what your last wishes are, while I try and rouse the servants. Tung agreed to this, and ran in to tell his wife, who clung to him and implored him not to go, until at length all his courage had ebbed away and he went upstairs with her to get his bow and arrows ready to resist the robber's attack at that juncture he heard the voice of his friend to own outside of the eaves of the house saying with a laugh all right the robbers have gone but on lighting a candle he could see nothing of him he then stole out to the front door where he met his father with a lantern in his hand coming in from a party at a neighbor's house, and the whole courtyard was covered with the ashes of burnt grass, whereby he knew that Tung the Traveler was himself a supernatural. End of chapter 84「Chapter 85 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. The Disembodied Friend Mr. Chen, M.A., of Shun Chen Fu, when a boy of sixteen, went to a school at a Buddhist temple. There were a great many scholars besides himself, and among others, one named Chu was said he came from Shangtung. This Chu was a very hard-working fellow. He never seemed to be idle, and actually slept in the schoolroom, not going home at all. Chen became much attached to him, and one day asked him why he never went away. Well, you see, replied Chu, my people are very poor, and can hardly afford to pay for my schooling. But by dint of working half the night, two of my days are equal to three of anybody else's. Thereupon Chan said that he would bring his own bed to school, and that they would sleep there together, to which Chu replied that the teaching they got wasn't worth much, and that they would do something better by putting themselves under a certain old scholar named Lu. This they were easily able to do so, as the arrangement that the temple was monthly, and at the end of each month anyone was free to 
go or to come. So off they went to this Mr. Lu, a man of considerable literary attainments, who had found himself in Chongqing Fu without cash in his pocket, and was accordingly obliged to take pupils. He was delighted at getting two additions to his number, and, Chu showing himself an apt scholar, the two soon became very great friends, sleeping in the same room and eating at the same table. At the end of the month, Chu asked for leave or absence, and to the astonishment of all, ten days elapsed without anything being heard of him. It then chanced that Chen went to the Ting Ning Temple, and there he saw Chu under one of the verandas, occupied in cutting wood for lucifer matches. The latter was much disconcerted by the arrival of Chen, who asked why he had given up his studies. So the latter took him aside, and explained that he was so poor as to be obliged to work half a month to scrape together funds enough for his next month's schooling. You come along back with me, cried Chen, on hearing this. I will arrange for the payment, which Chu immediately consented to do on condition that Chen would keep the whole thing a profound secret. Now Chen's father was a wealthy tradesman, and from his till Chen abstracted money wherewith to pay for Chu, and by and by, when his father found him out, he confessed why he had done so. Thereupon Chan's father called him a fool, and would not let him resume his studies, at which Chu was much heard, and would have left the school too. But that old Mr. Liu discovered what had taken place, and gave him the money to return to Chan's father, keeping him at the school, and treating him quite like his own son. So Chan studied no more, but whenever he met Chu, he always asked him to join him some refreshment at a restaurant, Chu invariably refusing, but yielding at length at his entreaties, being himself loth to break off their old acquaintanceship. Thus two years passed away, and Chen's father died, and Chen went back to his book under the guidance of old Mr. Liu, who was very glad to see such determination. Of course, Chen was now far behind Chu, and in about six months Liu's son arrived, having begged his way in search of his father, so Mr. Liu gave up his school and returned home with a purse which his pupils had made for him, Chu adding nothing thereto but his tears. Parting, Mr. Liu advised Chen to take Chu as his tutor, and this he did, establishing him comfortably in the house with him. The examination was very shortly to commence, and Chen felt convinced that he should not get through, but Chu said he thought he should be able to manage the matter for him. On the appointed day, he introduced Chen to a gentleman who he said was a cousin of his, named Liu, and asked Chen to accompany this cousin, which Chen was just proceeding to do, when Chu pulled him back from behind, and he would have fallen down that the cousin pulled him up again, and then, after having scrutinized his appearance, carried him off to his own house. There being no ladies there, Chen was put into the inner apartments, and a few days afterwards, Liu said to him, A great many people will be at the gardens today. Let us go and amuse ourselves a while, and afterwards I will send you home again. He then gave orders that his servant should proceed on ahead with tea and wine, and by and by they themselves went, and were soon in the thick of the fate. Crossing over a bridge, they saw beneath an old willow tree a painted skiff, and were soon on board, engaged in freely passing round the wine. However, finding this a little dull, Liu bade his servant go and see if Miss Li, the famous singing girl, was at home, and in a few minutes the servant returned, bringing Miss Li with him. Chen had met her before, and so they at once engaged greetings, while Liu begged her to be good enough to favor them for a song. Miss Li, who seemed laboring under a fit of melancholy, forthwith began a funeral dirge, at which Chen was not much pleased and observed that such a theme was hardly suitable to the occasion. With a forced smile, Ms. Lee changed her key, and gave them a love song, whereupon Chen seized her hand and said, There's that song of the Huansha River, which you sang once before. I've read over it several times, but have quite forgotten the words. Then Ms. Lee began. Eyes overflowing with tears, she sits gazing into her glass, lifting the bamboo screen, one of her comrades approaches. She bends her head and seems intent on her bow-like slippers, and forces her eyebrows to arch themselves into a smile. With her scarlet sleeve she wipes the tears from her perfumed cheek, 
in fear and trembling, lest they should guess the thoughts that overwhelm her. Chen repeated this several times, until at length the skiff stopped, and they passed her along veranda, where a great many verses had been inscribed on the walls, to which Chen at once proceeded to add a stanza of his own. Evening was now coming on, and Liu remarked that the candidates would be just about leaving the examination hall, so he escorted him back to his own home, and there left him. The room was dark, and there was no one with him, but by and by the servants ushered in someone whom at the first he took to be Chu. However, he soon saw that it was not Chu, and in some other moment the stranger had fallen against him and knocked him down. Masters fainted, cried the servants, as they ran to pick him up, and then Chen discovered that the one who had fallen down was really no other than himself. On getting up, he saw Chu standing by his side, and when they had sent away the servants, the latter said, Don't be alarmed. I am nothing more than a disembodied spirit. My time for reappearing on earth is long overdue, but I could not forget your kindness to me, and accordingly I have remained under this form in order to assist in the accomplishment of your wishes. Three bouts are over, and your ambition will be gratified. Chen then inquired if Chu could assist him in like manner for his doctor's degree, to which the latter replied, Alas, the luck descending to you from your ancestors is not equal to that. They were a niggardly lot, and unfit for the posthumous honors. You would thus confer on them. Chen next asked him whither he was going, and Chu replied that he hoped, through the agency of his cousin, who was a clerk in purgatory, to be born again in old Mr. Liu's family. They then bade each other adieu, and then, when morning came, Chen set off to call on Miss Li, the singing girl, but on reaching her house he found that she had been dead some days. He walked on to the gardens, and there he saw traces of verses that had been written on the walls, and evidently rubbed out, so as to be hardly decipherable. In a moment it flashed across him that the verses and their composers belonged to the other world. Towards evening, Chu reappeared in high spirits, saying that he had succeeded in his design, and had come to wish Chen a long farewell. Holding out his open palms, he requested Chen to write the word Chu on each, and then, after refusing to take a parting cup, he went away, telling Chen that the examination list would soon be out, and that they would meet again before long. Chen brushed away his tears and escorted him to the door, where a man who had been waiting for him laid his hand on Chu's head, and pressed it downwards until Chu was perfectly flat. The man then put him in a sack and carried him off on his back. A few days afterwards the list came out, and to his great joy, Chen found his name among the successful candidates, whereupon he immediately started off to visit his old tutor, Mr. Liu. Now Mr. Liu's wife had had no children for ten years, being about fifty years of age, when suddenly she gave birth to a son, who was born with both fists doubled up so that no one could open them. On his arrival, Chen begged to see the child, and declared that inside its hands would be found written the word Chu. Old Mr. Liu laughed at this, but no sooner had the child set eyes on Chen then both its fists opened spontaneously, and there was the word, as Chen had said. The story was soon told, and Chen went home, after making a handsome present to the family, and later on, when Mr. Liu went up for his doctor's degree, and stayed at Chen's house. His son was thirteen years old, and had already matriculated as a candidate for literary honors. End of chapter 85. Chapter 86 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. Chapter 86. The Cloth Merchant A certain cloth merchant went to Ching Chu, 
where he happened to stroll into an old temple, all tumble-down and in ruins. He was lamenting over this sad state of things when a priest, who stood by, observed that a devout believer like himself could hardly do better than put the place into repair, and thus obtain favor in the eyes of Buddha. This the merchant consented to do, whereupon the priest invited him to walk into the private quarters of the temple, and treated him with much courtesy, but he went on to propose that our friend the merchant should also undertake the general ornamentation of the place, both inside and out. Footnote. The elaborate gilding and woodwork of an ordinary Chinese temple from a very serious item in the expense of restoration. Public subscriptions are usually the means employed for raising sufficient funds, the names of subscribers and amount given by each being published in some conspicuous position. Occasionally devout priests, black swans indeed in China, shut themselves up in boxes studded with nails, one of which they pull out every time a certain donation is given, and there they remain until every nail is withdrawn. But after all, it is difficult to say whether they endure these trials so much for the faith's sake as for the funds from which they derive more of the luxuries of life, and the temporary notoriety gained by thus coming before the public. A Chinese proverb says the image-maker doesn't worship Buddha, he knows too much about the idol. And the application of this saying may safely be extended to the majority of Buddhist priests in China. End of footnote. The latter declared he could not afford the expense, and the priest began to get very angry, and urged him so strongly that at last the merchant, in terror, promised to give all the money he had. After this he was preparing to go away, but the priest detained him, saying, "'You haven't given the money of your own free will, and consequently you'll be owing me a grudge. I can't do better than make an end of you at once.' Thereupon he seized a knife and refused to listen to all the cloth merchant's entreaties, until at length the latter asked to be allowed to hang himself, to which the priest consented, and showing him into a dark room told him to make haste about it. At this juncture a Tartar general happened to pass by the temple. Footnote. This is the title generally applied to the Manchu commanders of Manchu garrisons, who are stationed at certain of the most important points of the Chinese Empire, and whose presence is intended as a check upon the action of the civil authorities. End of footnote. And from a distance, through a breach in the old wall, he saw a damsel in a red dress pass into the priest's quarters. This roused his suspicions and dismounting from his horse he entered the temple and searched high and low, but without discovering anything. The dark room above mentioned was locked and double-barred, and the priest refused to open it, saying the place was haunted. The general, in a rage, burst open the door, and there beheld the cloth merchant hanging from a beam. He cut him down at once, and in a short time he was brought round, and told the general the whole story. They then searched for the damsel, but she was nowhere to be found, having been nothing more than a divine manifestation. The general cut off the priest's head and restored the cloth merchant's property to him, after which the latter put the temple in thorough repair and kept it well supplied with lights and incense ever afterwards. Mr. Chow, M.A., told me this story with all its details. Footnote. The moral being, of course, that Buddha protects those who look after his interests on earth. End of footnote. End of chapter 24. Chapter 87 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 87 A Strange Companion Han Kung Fu of Yu Cheng told me that he was one day travelling along a road with a man of his village named Peng, when all of a sudden the latter disappeared, leaving his mule to jog along with an empty saddle. At the same moment, Mr. Han heard his voice calling for assistance, and apparently proceeding from inside one of the panniers strapped across the mule's back and on looking closely there indeed he was in one of the panniers, which, however, did not seem to be at all displaced by his weight. On trying to get him out, the mouth of the pannier closed itself tightly, and it was only when he cut it open with a knife that he saw Peng curled up in it like a dog. He then helped him out and asked him how he managed to get in, but this he was unable to say. 
It further appeared that his family was under Fox influence, many strange things of this kind having happened before. End of chapter 87「Chapter eighty eight of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume two by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five. Chapter eighty eight Spiritualistic Seances. It is customary in Shantung when any one is sick for the women-folk to engage an old sorceress or medium, who strums on a tambourine and performs certain mysterious antics. This custom obtains even more in the capital, where young ladies of the best families frequently organize such seances among themselves. On a table in the hall they spread out a profusion of wine and meat, and burn huge candles which make the place as light as day. Then the sorceress, shortening her skirts, stands on one leg and performs the shang yang while two of the others support her, one on each side. Footnote. It is related in the Family Sayings, an apocryphal work which professes to give conversations of Confucius, that a number of one-legged birds, having suddenly appeared in Qi, the Duke of Qi, sent off to ask the sage what was the meaning of this strange phenomenon. Confucius replied, The bird is the Shang Yang, and portends beneficial rain and formerly the boys and girls in Shantung would hop about on one leg, crying, The Shang Yang has come, after which the rain would be sure to follow. End of footnote. All this time she is chattering unintelligible sentences, something between a song and a prayer, the words being confused, but uttered in a sort of tune. Footnote. Speaking in the unknown tongue like the Irvingites and others. End of footnote. While the hall resounds with the thunder of drums, enough to stun a person, with which her vaticinations are mixed up and lost. By and by her head begins to droop and her eyes to look aslant, and but for her two supporters she would inevitably fall to the ground. Suddenly she stretches forth her neck and bounds several feet into the air, upon which the other women regard her in terror, saying, The spirits have come to eat, and immediately all the candles are blown out and everything is in total darkness. Thus they remain for about a quarter of an hour, afraid to speak a word, which in any case would not be heard through the din, until at length the sorceress calls out the personal name of the head of the family and some others. Footnote. This is a clever hit. The personal name of a man may not be uttered except by his father or mother, grandfather, grandmother, uncles, etc. Thus the mere use of the personal name of the head of a family proves conclusively that the spirit of some one of his ancestors must be present. End of footnote. Whereupon they immediately relight the candles and hurry up to ask if the reply of the spirits is favorable or otherwise. They then see that every scrap of the food and every drop of the wine has disappeared. Meanwhile they watch the old woman's expression, whereby they can tell if the spirits are well disposed and each one asks her some question, to which she as promptly replies. Should there be any unbelievers among the party, the spirits are at once aware of their presence, and the old sorceress pointing her finger at such a one cries out, "'Disrespectful mocker! Where are your trousers?' Upon which the mocker alluded to looks down, and lo, her trousers are gone, gone to the top of a tree in the courtyard where they will subsequently be found. Footnote I consider the whole of the above a curious story to be found in a Chinese work exactly two hundred years old, but no part of it more so than the forcible removal of some part of the clothing, which has been so prominent a feature in the seances of our own day. It may be added that in many a courtyard in Peking will be found one or more trees, which cause the view from the city wall to be very pleasing to the eye, in spite of the filth and ruins which a closer inspection reveals. End of footnote. Manchu women and girls, especially, are firm believers in spiritualism. On the slightest provocation they consult their medium, who comes into the room gorgeously dressed and riding on an imitation horse or tiger. Footnote. The arrangement being that of the hobby horse of bygone days. End of footnote. In her hand she holds a long spear, with which she mounts the couch and postures in an extraordinary manner. 
the animal she rides snorting or roaring fiercely all the time. Footnote. The couches of the north of China are brick beds, heated by a stove underneath and covered with a mat. Upon one of these is generally a dwarf table and a couple of pillows, and here it is that the Chinaman loves to recline, his wine kettle, opium pipe, or teapot within reach, and a friend at his side, with whom he may converse far into the night. End of footnote. Some call her Quan Ti, others Chang Fei, and others, again, Chu Kung, from her terribly martial aspect, which strikes fear into all beholders. Footnote. See number 73, note 63. Chang Fei was the bosom friend of the last, and was his associate commander in the wars of the three kingdoms. Chu Kung was the first emperor of the Chu dynasty, and a pattern of wisdom and virtue. He is said by the Chinese to have invented the mariner's compass, but the legend will not bear investigation. End of footnote. And should any daring fellow try to peep in while the seance is going on, out of the window darts the spear, transfixes his hat, and draws it off his head into the room, while women and girls, young and old, hop round one after the other like geese on one leg, without seeming to get the least fatigued. End of chapter 88《Chapter 89 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. Chapter 89 The Mysterious Head. Several traders who were lodging at an inn in Peking occupied a room which was divided from the adjoining apartment by a partition of boards from which a piece was missing, leaving an aperture about as big as a basin. Suddenly a girl's head appeared through the opening, with very pretty features and nicely dressed hair, and the next moment an arm as white as polished jade. The traders were much alarmed, and thinking it was the work of devils tried to seize the head, which, however, was quickly drawn in again out of their reach. This happened a second time, and then, as they could see no body belonging to the head, one of them took a knife in his hand and crept up against the partition underneath the hole. In a little while the head reappeared, when he made a chop at it and cut it off, the blood spurting out all over the floor and wall. The traders hurried off to tell the landlord, who immediately reported the matter to the authorities, taking the head with him, and the traders were forthwith arrested and examined but the magistrate could make nothing of the case, and as no one appeared for the prosecution, the accused, after about six months' incarceration, were accordingly released, and orders were given for the girl's head to be buried. End of chapter 89 Chapter 90 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to Chapter 90, The Spirit of the Hills. A man named Li, of Yi Tu, was once crossing the hills when he came upon a number of persons sitting on the ground engaged in drinking. As soon as they saw Li, they begged him to join them and vied with each other in filling his cup. Meanwhile he looked about him and noticed that the various trays and dishes contained all kinds of costly food. The wine only seemed to him a little rough on the palate. In the middle of their fun up came a stranger, with a face about three feet long, and a very tall hat, whereupon the others were very much alarmed and cried out, The hill spirit! The hill spirit! running away in all directions as fast as they could go. Lee hid himself in a hole in the ground, and when, by and by, he peeped out to see what had happened, the wine and food had disappeared, and there was nothing but a few dirty pots herds and some pieces of broken tiles with efts and lizards crawling over them. Footnote. Mr. Lee had doubtless taken a drop too much before he started on his mountain walk. End of footnote. End of chapter 90.
Chapter ninety one of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume Two by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five. Chapter ninety one Ingratitude Punished. Ku Tayu was a native of the Yang district, and managed to get a military appointment under the command of Tsu Shu Shun, footnote, of whom I can learn nothing. End footnote. The latter treated him most kindly, and finally sent him as major general of some troops, by which he was then trying to establish the dynasty of the usurping Chows. Ku soon perceived that the game was lost, and immediately turned his forces upon Tsu Shu Shun, whom he succeeded in capturing after Tsu had been wounded in the hand, and whom he at once forwarded as a prisoner to headquarters. That night he dreamed that the judge of purgatory appeared to him, and reproaching him with his base ingratitude, bade the devil lictors seize him and scald his feet in a cauldron of boiling oil. Ku'u then woke up with a start and found that his feet were very sore and painful, and in a short time they swelled up and his toes dropped off. Fever set in, and in his agony he shrieked out, Ungrateful wretch that I was indeed, and fell back and expired. End of chapter 91、chapter、92 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By Song Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, eighteen forty-five to nineteen thirty-five, chapter ninety-two, smelling essays. Footnote: The following extract from a long and otherwise tedious story tells its own tale. Wang is the modest man, and the young man from Yu Hang is the braggart. Sung is merely a friend of Wang's. End of footnote. Now, as they wandered about the temple. They came upon an old blind priest sitting under the veranda, engaged in selling medicines and prescribing for patients. Ah! cried Sung, there is an extraordinary man who is well versed in the arts of composition. And immediately he sent back to get the essay they had just been reading, in order to obtain the old priest's opinion as to its merits. At the same moment up came their friend from Yu Hang, and all three went along together. Wang began by addressing him as professor. Whereupon the priest, who thought the stranger had come to consult him as a doctor, inquired what might be the disease from which he was suffering. Wang then explained what his mission was, upon which the priest smiled and said, Who's been telling you this nonsense? How can a man with no eyes discuss with you the merits of your compositions? Wang replied by asking him to let his ears do duty for his eyes. But the priest answered that he would hardly have patience to sit out Wang's three sections, amounting perhaps to some two thousand and more words. However, added he, if you like to burn it, I'll try what I can do with my nose. Wang complied and burnt the first section there and then, and the old priest, snuffing up the smoke, declared that it wasn't such a bad effort, and finally gave it as his opinion that Wang would probably succeed at the examination. The young scholar from Yu Hang didn't believe that the old priest could really tell anything by these means, and forthwith proceeded to burn an essay by one of the old masters. But the priest no sooner smelt the smoke than he cried out, Beautiful indeed! Beautiful indeed! I do enjoy this! The light of genius and truth is evident here. The Yu Hang scholar was greatly astonished at this, and began to burn an essay of his own, whereupon the priest said, I had had but a taste of that one. Why change so soon to another? The first paragraph, replied the young man, was by a friend. The rest is my own composition. No sooner had he uttered these words than the old priest began to retch violently, and begged that he might have no more, as he was sure it would make him sick. The Yu Hang scholar was much abashed at this, and went away, but in a few days the list came out, and his name was among the successful ones, while Wang's was not. He at once hurried off to tell the old priest, who, when he heard the news, sighed and said, I may be blind with my eyes, but I am not so with my nose, which I fear is the case with the examiners. Besides, added he, I was talking to you about composition. I said nothing about destiny. Footnote. 
This is one of our author's favorite shafts, a sneer at examiners in general, and those who rejected him in particular. End of footnote. End of chapter 92「Chapter 93 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio」Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. « Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio » Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles His Father's Ghost A man named Ting Tzu Cheng of Changning was crossing the Tang Ting Lake when the boat was capsized and he was drowned. His son Liang Su, who towards the close of the Ming Dynasty took the highest degree, was then a baby in arms, and his wife, hearing the bad news, swallowed poison forthwith and left the child to the care of his grandmother. When Liang Su grew up, he was appointed magistrate in Hupei, where he remained about a year. He was then transferred to Hunan on military service, but on reaching the Tung Ting Lake, his feelings overpowered him, and he returned to plead inability as an excuse for not taking up his post. Accordingly, he was degraded to the rank of assistant magistrate, which he at first declined, but was finally compelled to accept, and thenceforward gave himself up to roaming about on the lakes and streams of the surrounding country without paying much attention to his official duties. One night he had anchored his boat alongside the bank of a river, when suddenly the cadence of a sweetly played flagellate broke upon his ear, so he strolled along by the light of the moon in the direction of the music, until, after a few minutes' walking, he reached the cottage standing by itself with a few citron trees around it and brilliantly lighted inside. Approaching a window, he peeped in and saw three persons sitting at a table, engaged in drinking. In the place of honour was a graduate of about thirty years of age. An old man played the host, and at the side sat a much younger man playing on the flagellate. When he had finished, the old man clapped his hands in admiration, but the graduate turned away with a sigh, as if he had not heard a note. Come now, Mr. Lo, cried the old man, addressing the latter, kindly favour us with one of your songs, which I know must be worth hearing. The graduate then began to sing as follows. Over the river the wind blows, called on lonely me, each flow red trampled underfoot, all verdure gone. At home, a thousand li away, I cannot be, so towards the bridge my spirit nightly wanders on. The above was given in such a melancholy tones that the old man smiled and said, Mr. Lu, these must be experiences of your own, and immediately filling a goblet, added, I can do nothing like that, but if you will let me, I will give you a song to help us on with our wine. He then sung a verse from Li Tai Po, and put them all in a lively humour again, after which the young man said he would just go outside and see how high the moon was, which he did, and observing Liang Su outside, clapped his hands and cried out to his companions, There is a man at the window who has seen all we have been doing. He then led Liang Su in, whereupon the other two rose 
and begged him to be seated and to join them in their wine. The wine, however, was cold, and he therefore declined, but a young man at once perceived his reason and proceeded to warm some for him. Liang Su now ordered his servant to go and buy some more, but this his host would not permit him to do. They next inquired Liang Su's name and whence he came, and then the old man said, Why then, you are the father and mother of the district in which I live. My name is River. I am an old resident here. This young man is a Mr. Tu of Kian Su, and this gentleman, added he, pointing to the graduate, is Mr. Rushton, a fellow provincial of yours. Mr. Rushton looked at Liang Su in rather a contemptuous way, and without taking much notice of him, whereupon Liang Su asked him whereabouts he lived in Changning, observing that it was strange he himself should never have heard of such an accomplished gentleman. Alas, replied Rushton, it is many a long day since I left my home, and I know nothing even of my own family. Alas, indeed! These words were uttered in so mournful a tone of voice that the old man broke in with, Come, come now, talking like this, instead of drinking when we are all so jolly together. This will never do. He then drained a bumper himself and said, I propose a game of forfeits. We throw with three dice, and whoever throws so that the spots on one die equal those on the other two shall give us a verse with a corresponding classical allusion in it. He then threw himself and turned up an ace, a two, and a three, whereupon he sang the following lines. An ace and a deuce on one side, just equal a three on the other. For Fen, a chicken was boiled, though three years had passed. By Cheng's mother, thus friends loved to meet. Then the young musician threw and turned up two twos and a four, whereupon he exclaimed, don't laugh at the feeble allusion of an unlearned fellow like me. Two deuces are equal to a four. Four men united their valour in the old city. Thus brothers loved to meet. Mr. Rushton followed with two aces and a two, and recited these lines. Two aces are equal to a two. Lia Sung stretched out his two arms and embraced his father. Thus father and son loved to meet. Liang then threw and turned up the same as Mr. Rushton, whereupon he said, Two aces are equal to a two. Mao Jung regaled Li Tsung with two baskets. Thus host and guest loved to meet. When the party was over, Liang Su rose to go, but Mr. Rushton said, Dear me, why are you in such a hurry? We haven't had a moment to speak of the old place. Please stay. I was just going to ask you a few questions. So Liang Su sat down again, and Mr. Rushton proceeded. I had an old friend, said he, who was drowned in the Tang Ting Lake. He bore the same name as yourself. Was he a relative? He was my father, replied Liang Su. How did you know him? We were friends as boys together, and when he was drowned, I recovered and buried his body by the riverside. Liang Su here burst into tears and thanked Mr. Rushton very warmly, begging him to point out his father's grave. Come again tomorrow, said Mr. Rushton, and I will show it to you. You could easily find it yourself. It's close by here and has ten stalks of water rush growing on it. 
Liang Su now took his leave and went back to his boat, but he could not sleep for thinking of what Mr. Rushton had told him, and at length, without waiting for the dawn, he set out to look for the grave. To his great astonishment, the house where he had spent the previous evening had disappeared, but hunting about in the direction indicated by Mr. Rushton, he found a grave with ten water rushed growing on it, precisely as Mr. Rushton had described. It then flashed across him that Mr. Rushton's name had a special meaning, and that he had been holding converse with none other than the disembodied spirit of his own father. And on inquiring of the people of the place, he learned that twenty years before a benevolent old gentleman named Cow had been in the habit of collecting the bodies of persons found drowned and burying them in that spot. Liang then opened the grave and carried off his father's remains to his own home, where his grandmother, to whom he described Mr. Rushton's appearance, confirmed the suspicion he himself had formed. It also turned out that a young musician was a cousin of his, who had been drowned when nineteen years of age. And then he recollected that the boy's father had subsequently gone to Kansi, and that his mother had died there, and had been buried at the bamboo bridge, to which Mr. Rushton had alluded in his song. But he did not know who the old man was. End of chapter 93、Chip、Chapter 94 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. The Boat Girl Bride. Wang Kulik Nang was a young man of a good family. It happened once, when he was travelling southwards, and had moored his boat to the bank, that he saw in another boat close by a young boat girl embroidering shoes. He was much struck by her beauty, and continued gazing at her for some time, though she took not the slightest notice of him. By and by he began singing, The low long lady lives over the way, Fifteen years is her age, I should say, to attract her attention. And then she seemed to perceive that he was addressing himself to her. But, after just raising her head and glancing at him, she resumed her embroidery as before. Wang then threw a piece of silver towards her, which fell in her skirt, for she merely picked it up and flung it onto the bank as if she had not seen what it was. So Wang put it back in his pocket again, followed up by throwing her a gold bracelet, to which she paid no attention whatever, never taking her eyes off her work. A few minutes after her father appeared, much to the dismay of Wang, who was afraid he would see the bracelet, but the young girl quietly put her feet over it and concealed it from its sight. The boatman let go of the painter, and away they went down the stream, leaving Wang sitting there, not knowing what to do next, and, having recently lost his wife, he regretted that he had not seized the opportunity to make another match. The more so, as when he came to ask the other boat people of the place, no one knew anything about them. This more so, as when he came to ask the other boat people of the place, no one knew anything about them. So Wang got into his own boat, and started off in pursuit. But evening came on, and as he could see nothing of them, he was obliged to turn back and proceed in the direction where business was taking him. When he had finished that, he returned, making inquiries all the way along but without hearing anything about the object of his search. On arriving at home, he was unable either to eat or sleep, so much did this affair occupy his mind, and about a year afterwards he went south again, bought a boat, and lived in it as his home, watching carefully every single vessel that passed either up or down. 
until at last there was hardly one he didn't know by sight but all this time the boat he was looking for never reappeared some six months passed away thus and then having exhausted all his funds he was obliged to go home where he remained in a state of general inaptitude for anything one night he dreamed that he entered a village on the river bank and that after passing several houses he saw one with a door towards the south and a palisade of bamboo inside thinking it was a garden he walked in and beheld a beautiful magnolia covered with blossoms which reminded him of the line and judas tree in flowers before her door a few steps farther a few steps farther on was a neat bamboo hedge on the other side of which towards the north he found a small house with three columns the door of which was locked and another towards the south with its window shaded by the broad leaves of a plantain tree the door was barred by a clothes horse on which was hanging an embroidered petticoat and on seeing this long stepped back knowing that he had got to the ladies quarters but his presence had already been noticed inside and in another moment out came his heroine of the boat overjoyed at seeing her he was on the point of grasping her hand when suddenly the girl's father arrived and in his consternation long waked up and found that it was all a dream every incident of it remained clear and distinct in his mind and he took care to say nothing about it to anybody for fear of destroying its reality another year passed away and he went again to chinkiang where lived an official named Shi, who was an old friend of the family and who invited wang to come and take a cup of wine with him on his way thither wang lost his way but at length reached a village which seemed familiar to him and which he soon found out by the door with the magnolia inside to be identical in every particular with the village of his dream he went in through the doorway and there was everything as he had seen it in his dream even to the boat girl herself she jumped up on his arrival and shutting the door in his face asked what his business was there wang inquired if she had forgotten about the bracelet and went on to tell her how long he had been searching for her and how at last she had been revealed to him in a dream the girl ran back to know his name and family and when she heard who he was she asked what a gentleman like himself could want with a poor boat girl like her as he must have a wife of his own but for you replied wang i should indeed have been married long ago upon which the girl told him if that was really the case he had better apply to her parents although added she they have already refused a great many offers for me the bracelet you gave me is here but my father and mother are just now away from home they will be back shortly you go away now and engage a matchmaker when i dare say it will be all right if the proper formalities are observed wang then retired the girl calling after him to remember that her name was mang yun and her father's mang chang li he proceeded at once his way to mr hsu and after that sought out his intended father-in-law telling him who he was and offering him at the same time one hundred ounces of silver as betrothal money for his daughter she is already promised replied the old man upon which wang declared that he had been making careful inquiries and had heard on all sides that the young lady was not engaged winding up begging to know what objection there was to his suit i've just promised her answered her father and i cannot possibly break my word so wang went away deeply mortified not knowing whether to believe it or not that night he tossed about a good deal and next morning braving to ridicule with which he imagined his friend would view his wished-for alliance with a boat girl he went off to mr hsu and told him all about it why didn't you consult me before cried mr hsu her father is a connection of mine wang then went on to give fuller particulars which his friend interrupted by saying chang li is indeed poor but he has never been a boatman are you sure you are not making a mistake he then sent off his elder son to make inquiries and to him the girl's father said poor i am but i don't sell my daughter your friend imagined that i should be tempted by the sight of his money to forego the usual ceremonies and so i won't have anything to do with him 
if your father desires this match and everything is in proper order i will just go in and consult with my daughter and see if she is willing he then retired for a few minutes but when he came back he raised his hands in congratulation saying everything is as you wish whereupon a day was fixed and the young man went home to report to his father wang now sent off the brothel presents with the usual formalities took up his abode with his friend mr hsu until the marriage was solemnized three days afterwards he bade adieu to his father-in-law and started on his way northwards in the evening as they were sitting on the boat together wang said to his wife when i first met you near this spot i fancied you were not of the ordinary boating class where were you then going i was going to visit my uncle she replied we are not a wealthy family you know but we don't want anything through an improper channel and i couldn't help smiling at the great eyes you were making at me all the time trying to tempt me with money when i heard you speak i knew at once you were a man of refinement though i guess you were a bit of a rake and so i hit your bracelet and saved you from the wrath of my father and yet replied wang you have fallen into my snare after all adding after a little pressure for i can't conceal from you much longer the fact that i have already a wife belonging to a high official family this she did not believe until he began to affirm it seriously and then she jumped up and ran out of the cabin wang followed at once but before he could reach her she was already in the river whereupon he shouted out to boats to come to their assistance causing quite a commotion all round about but nothing was to be seen in the river save only the reflection of the stars shining brightly on the water all night long wang went sorely up and down and offered a high reward for the body which however was not forthcoming so when he went home in despair and then fearing lest his father-in-law should come to visit his daughter he started on a visit to a connection of his who had an appointment in ho nan in the course of a year or two when on his homeward journey he chanced to be detained by bad weather at a roadside inn of rather clearer appearance than usual within he saw an old woman playing with a child which as soon as he entered held out its arms to him to be taken wang took the child on his knee and there it remained refusing to go back to its nurse and when the rain had stopped and wang was getting ready to go the child cried out papa gone the nurse told it to hold its tongue and at the same moment out from behind the screen came wang's long-lost wife you bad fellow said she what am i to do with this pointing to the child and then wang knew that the boy was his own son he was much affected and swore by the son that the words he had uttered had been uttered in jest and by and by his wife's anger was soothed she then explained how she had been picked up by a passing boat the occupant of which was the owner of the house they were in a man of sixty years of age who had no children of his own and who kindly adopted her she also told him how she had several offers of marriage all of which she had refused and how her child was born and that she had called him chi sheng and that he was then a year old wang now unpacked his baggage again and went in to see the old gentleman and his wife whom he treated as if they had actually been his wife's parents a few days afterwards they set off together towards wang's house where they found his wife's real father awaiting them he had been there more than two months and had been considerably disconcerted by the mysterious remarks of wang's servants but the arrival of his daughter and her husband made things all smooth again and when they told him what had happened he understood the demeanour of the servants which had seemed so strange to him at first End of chapter ninety four chapter ninety five of strange stories from a chinese studio volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by holly jensen strange stories from a chinese studio volume two by song ling pu translated by herbert allen giles eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five chapter ninety five the two brides now chi sheng or wang sun was one of the cleverest young fellows in the district and his father and mother who had foreseen his ability from the time when 
as a baby in long clothes, he distinguished them from other people, loved him very dearly. He grew up into a handsome lad. At eight or nine he could compose elegantly, and by fourteen he had already entered his name as a candidate for the first degree, after which his marriage became a question for consideration. Now his father's younger sister, Er Niang, had married a gentleman named Cheng Tzu Chiao, and they had a daughter called Kui Siu, who was extremely pretty, and with whom Qi Sheng fell deeply in love, being soon unable either to eat or to sleep. His parents became extremely uneasy about him and inquired what it was that ailed him, and when he told them, they at once set off a matchmaker to Mr. Cheng. The latter, however, was rather a stickler for the proprieties and replied that the near relation precluded him from accepting the offer. Thereupon, Chi Sheng became dangerously ill, and his mother, not knowing what to do, secretly tried to persuade Er Niang to let her daughter come over to their house. But Mr. Cheng heard of it and was so angry that Chi Sheng's father and mother gave up all hope of arranging the match. At that time, there was a gentleman named Chang living nearby who had five daughters, all very pretty, but the youngest, called Wu Ko, was singularly beautiful, far surpassing her four sisters. She was not betrothed to anyone when one day, as she was on her way to worship at the family tombs, she chanced to see Chi Sheng and at her return home spoke about him to her mother. Her mother guessed what her meaning was and arranged with a matchmaker named Mrs. Yu to call upon Chi Sheng's parents. This she did precisely at the time when Chi Sheng was so ill and forthwith told his mother that her son's complaint was one she, Mrs. Yu, was quite competent to cure, going on to tell her about Miss Wu Ko and the proposed marriage, at which the good lady was delighted and sent her in to talk about it to Chi Sheng himself. Alas, cried he, when he had heard Mrs. Yu's story, you are bringing me the wrong medicine for my complaint. All depends upon the efficacy of the medicine, replied Mrs. Yu. If the medicine is good, it matters not what is the name of the doctor who administers the draft, while to set your heart on a particular person and to lie there and die because that person doesn't come is surely foolish in the extreme. Ah, rejoined Chi Sheng, there is no medicine under heaven that will do me any good. Mrs. Yu told him his experience was limited and proceeded to expatiate by speaking and gesticulating on the beauty and liveliness of Wu Ko. But all Chi Sheng said was that she was not what he wanted, and turning round his face to the wall would listen to no more about her. So Mrs. Yu was obliged to go away, and Chi Sheng became worse and worse every day until suddenly one of the maids came in and informed him that the young lady herself was at the door. Immediately he jumped up and ran out, and lo, there before him stood a beautiful girl, whom, however, he soon discovered not to be Kui Siu. She wore a light yellow robe with a fine silk jacket and an embroidered petticoat, from beneath which her two little feet peeped out, and altogether she more resembled a fairy than anything else. Chi Sheng inquired her name, to which she replied that it was Wu Ko, adding that she couldn't understand his devoted attachment to Kui Siu as if there was nobody else in the world. Chi Sheng apologized, saying that he had never before seen anyone so beautiful as Kui Siu, but that he was now aware of his mistake. He then swore everlasting fidelity to her and was just grasping her hand when he awoke and found his mother rubbing him. It was a dream, but so accurately defined in all its details that he began to think if Wu Ko was really such as he had seen her, there would be no further need to try for his impracticable cousin. So he communicated his dream to his mother, and she, only too delighted to notice this change of feeling, offered to go to Wu Ko's house herself. But Chi Sheng would not hear of this and arranged with an old woman who knew the family to find some pretext for going there and to report to him what Wu Ko was like. When she arrived, Wu Ko was ill in bed and lay with her head propped up by pillows, looking very pretty indeed. The old woman approached the couch and asked what was the matter, to which Wu Ko made no reply, her fingers fidgeting all the time with her waistband. 
"'She's been behaving badly to her father and mother,' cried the latter, who was in the room. "'There's many a one has offered to marry her, but she says she'll have none but Chi Sheng. And then, when I scold her a bit, she takes on and won't touch her food for days. Madam, said the old woman, if you could get that young man for your daughter, they would make a truly pretty pair. And as for him, if he could only see Miss Wu Ko, I'm afraid it would be too much for him. What do you think of my going there and getting them to make proposals? No, thank you, replied Wu Ko. I would rather not risk his refusal upon which the old woman declared she would succeed, and hurried off to tell Chi Sheng, who was delighted to find from her the report that Wu Ko was exactly as he had seen her in his dream, though he didn't trust implicitly in all the old woman said. By and by, when he began to get a little better, he consulted with the old woman as to how he could see Wu Ko with his own eyes, and after some little difficulty, it was arranged that Chi Sheng should hide himself in a room from which he would be able to see her as she crossed the yard supported by a maid, which she did every day at a certain hour. This Chi Sheng proceeded to do, and in a little while out she came, accompanied by the old woman as well, who instantly drew her attention either to the clouds or the trees in order that she should walk more leisurely. Thus Chi Sheng had a good look at her, and saw that she was truly the young lady of his dream. He could hardly contain himself for joy, and when the old woman arrived and asked if she would do instead of Kui Su, he thanked her very warmly and returned to his own home. There he told his father and mother, who sent off a matchmaker to arrange the preliminaries, but the latter came back and told them that Wu Ko was already betrothed. This was a terrible blow for Chi Sheng, who was soon as ill as ever, and offered no reply to his father and mother when they charged him with having made a mistake. For several months he ate nothing but a bowl of rice gruel a day, and he became as emaciated as a fowl, when all of a sudden the old woman walked in and asked him what was the matter. Foolish boy, said she, when he had told her all, before you wouldn't have her, and do you imagine she is bound to have you now? But I'll see if I can't help you, for were she the emperor's own daughter, I should still find some way of getting her. Chi Sheng asked what he should do, and she then told him to send a servant with a letter next day to Wu Ko's house, to which his father at first objected for fear of another repulse. But the old woman assured him that Wu Ko's parents had since repented, besides which no written contract had as yet been made. And you know the proverb, added she, that those who are first at the fire will get their dinner first. So Chi Sheng's father agreed, and two servants were accordingly sent, their mission proving a complete success. Chi Sheng now rapidly recovered his health and thought no more of Kui Su, who, when she heard of the intended match, became in her turn very seriously ill, to the great anger of her father, who said she might die for all he cared, but to the great sorrow of her mother, who was extremely fond of her daughter. The latter even went so far as to propose to Mr. Chang that Kui Su should go as second wife, at which he was so enraged that he declared he would wash his hands of the girl altogether. The mother then found out when Chi Shang's wedding was to take place, and borrowing a chair and attendance from her brother under pretense of going to visit him, put Kui Su inside and sent her off to her uncle's house. As she arrived at the door, the servant spread a carpet for her to walk on, and the band struck up the wedding march. Chi Sheng went out to see what it was all about, and there met a young lady in a bridal veil, from whom he would have escaped had not her servants surrounded them, and before he knew what he was doing, he was making her the usual salutation of a bridegroom. They then went in together, and, to his further astonishment, he found that the young lady was Kui Su, and being now unable to go and meet Wu Ko, a message was sent to her father telling him what had occurred. He too got into a great rage and vowed he would break off the match, but Wu Ko herself said she would go all the same, her rival having only got the start of her in point of time. And go she did, and the two wives, instead of quarreling as was expected, lived very happily together like sisters, and wore each other's clothes and shoes without distinction, Kui Siu taking the place of an elder sister as being somewhat older than Wu Ko. 
one day after these events chi sheng asked wu ko why she had refused his offer to which she replied that it was merely to pay him out for having previously refused her father's proposal before you had seen me your head was full of kui siu but after you had seen me your thoughts were somewhat divided and i wanted to know how i compared with her and whether you would fall ill on my account as you had on hers that we mightn't quarrel about our looks it was a cruel revenge said chi sheng but how should i ever have got sight of you had it not been for the old woman what had she to do with it replied wu ko i knew you were behind the door all the time when i was ill i dreamt that i went to your house and saw you but i looked upon it only as a dream until i heard that you had dreamt that i had actually been there and then i knew that my spirit must have been with you chi sheng now related to her the particulars of his vision which coincided exactly with her own and thus strangely enough had the matrimonial alliances of both father and son been brought about by dreams end of chapter ninety five recording by holly jensen chapter ninety six of strange stories from a chinese studio volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain strange stories from a chinese studio volume two by san ling pu translated by herbert allen giles eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five a supernatural wife a certain mr chow of chang san lodged in a family of the name of tai he was very badly off and falling sick was brought almost to death's door one day they moved him into the veranda that it might be cooler for him and when he awoke from a nap lo a beautiful girl was standing by his side i am come to be your wife said the girl in answer to his question as to who she was to which he replied that a poor fellow like himself did not look for such luck as that adding that being then on his deathbed he would not have much occasion for the services of a wife the girl said she could cure him but he told her he was very much doubted of that and even continued he should you have any good prescription i have not the means of getting it made up i don't want medicine to cure you rejoined the girl proceeding at once to rub his back and sides with her hand which seemed to him like a ball of fire he soon began to feel much better and asked the young lady what her name was in order as he said that he might remember her in his prayers i am a spirit replied she and you when alive under the han dynasty as chu shu liang were a benefactor of my family your kindness is being engraven on my heart i have at length succeeded in my search for you and am able in some measure to requite you chow was dreadfully ashamed of his poverty-stricken state and afraid that his dirty room would spoil the young lady's dress but she made him show her in accordingly he took her into his apartment where there were neither chairs to sit upon nor signs of anything to eat saying you might indeed be able to put up with all this but you see my larder is empty and i have absolutely no means of supporting a wife don't be alarmed about that cried she and in another moment he saw a couch covered with costly robes and walls papered with a silver flecked paper and chairs and tables appear the latter laden with all kinds of wine and exquisite vines they then began to enjoy themselves and lived together as husband and wife many people coming to witness these strange things and being all cordially received by the young lady who in her turn always accompanied mr chow when he went out to dinner anywhere one day there was an unprincipled young graduate among the company which she seemed immediately to become aware of and after calling him several bad names she struck him on the side of the head causing his hat to fly out of the window while his body remained inside and there he was stuck fast unable to move either way until the others interceded for him and he was released after some time visitors became too numerous and if she refused to see them they turned their anger against her husband at length as they were sitting together drinking with some friends at the chung yang festival a white rabbit ran in whereupon the girl jumped up and said the doctor has come for me then turning to the rabbit she added you go on i'll follow you 
So the rabbit went away, and then she ordered them to get a ladder and place it against a high tree in the back yard, the top of the ladder overtopping the tree. The young lady went up first, and Chao closed behind her, after which she called out to anybody who wished to join them to make haste up. None ventured to do so with the exception of a serving boy belonging to the house, who followed after Chao, and thus they went up, 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 until they disappeared in the clouds and were seen no more. However, when the bystanders came to look at the ladder, they found it was only an old door frame with the panels knocked out. And when they went into Mr. Chow's room, it was the same old, dirty, unfurnished room as before. So they determined to find out all about it from the serving boy when he came back. But this he never did. End of chapter 96「Chapter 97 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. – Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter 97 – Bribery and Corruption At Pao Ting Fu there lived a young man, who, having purchased the lowest degree, was about to proceed to Peking, in the hope of obtaining, by the aid of a little bribery, an appointment as district magistrate. Footnote. By which he would become eligible for government employ. The sale of degrees has been extensively carried on under the present dynasty as a means of replenishing an empty treasury. End of footnote. His boxes were already packed when he was taken suddenly ill, and was confined to his bed for more than a month. One day the servant entered, and announced a visitor, whereupon our sick man jumped up and ran to the door as if there was nothing the matter with him. The visitor was elegantly dressed like a man of some position in society, and after bowing thrice he walked into the house, explaining he was Kung Sun Xia, tutor to the eleventh prince. Footnote. Kung Sun is an example of a Chinese double surname. End of footnote. and that he had heard our Mr. So-and-so wished to arrange for the purchase of a magistracy. If that is really so, added he, would you not do better to buy a prefecture? So-and-so thanked him warmly, but said his funds would not be sufficient. Upon which Mr. Kung Sun declared he should be delighted to assist him with half the purchase money, which he could repay after taking up the post. Footnote. Such is the common system of repaying the loan, by means of which an indigent nominee is enabled to defray the expenses of his journey to the post to which he has been appointed, and other calls upon his purse. These loans are generally provided by some western merchant, which term is an ellipsis for a Shanxi banker, Shanxi being literally west of the mountains. Someone accompanies the newly made official to his post, and holds his commission in pawn until the amount is repaid which settlement is easily effected by the issue of some well-understood proclamation, calling, for instance, upon the people to close all gambling-houses within a given period. Immediately, the owners of these hells forward presents of money to the incoming official. The Shanxi banker gets his principal with interest, perhaps at the rate of two percent per month. The gambling-houses carry on as usual, and everybody is perfectly satisfied. End of footnote. He went on to say that being on intimate terms with the various provincial governors, the thing could be easily managed for about five thousand taels, and also that at that very moment, Chen Ting Fu being vacant, it would be as well to make an early effort to get the appointment. So and so pointed out that this place was in his native province, footnote, which fact would disqualify him from taking the post. End footnote. But Kung Sun only laughed at his objection and reminded him that money could obliterate all distinctions of that kind. Footnote. Literally, square hole, a common name for the Chinese cash. See number 2, note 42. End footnote. This did not seem quite satisfactory. However, Kung Sun told him not to be alarmed, as the post of which he was speaking was below in the infernal regions. The fact is, said he, that your term of life has expired, and that your name is already on the death list. By these means you will take your place in the world below as a man of official position. Farewell! In three days we shall meet again. 
He then went to the door and mounted his horse and rode away. So-and-so now opened his eyes and spoke a few parting words to his wife and children, bidding them take the money from his strong-room. Footnote. In the case of wealthy families, these strong-rooms often contain, in addition to bullion, jewels to a very great amount belonging to the ladies of the house, and as a rule the door may not be opened unless in the presence of a certain number of the male representatives of the house. End footnote. And go buy large quantities of paper ingots. Footnote. Pieces of silver and gold paper made up to represent the ordinary Chinese shoes of bullion. See number 18, note 133 and burnt for the use of the dead, generally known to foreigners in China as joss paper. Which they immediately did, quite exhausting all the shops. This was piled in the courtyard with paper images of men, devils, horses, etc., and burning went on day and night, until the ashes formed quite a hill. In three days Kung Sun returned, bringing with him the money, upon which so-and-so hurried off to the board of civil office. Footnote see number seven note fifty four in this case the reference is to a similar board in the infernal regions End footnote. where he had an interview with the high officials who after asking his name warned him to be a pure and upright officer and then calling him up to the table handed him his letter of appointment so and so bowed and took his leave but recollecting at once that his purchase degree would not carry much weight with it in the eyes of his subordinates footnote these would be sure to sneer at him behind his back. End footnote. He sent off to buy elaborate chairs and a number of horses for his retinue, at the same time dispatching several devil lictors to fetch his favorite wife in a beautifully adorned sedan chair. All arrangements were just completed when some of the Chen Ting staff came to meet the new prefect. Footnote. A compliment usually paid to an incoming official. End of footnote others awaiting him all along the line of the road, about half a mile in length. He was immensely gratified at this reception, when all of a sudden the gongs before him ceased to sound, and the banners were lowered to the ground. He had hardly time to ask what was the matter, before he saw those of his servants who were on horseback jump hastily to the ground, and dwindle down to about a foot in height, while their horses shrunk to the size of foxes or raccoons. One of the attendants near his chariot cried out in alarm, here's quan ti and then he too jumped out in a fright and saw in the distance quan ti himself slowly approaching them followed by four or five retainers on horseback his great beard covered the lower half of his face quite unlike ordinary mortals his aspect was terrible to behold and his eyes reached nearly to his ears who is this roared he to his servants and they immediately informed him that it was the new prefect of chen ting what cried he a petty fellow like that to have a retinue like this footnote the retinue of a mandarin should be in accordance with his rank i have given elsewhere see number sixty six note three hundred fifteen what would be that of an official of the highest rank End of footnote. whereupon so and so's flesh began to creep with fear and in a few moments he found that he too had shrunk to the size of a little boy of six or seven Quan Ti bade his attendants bring the new prefect with them, and went into a building at the roadside, where he took up his seat facing the south, and calling for writing materials, told so-and-so to write down his name and address. When this was handed to him, he flew into a towering passion, and said, The scribbly scrawl of a place-man indeed. Footnote. Good writing holds a much higher place in the estimation of the Chinese than among Western nations. The very nature of their characters raises calligraphy almost to the rank of an art. End footnote. Can such a one be entrusted with the welfare of the people? Look me up the record of his good works. A man then advanced and whispered something in a low tone, upon which Quan Ti exclaimed in a loud voice, The crime of the briber is comparatively trifling. The heavy guilt lies with those who sell official posts for money. So and so was now seized by angels in golden armor, and two of them tore off his cap and robes, and administered to him fifty blows with the bamboo, until hardly any flesh remained on his bones. He was then thrust outside the door, and lo, his carriages and horses had disappeared, and he himself was lying, unable to walk for pain, at no great distance from his own house. However, his body seemed as light as a leaf, and in a day and a night he managed to crawl home. 
When he arrived, he awoke as if it were from a dream, and found himself groaning upon the bed, and to the inquiries of his family he only replied that he felt dreadfully sore. Now he really had been dead for seven days, and when he came round thus, he immediately asked for Ah Lien, which was the name of his favorite wife. But the very day before, while chatting with the other members of the family, Ah Lien had suddenly cried out that her husband was made prefect of Chen Ting, and that his lictors had come to escort her thither. Accordingly she retired to dress herself in her best clothes, and when ready to start she fell back and expired. Hearing this sad story, so-and-so began to mourn and beat his breast, and he would not allow her to be buried at once, in the hope that she might yet come around. But this she never did. Meanwhile, so-and-so got slowly better, and by the end of six months was able to walk again. He would often exclaim, "'The ruin of my career and the punishment I received, all this I could have endured, but the loss of my dear Alien is more than I can bear.'" Footnote the commentator here adds a somewhat similar case, which actually occurred in the reign of Kang Si, of a viceroy modestly attended, falling in with the gorgeous retinue of a magistrate, and being somewhat rudely treated by the servants of the latter. On arriving at his destination, the viceroy sent for that magistrate and sternly bade him retire from office, remarking that no simple magistrate could afford to keep such a retinue of attendants unless by illegal exactions from the suffering people committed to his charge. End of footnote. End of chapter 97. Chapter 98 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Holly Jensen. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935 Chapter 98 A Chinese Jonah A man named Sun P. Chen was crossing the river when a great thunder squall broke upon the vessel and caused her to toss about fearfully to the great terror of all the passengers. Just then, an angel in golden armor appeared standing upon the clouds above them holding in his hand a scroll inscribed with certain characters, also written in gold, which the people on the vessel easily made out to be three in number, namely, Sun P. Chen. So, turning at once to their fellow traveler, they said to him, You have evidently incurred the displeasure of heaven. Get into a boat by yourself and do not involve us in your punishment." and without giving him time to reply whether he would do so or not, they hurried him over the side into a small boat and set him adrift. But when Sun P. Chen looked back, lo, the vessel itself had capsized. Footnote. The full point of this story can hardly be conveyed in translation. The man's surname was Sun, and his prenomen, P. Chen, which in Chinese follows the nomen, might be rendered, must be saved. However, there is another word meaning struck, precisely similar in sound and tone, though written differently, to the above Chen, and as far as the ear alone is concerned, our hero's name might have been either Sun must be saved, or Sun must be struck. That the merchants mistook the character Chen, saved, for Chen, struck, is evident from the catastrophe which overtook their vessel, while Mr. Sun's little boat rode safely through the storm. End of footnote. End of chapter 98. Recording by Holly Jensen. Chapter 99 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by san ling pu translated by herbert allen giles eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five chang pu liang a certain trader who was travelling in the province of chi li being overtaken by a storm of rain and hail took shelter among some standing crops by the wayside there he heard a voice from heaven saying these are chang pu liang's fields do not injure his crops the trader began to wonder who his Chang Pu Liang could be, 
and how, if he was Pu Liang, not virtuous, he came to be under divine protection. So when the storm was over, and he had reached the neighboring village, and told the people there what he had heard, the villagers then informed him that Chang Pu Liang was a very wealthy farmer who was accustomed every spring to make loans of grain to the poor of the district, and who was not too particular about getting back the exact amount he had lent, taking, in fact, whatever they brought him without discussion. Hence the sobriquet of Pu Liang, no measure, as in the man who doesn't measure the repayments of his loans. After that, they all proceeded in a body to the fields, where it was discovered that vast damage had been done to the crops generally, with the exception of Chang Pu Liang's, which had escaped uninjured. End of chapter 99「Chapter 100 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Songling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to Chapter 100. The Dutch Carpet. Formerly, when the Dutch were permitted to trade with China, the officer in command of the coast defenses would not allow them, on account of their great numbers, to come ashore. The Dutch begged very hard for the grant of a piece of land such as a carpet would cover, and the officer above mentioned, thinking that this could not be very large, acceded to their request. A carpet was accordingly laid down, big enough for about two people to stand on, but by dint of stretching, it was soon enough for four or five, and so they went on, stretching and stretching, until at last it covered about an acre, and by and by, with the help of their knives, they had filched a piece of ground several miles in extent. End of chapter 100 Chapter 101 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. Chapter 101 Carrying a Corpse. A Woodsman who had been to the market was returning home with his pole across his shoulder, when suddenly he felt it become very heavy at the end behind him, and looking round he saw attached to it the headless trunk of a man. In great alarm he got his pole quit of the burden and struck about him right and left, whereupon the body disappeared. He then hurried on to the next village, and when he arrived there in the dusk of the evening, he found several men holding lights to the ground as if looking for something. On asking what was the matter, they told him that while sitting together, a man's head had fallen from the sky into their midst, that they had noticed the hair and beard were all draggled, but in a moment the head had vanished. The woodman then related what had happened to himself, and thus one whole man was accustomed for, though no one could tell whence he came. Subsequently, Another man was carrying a basket when someone saw a man's head in it and called out to him, whereupon he dropped the basket in a fright, and the head rolled away and disappeared. End of chapter 101 Chapter 102 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Sung Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935, Chapter 102. A Taoist Devotee Xu Yao Yu was a Qing Chao man, who, when his wife died, left his home and became a priest. Some years afterwards, he returned, dressed in Taoist garb, and carrying his praying mat over his shoulder, and after staying one night, he wanted to go away again. His friends, however, 
would not give him back his cassock and staff. So at length he pretended to take a stroll outside the village, and when there, his clothes and other belongings came flying out of the house after him, and he got safely away. End of chapter 102 Chapter 103 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by San Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles 1845-1935 to 1935. Chapter 103 Justice for Rebels During the reign of Tsun Chi of the people of Teng Yi, seven in ten were opposed to the Manchu dynasty. The officials dared not to touch them, and subsequently, when the country became more settled, the magistrates used to distinguish them from the others by always deciding any cases in their favor, for they feared lest these men should revert to their old opposition. And thus it came about that one litigant would begin by declaring himself to have been a rebel whose adversary would follow up by shewing such statement to be false, so that before any case could be heard on its actual merits, it was necessary to determine the status both of plaintiff and defendant, whereby infinite labor was entailed upon the registrars. Now it changed that the yamen of one of the officials was haunted by a fox, and the official's daughter was bewitched by it. Her father, therefore, engaged the services of a magician, who succeeded in capturing the animal and putting it into a bottle, but just as he was going to commit it to the flames, the fox cried out from inside the bottle, I am a rebel, at which the bystanders were unable to suppress their laughter. End of chapter 103 Chapter 104 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845-1935. to Theft of the Peach. When I was a little boy, I went one day to the prefectural city. It was the time of the spring festival, and the custom was that on the day before, all the merchants of the place should proceed, with banners and drums, to the judge's yamen. This was called bringing in the spring. I went with a friend to see the fun. The crowd was immense, and there sat the officials, in crimson robes arranged right and left in the hall. But I was small and didn't know who they were, my attention being attracted chiefly by the hum of voices and the noise of the drums. In the middle of it all, a man leading a boy with his hair unplated and hanging down his back walked up to the dais. He carried a pole on his shoulder, and appeared to be saying something which I couldn't hear from the noise. I only saw the official smile. And immediately afterwards, an attendant came down, and in a loud voice ordered the man to give a performance. What shall it be? asked the man in reply. Open after some consultation between the officials on the dais, the attendant inquired what he could do best. The man said he could invert the order of nature, and then, after another pause, he was instructed to produce some peaches. To this he ascended, and taking off his coat, laid it on his box, at the same time observing that they had set him a hard task, the winter frost not having broken up, and adding that he was afraid the gentleman would be angry with him, etc., the son here reminded him that he had agreed to the task, and couldn't well get out of it. So after fretting and grumbling a while, he cried out, I have it! With snow on the ground, we shall never get peaches here. But I guess there are some up in heaven in the royal mother's garden, and there we must try. How are we to get up, father? Asked the boy, whereupon the man said, I have the means, and immediately proceeded to take from his box a cord some tens of feet in length. This he carefully arranged, and then threw one end of it high up in the air, where it remained, as if caught by something. He now paid out the rope, which kept going up higher and higher until the end he had thrown up disappeared in the clouds, and only a short piece was left on his hand. Calling his son, he then explained that he himself was too heavy, 
and, handing him the end of the rope, bid him go up at once. The boy, however, made some difficulty, objecting that the rope was too thin to bear his weight up to such height, and that he would surely fall down and be killed, upon which his father said that his promise had been given, and that repentance was now too late, adding that if the peaches were obtained, they would surely be rewarded with a hundred ounces of silver, which should be set aside to get the boy a pretty wife. So his son seized the robe and swarmed up, like a spider running up a thread of its web, and in a few moments he was out of sight in the clouds. By and by down fell a peach as large as a basin, which the delighted father handed up to his patrons on the dais, who were some time coming to a conclusion whether it was real or imitation. But just then down came the rope with a run, and the frightened father shrieked out, Alas, alas, someone has cut the rope, what will my boy do now? And in another minute down fell something else, which was found on examination to be his son's head. Oh me, said he, weeping bitterly and shewing his head. The gardener has caught him, my boy is no more. After that, his arms and legs and body all came down in like manner, and the father, gathering them up, put them in the box and said, This was my only son, who accompanied me everywhere. And now what a cruel fate is his. I must away and bury him. He then approached the dais and said, Your peach, gentlemen, was obtained at the costs of my boy's life. Help me now to pay his funeral expenses, and I will be ever grateful to you. The officials who had been watching the scene in horror and amazement forthwith collected a good purse for him, and when he had received the money, he rapped on his box and said, Papa, why don't you come out and thank the gentleman? Thereupon there was a thump on the box from inside, and up came the boy himself, who jumped out and bowed to the assembled company. I have never forgotten this strange trick. I subsequently heard could be done by the White Lily sect, who probably got it from this source. End Chapter 104「Chapter 105 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to Killing a Serpent At Kuchi Island, in the Eastern Sea, there were camellias of all colors, which bloomed throughout the year. No one, however, lived there, and very few people ever visited the spot. One day, a young man of Tang Chao, named Chang, who was fond of hunting and adventure, hearing of the beauties of the place, put together some wine and food, and rowed himself across in a small open boat. The flowers were just then even finer than usual and their perfume was diffused for a mile or so around. While many of the trees he saw were several armfuls in circumference, so he roamed about and gave himself up to enjoyment of the scene, and by and by he opened a flask of wine, regretting very much that he had no companion to share it with him, when all of a sudden a most beautiful young girl, with extremely bright eyes and dressed in red, stepped down from one of the camellias before him. "'Dear me,' said she on seeing Mr. Chang, "'I expected to be alone here, and was not aware that the place was already occupied.' Chang was somewhat alarmed at this apparition, and asked the young lady when she came, to which she replied that her name was Chao Chang, and that she had accompanied thither a Mr. Hai, who had gone off for a stroll and had left her to await for his return." Thereupon Chang begged her to join him in a cup of wine, which she very willingly did, and they were just beginning to enjoy themselves, when a sound of rushing wind was heard in the trees and plants bent beneath it. "'Here's Mr. Hai!' cried the young lady, and jumping quickly up, disappeared in a moment. The horrified Chang now beheld a huge serpent coming out of the bushes nearby, and immediately ran behind a large tree for shelter hoping the reptile would not see him. But the serpent advanced, and enveloped both Chang and the tree in its great folds, binding Chang's arms down to his sides, so as to prevent him from moving them, 
and then raising its head, darted out its tongue and bit the poor man's nose, causing the blood to flow freely out. This blood it was quietly sucking up, when Chang, who thought that his last hour had come, remembered that he had in his pocket some fox poison, and managing to insert a couple of fingers, he drew out the packet, broke the paper, and let the powder lie in the palm of his hand. He next leaned his hand over to the serpent's coils in such a way that the blood from his nose dripped into his hand, and when it was nearly full the serpent actually did begin to drink it. And in a few moments the grit was relaxed. The serpent struck the ground heavily with its tail, and dashed away up against another tree, which was broken in half, and then stretched itself out, and died. Chang was a long time unable to rise, but at length he got up and carried the serpent off with him. He was very ill for more than a month afterwards, and even suspected the young lady of being a serpent too, in the skies. End of chapter 105「Chapter 106 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter 106 The Resuscitated Corpse. A certain old man lived at Tsai Tien, in the Yangtzein district. The village was some miles from the district city, and he and his son kept a roadside inn where travellers could pass the night. One day, as it was getting dusk, four strangers presented themselves and asked for a night's lodging, to which the landlord replied that every bed was already occupied. The four men declared it was impossible for them to go back, and urged him to take them in somehow, and at length the landlord said he could give them a place to sleep in if they were not too particular which the strangers immediately assured him they were not. The fact was that the old man's daughter-in-law had just died, and that her body was lying in the women's quarters waiting for the coffin, which his son had gone away to buy. So the landlord led them round thither, and walking in, placed a lamp on the table. At the further end of the room lay the corpse, decked out with paper, robes, etc., in the usual way, and in the foremost section were sleeping couches for four people. The travellers were tired, and throwing themselves on the beds were soon snoring loudly, with the exception of one of them, who was not quite off, when suddenly he heard a creaking of the trestles on which the dead body was laid out, and opening his eyes he saw by the light of the lamp in front of the corpse that the girl was raising the coverings from her and preparing to get down. In another moment she was on the floor and advancing towards the sleepers. Her face was of a light yellow hue, and she had a silk kerchief round her head, and when she reached the beds, she blew on the other three travellers, whereupon the fourth, in a great fright, stealthily drew up the bedclothes over his face and held his breath to listen. He heard her breathe on him as she had done on the others, and then heard her go back again and get under the paper robes, which rustled distinctly as she did so. He now put out his head to take a peep, and saw that she was lying down as before. Whereupon, not daring to make any noise, he stretched forth his foot and kicked his companions, who, however, showed no signs of moving. He now determined to put on his clothes and make a bolt for it, but he had hardly begun to do so before he heard the creaking sound again, which sent him back under the bedclothes as fast as he could go. Again the girl came to him, and breathing several times on him, went away to lie down as before, as he could tell by the noise of the trestles. He then put his hand very gently out of bed, and seizing his trousers got quickly into them, jumped up with a bound, and rushed out of the place as fast as his legs would carry him. The corpse too jumped up, but by this time the traveller had already drawn the bolt, and was outside the door, running along and shrieking at the top of his voice, with the corpse following close behind. No one seemed to hear him, and he was afraid to knock at the door of the inn, for fear they should not let him in in time, so he made for the highway to the city and after a while he saw a monastery by the roadside, and hearing the wooden fish, he ran up and thumped with all his might at the gate. Footnote. This instrument, used by Buddhist priests in the musical accompaniment to their liturgies, is said to be so called 
because a fish never closes its eyes, and is therefore a fit model of vigilance to him who would walk in the paths of holiness and virtue. End footnote. The priest, however, did not know what to make of it, and would not open to him, and as the corpse was only a few yards off, he could do nothing but run behind a tree which stood close by, and there shelter himself, dodging to the right as the corpse dodged to the left, and so on. This infuriated the dead girl to madness, and at length, as tired and panting, they stood watching each other on opposite sides of the tree. The corpse made a rush forward with one arm on each side, in the hope of thus grabbing its victim. The traveller, however, fell backwards and escaped, while the corpse remained rigidly embracing the tree. By and by the priest, who had been listening from the inside, hearing no sounds for some time, came out and found the traveller lying senseless on the ground whereupon he had him carried into the monastery, and by morning they had got him round again. After giving him a little broth to drink, he related the whole story, and then in the early dawn they went out to examine the tree, where they found the girl fixed tightly to the tree. The news being sent to the magistrate, that functionary attended at once in person. Footnote. The duties of coroner belong to the office of a district magistrate in China. End footnote. And gave orders to remove the body. But this they were at first unable to do, the girl's fingers having penetrated into the bark so far that her nails were not to be seen. At length they got her away, and then a messenger was dispatched to the inn, already in a state of great commotion over the three travellers, who had been found dead in their beds. The old man accordingly sent to fetch his daughter-in-law, and the surviving traveller petitioned the magistrate, saying, Four of us left home, but only one will go back. Give me something that I may show to my fellow-townsmen. So the magistrate gave him a certificate, and sent him home again. Footnote. Without such certificate, he would be liable to be involved in trouble and annoyance at the will of any unfriendly neighbor. End of footnote. End of chapter 106. Chapter 107 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. The Fisherman and His Friend In the northern parts of Zhuzhou there lived a man named Shi, a fisherman by trade. Every night when he went to fish, he would carry some wine with him, and drink and fish by turns, always taking care to pour out a libation on the ground, accompanied by the following invocation. Drink too, ye drowned spirits of the river. Such was his regular custom, and it was also noticeable that, even on occasions when the other fishermen caught nothing, he always got a full basket. One night, as he was sitting drinking by himself, a young man suddenly appeared and began walking up and down near him. She offered him a cup of wine, which he was readily accepted, and they remained chatting together throughout the night, she meanwhile not catching a single fish. However, just as he was giving up all hope of doing anything, the young man rose and said he would go a little way down the stream and beat them up towards she, which he accordingly did, returning in a few minutes and warning him to be on the lookout. She now heard a noise like that of a shoal coming up the stream, and casting his net made a splendid haul, all that he caught being over a foot in length. Greatly delighted, he now prepared to go home, first offering his companion a share of the fish, which the latter declined, saying that he had often received kindness from Mr. Xu, and that he would be only too happy to help him regularly in the same manner, if Mr. Xu would accept his assistance. The latter replied that he did not recollect ever meeting him before, and that he should be much obliged for any aid the young man might choose to afford him, regretting, at the same time, his inability to make him any adequate return. He then asked the young man his name and surname, and the young man said his surname was Wang, adding that she might address him when they met as Wang Liu Lang, he having no other name. Thereupon they parted, and the next day she sold his fish and bought some more wine with which he repaired as usual to the river bank. There he found his companion already awaiting him, and they spent the night together in precisely the same way as the preceding one, the young man beating up the fish for him as before. This went on for some months, until at length 
One evening, the young man, with many expressions of his thanks and his regrets, told she that they were about to part forever. Much alarmed by the melancholy tone in which his friend had communicated this news, she was on point of asking for an explanation, when the young man stopped him, and himself proceeded as follows. The friendship that has grown up between us is truly surprising, and now that we shall meet no more, there is no harm in telling you the whole truth. I am a disembodied spirit, the soul of one who was drowned in this river when tipsy. I have been here many years, and your former success in fishing was due to the fact that I used secretly to beat up the fish towards you, in return for the libations you were accustomed to pour out. Tomorrow my time is up, my substitute will arrive, and I shall be born again in the world of mortals. We have but this one evening left, and I therefore take advantage of it to express my feelings to you. On hearing these words, she was at first very much alarmed. However, he had grown so accustomed to his friend's society that his fears soon passed away, and, filling up a goblet, he said, with a sigh, Liu Lang, old fellow, drink this up, and away with melancholy. It's hard to lose you, but I'm glad enough for your sake, and won't think of my own sorrow. He then inquired Liu Lang who was to be his substitute, to which the latter replied, Come to the river bank tomorrow afternoon, and you will see a woman drowned. She is the one. Just then the village cocks began to crow, and with tears in their eyes, the two friends bade each other farewell. Next day, she went to the river bank to see if anything would happen, and lo, a woman carrying a child in her arms came along. When close to the edge of the river, she stumbled and fell into the water, managing, however, to throw the child safely onto the bank, where it lay kicking and sprawling and crying at the top of its voice. The woman herself sank and rose several times, until at last she succeeded in clutching hold of the bank and pulled herself, dripping, out. And then, after resting a while, she picked up the child and went on her way. All this time, she had been in a great state of excitement, and was on the point of running to help the woman out of the water, but he remembered that she was to be the substitute of his friend, and accordingly restrained himself from doing so. Then when he saw the woman get out by herself, he began to suspect that Liu Lang's words had not been fulfilled. That night he went to fish as usual, and before long the young man arrived and said, We meet once again. There is no need now to speak of separation. She asked him how it was so, to which he replied, The woman you saw had already taken my place, but I could not bear to hear the child cry, and I saw that my one life would be purchased at the expense of their two lives, whereupon I let her go, and now I cannot say when I shall have another chance. The union of our destinies may not yet be worked out. Alas, sighed she, this noble conduct of yours is enough to move God Almighty. After this, the two friends went on much as they had done before, until one day Liu Lang again said he had come to bid Shi farewell. Shi thought he had found another substitute, but Liu Lang told him that his former behavior had so pleased Almighty Heaven that he had been appointed guardian angel of Wu Zhen in Zhao Yun district, and that on the following morning he would start for his new post. And if you do not forget the days of our friendship, added he, I pray you come and see me in spite of the long journey. Truly, replied she, you well deserve to be made a god, but the paths of gods and men lie in different directions, and even if the distance were nothing, how should I manage to meet you again? Don't be afraid on that score, said Liu Lang, but come. And then he went away, and she returned home. The latter immediately began to prepare for the journey, which caused his wife to laugh at him and say, Supposing you do find such a place at the end of that long journey, you won't be able to hold a conversation with a clay image. She, however, paid no attention to her remarks and traveled straight to Zhao Yun, where he learned from the inhabitants that there really was a village called Wu Zhen, whither he forthwith proceeded and took up his abode at an inn. He then inquired of the landlord where the village temple was, to which the latter replied by asking him somewhat hurriedly if he was speaking to Mr. Shi. She informed him that his name was Xi, asking in reply how he came to know it, whereupon the landlord further inquired if his native place was not Zhuzhou. She told him it was, and again asked him how he knew all this. 
to which the landlord made no answer but rushed out of the room and in a few moments the place was crowded with old and young men women and children all come to visit she they had told him that a few nights before they had seen their guardian deity in a vision and he had informed them that mr she would shortly arrive and had bidden them to provide him with travelling expenses etc she was very much astonished at this and went off at once to the shrine where he invoked his friend as follows ever since we parted i have had you daily and nightly in my thoughts and now that i have fulfilled my promise of coming to see you i have to thank you for the orders you have issued to the people of the place as for me i have nothing to offer you but a cup of wine which i pray you accept as though we were drinking together under river bank he then burnt a quantity of paper money when lo a wind suddenly arose which after whirling round and round behind the shrine soon dropped and all was still that night she dreamed that his friend came to him dressed in his official cap and robes and very different in appearance from what he used to be and thanked him saying it is truly kind of you to visit me thus i only regret that my position makes me unable to meet you face to face and that though near we are still so far the people here will give you a trifle which pray accept for my sake and when you go away i will see you a short way on your journey a few days afterwards she prepared to start in spite of the numerous invitations to stay which poured in upon him from all sides and then the inhabitants loaded him with presents of all kinds and escorted him out of the village there a whirlwind arose and accompanied him several miles when he turned round and invoked his friend thus liu lang take care of your valued person do not trouble yourself to come any farther your noble heart will ensure happiness to this district and there is no occasion for me to give a word of advice to my old friend by and by the whirlwind ceased and the villagers who were much astonished returned to their own homes she too travelled homewards and being now a man of some means ceased to work any more as a fisherman and whenever he met a chow yun man he would ask him about that guardian angel being always informed in reply that he was a most beneficent god some say the place was shi kung chuang in changqin i can't say which it was myself end of chapter 107、chapter、of strange stories from a chinese studio volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain strange stories from a chinese studio volume two by san ling pu translated by herbert allen giles eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five the priest's warning a man named chang died suddenly and was escorted at once by devil lictors into the presence of the king of purgatory his majesty turned to chang's record of good and evil and then in great anger told the lictors they had brought the wrong man and bade them take him back again as they left the judgment hall chang persuaded his escort to let him have a look at purgatory and accordingly the devils conducted him through the nine sections pointing out to him the knife hill the sword tree and other objects of interest by and by they reached a place where there was a buddhist priest hanging suspended in the air head downwards by a rope through a hole in his leg he was shrieking with pain and longing for death and when chang approached lo he saw that it was his own brother in great distress he asked his guides the reason of this punishment and they informed him that the priest was suffering thus for collecting subscriptions on behalf of his order and then privately squandering the proceeds in gambling and debauchery nor added they will he escape this torment unless he repents him of his misdeeds when chang came round he thought his brother was already dead and hurried off to the hsingfu monastery to which the latter belonged as he went in at the door he heard a loud shrieking and on proceeding to his brother's room he found him laid up with a very bad abscess in his leg the leg itself being tied up above him to the wall this being as his brother informed him the only bearable position in which he could lie 
Chang now told him what he had seen in purgatory, at which the priest was so terrified that he at once gave up taking wine and meat, and devoted himself entirely to religious exercises. In a fortnight he was well, and was known ever afterwards as a most exemplary priest. End of chapter 108《Chapter 109 of Strange Stories from the Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis.《Strange Stories from the Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Metempsychosis. Mr. Lim, who took his master's degree in the same year as the late Mr. Wen Pi, could remember what had happened to him in his previous state of existence, and once told the whole story as follows. I was originally of a good family, but after leading a very dissolute life, I died at the age of sixty-two. On being conducted into the presence of the king of purgatory, he received me civilly, bade me be seated, and offered me a cup of tea. I noticed, however, that the tea in his majesty's cup was clear and limpid, while that in my own was muddy like the lees of wine. It then flashed across me that this was the potion which was given to all disembodied spirits to render them oblivious of the past, and according, when the king was looking the other way, I seized the opportunity of pouring it under the table, pretending afterwards that I had drunk it all up. My record of good and evil was now presented for inspection, and when the king saw what it was, he flew into a great passion and ordered the attendant devils to drag me away and to send me back to earth as a horse. I was immediately seized and bound, and the devils carried me off to a house, the door sill of which was so high I could not step over it. While I was trying to do so, the devils behind lashed me with all their might, causing me such pain that I made a great spring, and, lo and behold, I was a horse in a stable. The mare has got a nice colt, I then heard a man call out. But although I was perfectly aware of all that was passing, I could say nothing myself. Hunger now came upon me, and I was glad to be suckled by the mare. And by the end of four or five years I had grown into a fine strong horse, dreadfully afraid of the whip, and running away at the very sight of it. When my master rode me it was always with a saddle-cloth, rid at a leisurely pace which was bearable enough. But when the servants mounted me bare-backed, and dug their heels into me, the pain struck into my vitals, and at length I refused all food, and in three days I died. Reappearing before the king of purgatory, his majesty was enraged to find that I had thus tried to shirk working out my time, and flaying me forthwith, condemned me to go back again as a dog. And when I did not move, the devils came behind me and lashed me until I ran away from them into the open country where, thinking I had better die right off, I jumped over a cliff and lay at the bottom unable to move. I then saw that I was among a litter of puppies, and that an old bitch was licking and suckling me by turns, whereby I knew that I was once more among mortals. In this hateful form I continued for some time, longing to kill myself, and yet fearing to incur the penalty of shirking. At length I purposely bit my master in the leg, and tore him badly, whereupon he had me destroyed. And I was taken again into the presence of the king, who was so displeased with my vicious behavior that he condemned me to become a snake, and shut me up in a dark room where I could see nothing. After a while I managed to climb up the wall, bore a hole in the roof, and escape, and immediately I found myself lying in the grass, a veritable snake. Then I registered a vow that I would harm no living thing, and I lived for some years, feeding upon berries and such like, ever remembering neither to take my own life, nor by injuring any one to incite them to take it, but longing all the while for the happy release which did not come to me. One day, as I was sleeping in the grass, I heard the noise of a passing cart, and, on trying to get across the road out of its way, I was caught by the wheel, and cut in two. The king was astonished to see me back so soon, but I humbly told my story, and in pity for the innocent creature that loses its life, he pardoned me, and permitted me to be born again at my appointed time, as a human being. 
Such was Mr. Lean's story. He could speak as soon as he came into the world, and could repeat anything he had once read. In the year 1621 he took his master's degree, and was never tired of telling people to put saddle-cloths on their horses, and recollect that the pain of being gripped by the knees is even worse than the lash itself. End of chapter 109《Chapter 110 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to The Forty Strings of Cash Mr. Justice Wang had a steward who was possessed of considerable means. One night, the latter dreamt that a man rushed in and said to him, Today you must repay me those forty strings of cash. The steward asked who he was, to which the man made no answer, but hurried past him into the woman's apartments. When the steward awoke, he found that his wife had been delivered of a son, and knowing at once that retribution was at hand, he set aside forty strings of cash to be spent solely in food, clothes, medicines, and so on, for the baby. By the time the child was between three and four years old, the steward found that of the forty strings, only about seven hundred cash remained. And when the wet nurse, who happened to be standing by, brought the child and dandled it in her arms before him, he looked at it and said, The forty strings are all but repaid. It is time you were off again. Thereupon the child changed color, its head fell back, and its eyes stared fixedly, and, when he tried to revive it, lo, respiration had already ceased. The father then took the balance of the forty strings, and with it defrayed the child's funeral expenses. Truly a warning to people to be sure and pay their debts. Formerly, an old childless man consulted a great many Buddhist priests on the subject. One of them said to him, If you owe no one anything, and no one owes you anything. How can you expect to have children? A good son is a repayment of a former debt. A bad son is a dunning creditor, at whose birth there is no rejoicing, at whose death no lamentations. End of chapter 110 Chapter 111 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845-1935. to Saving Life. A certain gentleman of Shen Yu, who had taken the highest degree, could remember himself in a previous state of existence. He said that he had formerly been a scholar, and had died in middle life, and that when he appeared before the judge of purgatory, there stood the cauldrons, the boiling oil, and the other apparatus of torture, exactly as we read about them on earth. In the eastern corner of the hall were a number of frames, from which hung skins of sheep, dogs, oxen, horses, etc., and when anybody was condemned to reappear in life under any of these forms, his skin was stripped off, and a skin was taken from the proper frame and fixed onto his body. The gentleman of whom I'm writing heard himself sentenced to become a sheep, and the attendant devils had already clothed him in a sheepskin, in the manner above described, when the clerk of the record informed the judge that the criminal before him had once saved another man's life. The judge consulted his books, and forthwith cried out, I pardon him, for although his sins have been many, this one act has redeemed them all. The devils then tried to take off the sheepskin, but it was so tightly stuck on him that they couldn't move it. However, after great efforts, they managed to tear it off, and causing the gentleman most excruciating agony, they managed to tear it off bit by bit, though not quite so cleanly as one might have wished. In fact, a piece as big as the palm of a man's hand was left near his shoulder, 
and when he was born again into the world, there was a great patch of hair on his back, which grew again as fast as it was cut off. End of chapter 111 Chapter 112 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. The Salt Smuggler, Wang Shi of Kao Wan. A petty salt huckster was inordinately fond of gambling. One night he was arrested by two men, whom he took for lictors of the salt gable, and flinging down what salt he had with him, he tried to make his escape. He found, however, that his legs would not move with him, and he was forthwith seized and bound. We are not sent by the salt commissioner, cried his captors, in reply to an entreaty to set him free. We are the devil constables of purgatory. Wang was horribly frightened at this, and begged the devils to bid him farewell to his wife and children. But this they refused to do, saying, You aren't going to die. You are only wanted for a little job there is down below. Wang asked what the job was, to which the devils replied, A new judge has come into office, and... Finding the river and the eighteen hells choked up with the bodies of sinners, he has determined to employ three classes of mortals to clean them out. These are thieves, unlicensed founders, and unlicensed dealers in salt, and for the dirtiest work of all, he's going to take musicians. Wang accompanied the devils until at length they reached a city, where he was brought before the judge, who was sitting in his judgment hall. On turning up his record in the books, one of the devils explained that the prisoner had been arrested for unlicensed trading, whereupon the judge became very angry, and said, Those who drive an illicit trade in salt not only defraud the state of its proper revenue, but also prey upon the livelihood of the people. Those, however, whom the greedy officials and corrupt traders of today denounce as unlicensed traders, are among the most virtuous of mankind, needy unfortunates, who struggle to save a few cash in the purchase of their pint of salt. Are they your unlicensed traders? The judge then bade the lictors buy four pecks of salt, and send it to Wang's house for him, together with that which had been found upon him. And at the same time, he gave Wang an iron scourge, and told him to superintend the works at the river. So Wang followed the devils, and found a river swarming with people, like ants in an anthill. The water was turbid and red, the stench from it being almost unbearable, while those who were employed in cleaning it out were working there naked. Sometimes they would sink down in the horrid mass of decaying bodies, sometimes they would get lazy, and then the iron scourge was applied to their backs. The assistant superintendents had small scented bowls which they held in their mouths. Wang himself approached the bank and saw the licensed salt merchant of Kao Wan in the midst of it all and trashed him well with his score until he was afraid he would never come up again. This went on for three days and three nights, by which time half the workmen were dead and the work completed, whereupon the same two devils escorted him home again, and then he waked up. As a matter of fact, Wang had gone out to sell some salt, and had not come back. Next morning, when his wife opened the house door, she found two bags of salt in the courtyard, and, as her husband did not return, she sent off some people to search for him, and they discovered him lying senseless by the wayside. He was immediately conveyed home, where, after a little time, he recovered consciousness, and related what had taken place. Strange to say, the licensed salt merchant had fallen down in a fit on the previous evening, and had only just recovered. And Wang, hearing that his body was covered with sores, the result of the beating with the iron scourge, went off to his house to see him. However, 
Directly the wretched man set eyes on Wang, he hastily covered himself up with the bedclothes, forgetting that they were no longer at the infernal river. He did not recover from his injuries for a year, after which he retired from trade. End of chapter 112「Chapter 113 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Collecting Subscriptions the frog god frequently employs a magician to deliver its oracles to those who have faith. Should the magician declare that the god is pleased, happiness is sure to follow. But if he says the god is angry, women and children sit sorrowfully about and neglect even their meals. Such is the customary belief, and it is probably not altogether devoid of foundation. There was a certain wealthy merchant named Chu, who was a very stingy man. Once, when some repairs were necessary to the temple of the god of war, and rich and poor were subscribing as much as each could afford, he alone gave nothing. By and by, the works were stopped for want of funds, and the committee of management were at a loss what to do next. It happened that just then there was a festival in honor of the frog god, at which the magician suddenly cried out, General Chu has given orders for a further subscription. Bring forth the books. The people all shouting assent to this. The magician went on to say, Those who have already subscribed will not be compelled to do so again. Those who have not subscribed must give according to their means. Thereupon various persons began to put down their names, and when this was finished, the magician examined the books. He then asked if Mr. Chu was present, and the latter, who was skulking behind, in dread lest he should be detected by the god, had no alternative but to come to the front. Put yourself down for one hundred tiles, said the magician to him, and when Chu hesitated, he cried out to him in anger. You could give two hundred for your own bad purposes, how much more should you do so in a good cause? Alluding to a scandalous intrigue of Chu's, the consequences of which he had averted by payment of the sum mentioned, this put our friend to the blush, and he was obliged to enter his name for one hundred tales, at which his wife was very angry, and said the magician was a rogue, and whenever he came to collect the money, he was put off with some excuse. Shortly afterwards, Chu was one day going to sleep, when he heard a noise outside his house, like the blowing of an ox, and beheld a huge frog walking leisurely through the front door, which was just big enough to let it pass. Once inside, the creature laid itself down to sleep, with its head on the threshold, to the great horror of all the inmates, upon which Chu observed that it had probably come to collect his subscription, and burning some incense, he vowed that he would pay down thirty tails on the spot and send the balance later on. The frog, however, did not move, so Chu promised fifty, and then there was a slight decrease in the frog's size. Another twenty brought it down to the size of a peck measure, and when Chu said the full amount should be paid on the spot, the frog became suddenly no larger than one's fist, and disappeared through a hole in the wall. Chu immediately sent off fifty tails, at which all the other subscribers were much astonished, not knowing what had taken place. A few days afterwards, the magician said Chu still owed fifty tails, and that he had better send it in soon. So Chu forwarded ten more, hoping now to have done with the matter. However, as he and his wife were one day sitting down to dinner, the frog reappeared, and glaring with anger, took up a position on the bed, which creaked under it, as though unable to bear the weight. Putting its head on the pillow, the frog went off to sleep, its body gradually swelling up until it was as big as a buffalo and nearly filled the room, causing Chu to send off the balance of his subscription without a moment's delay. 
There was now no diminution in the size of the frog's body, and by and by crowds of small frogs came hopping in, boring through the walls, jumping on the bed, catching flies on the cooking stove, and dying in the saucepans, until the place was quite unbearable. Three days passed thus, and then Chu sought out the magician, and asked him what was to be done. The latter said he could manage it, and began by vowing on behalf of Chu twenty more tails subscription. At this the frog raised its head, and a further increase caused it to move one foot, and by the time a hundred tails was reached, the frog was walking out of the door. At the door, however, it stopped and lay down once more, which the magician explained by saying that immediate payment was required. So Chu handed over the amount at once, and the frog, shrinking down to its usual size, mingled with its companions and departed with them. The repairs to the temple were accordingly completed, but for lighting the eyes and the attendant festivities, some further subscriptions were wanted. Suddenly the magician, pointing at the managers, cried out, There is money short of fifteen men. Two of you are defaulters. At this, all declared they had given what they could afford, but the magician went on to say, It is not a question of what you can afford. You have misappropriated the funds that should not have been touched, and misfortune would come upon you, but that, in return for your exertions, I shall endeavor to avert it from you. The magician himself is not without taint. Let him set you a good example. Thereupon the magician rushed into his house, and brought out all the money he had, saying, I stole eight tails myself, which I will now refund. He then weighed what silver he had, and finding that it only amounted to a little over six tails, he made one of the bystanders take a note of the difference. Then the others came forward and paid up each what he had misappropriated from the public fund. All this time the magician had been in a divine ecstasy, not knowing what he was saying, and when he came round and was told what had happened, his shame knew no bounds. So he pawned some of his clothes and paid in the balance of his own debt. As to the two defaulters who did not pay, one of them was ill for a month and more, while the other had a bad attack of boils. End of chapter 113。Chapter 114 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Eva Davis. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. Taoist Miracles. At Chinan Fu there lived a certain priest. I cannot say whence he came or what was his name. Winter and summer alike he wore but one unlined robe and a yellow girdle about his waist, with neither shirt nor trousers. He combed his hair with a broken comb, holding the ends in his mouth like the strings of a hat. By day he wandered about the market place. At night he slept in the street, and to a distance of several feet round where he lay, the ice and snow would melt. When he first arrived at Chinan, he used to perform miracles, and the people vied with each other in making him presents. One day, a disreputable young fellow gave him a quantity of wine, and begged him in return to divulge the secret of his power. And when the priest refused, the young man watched him get into the river to bathe, and then ran off with his clothes. The priest called out to him to bring them back, promising that he would do as the young man required. But the latter, distrusting the priest's good faith, refused to do so. Whereupon the priest's girdle was forthwith changed into a snake, several spans in circumference, which coiled itself round its master's head and glared and hissed terribly. The young man now fell on his knees and humbly prayed to the priest to save his life. At which the priest put his girdle on again, and a snake that had appeared to be his girdle wriggled away and disappeared. The priest's fame was thus firmly established, and the gentry and officials of the place were constantly inviting him to join them in their festive parties. By and by, the priest said he was going to invite his entertainers to a return feast, and at the appointed time, each one of them found on his table a formal invitation to a banquet at the water pavilion. 
but no one knew who had brought the letters. However, they all went, and were met at the door by the priest, in his usual garb. And when they got inside, the place was all desolate and bare, with no banquet ready. "'I'm afraid I shall be obliged to ask you, gentlemen, to let me use your attendance,' said the priest to his guests. "'I am a poor man and keep no servants myself.' To this all readily consented, whereupon the priest drew a double door upon the wall, and rapped upon it with his knuckles. Somebody answered from within, and immediately the door was thrown open, and a splendid array of handsome chairs, and tables loaded with exquisite viands and costly wines, burst upon the gaze of the astonished guests. The priest bade the attendants receive all these things from the door, and bring them outside, cautioning them on no account to speak with the people inside and thus a most luxurious entertainment was provided to the great amazement of all present. Now this pavilion stood upon the bank of a small lake, and every year at the proper season it was literally covered with lilies. But at the time of this feast the weather was cold, and the surface of the lake was of a smoky green color. It's a pity, said one of the guests, that the lilies are not out, a sentiment in which the others very cordially agreed when suddenly a servant came running in to say that, at that moment, the lake was a perfect mass of lilies. Everyone jumped up directly, and ran to look out of the window. And lo, it was so, and in another minute the fragrant perfume of the flowers was borne towards them by the breeze. Hardly knowing what to make of this strange sight, they sent off some servants in a boat to gather a few of the lilies, but they soon returned empty-handed, saying that the flowers seemed to shift their position as fast as they rode towards them, at which the priest laughed and said, These are but the lilies of your imagination, and have no real existence. And later on, when the wine was finished, the flowers began to droop and fade, and by and by a breeze from the north carried off every sign of them, leaving the lake as it had been before. A certain Tao Dai at Chinan was much taken with this priest, and gave him rooms at his yamen. One day he had some friends to dinner, and set before them some very choice old wine that he had, and of which he only brought out a small quantity at a time, not wishing to get through it too rapidly. The guests, however, liked it so much that they asked for more, upon which the Tao Dai said he was very sorry, but it was all finished. The priest smiled at this, and said, I can give the gentlemen some, if they will oblige me by accepting it, and immediately inserted the wine kettle into his sleeve, bringing it out again directly, and pouring out for the guests. This wine tasted exactly like the choice wine they had just been drinking, and the priest gave them all as much of it as they wanted, which made the Tao Dai suspect that something was wrong. So, after the dinner, he went into his cellar to look at his own stock. When he found the jars closely tied down, with unbroken seals, but one and all empty. In a great rage, he caused the priest to be arrested for sorcery, and proceeded to have him bambooed. But no sooner had the bamboo touched the priest, than the Tautai himself felt a sting of pain, which increased at every blow, and in a few moments, there was the priest writhing and shrieking under every cut, while the Tautai was sitting in a pool of blood. Accordingly, the punishment was soon stopped, and the priest was commanded to leave Chinan, which he did, and I know not whither he went. He was subsequently seen at Nanking, dressed precisely as of old, but on being spoken to, he only smiled and made no reply. End of chapter 114 Chapter 115 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter 115. Arrival of Buddhist Priests. Two Buddhist priests, having arrived from the West. Footnote. That is, missionaries from India. End footnote. One went to the Wutai hill, while the other hung up his staff at Taishan. Their clothes, complexions, languages, and features were very different from those of our country. 
They further said they had crossed the fiery mountains, from the peaks of which smoke was always issuing, as from the chimney of a furnace, that they could only travel after rain, and that excessive caution was necessary to avoid displacing any stone and thus giving a vent to the flames. They also stated that they had passed through the river of sand, in the middle of which was a crystal hill with perpendicular sides and perfectly transparent, and that there was a defile just broad enough to admit a single cart, its entrance guarded by two dragons with crossed horns. Those who wished to pass prostrated themselves before these dragons, and on receiving permission to enter, the horns opened and let them through. The dragons were of a white color, and their scales and bristles seemed to be of crystal. Eighteen winters and summers these priests had been on the road, and of twelve who started from the west together, only two reached China. Footnote. Much of the above recalls Fa Xien's narrative of his celebrated journey from China to India in the early years of the fifth century of our era, with which our author was evidently well acquainted. That courageous traveller complained that of those who had set out with him some had stopped on the way and others had died, leaving him only his shadow as a companion. End of footnote. These two said that in their country four of our mountains are held in great esteem, namely Tai, Hua, Wu Tai, and Lo Chia. The people there also think that China is paved with yellow gold. Footnote. This may almost be said to have been the belief of the Arabs at the date of the composition of the Arabian Nights. End of footnote that Kuan Yin and Wen Shu are still alive. Footnote. For Kuan Yin, see number 33, note 208. Wen Shu, or Manjusiri, is the god of wisdom, and is generally represented as riding on a lion in attendance together with Pu Xian, the god of action, who rides an elephant, upon Shakyamuni Buddha. End of footnote. And that they have only come here to be sure of their Buddhahood and of immortal life. Hearing these words, it struck me that this was precisely what our own people say and think about the West, and that if travellers from each country could only meet halfway and tell each other the true state of affairs, there would be some hearty laughter on both sides, and a saving of much unnecessary trouble. End of chapter 115、Chapter、116 Of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. The Stolen Eyes. When His Excellency Mr. Tang of our village was quite a child, A relative of his took him to a temple to see the usual theatrical performances. He was a clever little fellow, afraid of nothing and nobody. And when he saw one of the clay images in the vestibule staring at him with its great glass eyes, the temptation was irresistible. And secretly gouging them out with his finger, he carried them off with him. When they reached home, his relative was taken suddenly ill. And remained for a long time speechless. At length, jumping up, he cried out several times in a voice of thunder, Why did you gouge out my eyes? His family did not know what to make of this until little Tang told them what he had done. They then immediately began to pray to the possessed man, saying, A mere child, unconscious of the wickedness of his act, took away in his fun thy sacred eyes. They shall be reverently replaced. Thereupon the voice exclaimed, In that case I shall go away. And he had hardly spoken before Tang's relative fell flat upon the ground and lay there in a state of insensibility for some time. When he recovered, they asked him concerning what he had said, but he remembered nothing of it. The eyes were then forthwith restored to their original sockets. End of chapter 116. Chapter 117 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By San Ling Pu. 
translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. The Invisible Priest Mr. Han was a gentleman of good family, on very good intimate terms with a skillful Taoist priest and magician named Tan, who, when sitting amongst other guests, would suddenly become invisible. Mr. Han was extremely anxious to learn this art, but Tan refused all his entreaties, not, as he said, because I want to keep the secret for myself, but simply as a matter of principle, to teach the superior man would be well enough. Others, however, would avail themselves of such knowledge to plunder their neighbors. There is no fear that you would do this, though even you might be tempted in certain ways. Mr. Han, finding all his efforts unavailing, flew into a great passion, and secretly arranged with his servants that they should give the magician a sound beating. And, in order to prevent his escape through the power of making himself invisible, he had his threshing floor covered with a fine ash dust, so that at any rate his footsteps would be seen, and the servants could strike just above them. He then inveigled Tan to the appointed spot, which had no sooner reached than Han's servants began to belabor him, on all sides with leveren thongs. Tan immediately became invisible, but his footprints were clearly seen as he moved about hither, thither, to avoid the blows, and the servants went on striking above them until finally he succeeded in getting away. Mr. Han then went home, and subsequently Tan reappeared and told the servants that he could stay there no longer, adding that before he went, he intended to give them all a feast in return for many things they had done for him. And diving into his sleeve, he brought forth a quantity of delicious meats and wines, which he spread out upon the table, begging them to sit down and enjoy themselves. The servants did so, and one and all of them got drunk and insensible, upon which Tan picked each of them up and stout them away in his sleeve. When Mr. Han heard of this, he begged Tan to perform some other trick, so Tan drew upon the wall a city, and knocking at the gate with his hand, it was instantly thrown open. He then put inside it his wallet and clothes, and stepping through the gateway himself, waved his hand and bade Mr. Han farewell. The city gates were now closed, and Tan vanished from their sight. It was said that he appeared again in Ching Chow, where he taught little boys to paint a circle on their hands, and, by dabbing this onto another person's face or clothes, to imprint the circle on the place, thus struck without a trace of it being left behind upon the hand. End of chapter 117 Chapter 118 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935. The Censor in Purgatory. Just beyond Fang Chu, there is a fathomless cave which is reputed to be the entrance to purgatory. All the implements of torture employed therein are of human manufacture. Old, worn-out jibes and fetters being occasionally found at the mouth of the cave, and is regularly replaced by new ones, which disappear the same night, and for which the magistrate of the district makes a formal charge in his accounts. Under the Ming dynasty, there was a certain censor named Hua, whose duties brought him to this place. And hearing the story of the cave, he said he did not believe it, but would penetrate into it and see for himself. People tried to dissuade him from such an enterprise. However, he paid no heed to their remonstrances, and entered the cave with a lighted candle in his hand, followed by two attendants. They had proceeded about half a mile, when suddenly the candle was violently extinguished, and Mr. Hua saw before him a broad flight of steps leading up to the ten courts, or judgment halls, in each of which a judge was sitting with his robes and tablets all complete. On the eastern side there was one vacant place, and when the judges saw Mr. Hua, they hastened down the steps to meet him, and each one cried out, so you have come at last, have you? 
I hope you have been quite well since last we met. Mr. Hua asked what the place was, to which they replied that it was the court of purgatory. And then Mr. Hua, in a great fright, was about to take his leave, when the judges stopped him, saying, No, no, sir, that is your seat there. How can you imagine you are to go back again? Thereupon, Mr. Hua was overwhelmed with fear, and begged and implored the judges to forgive him, but the latter declared that they could not interfere with the decrees of fate, and taking down a register of life and death, they showed him that it had been ordained that on such a day of such a month his living body would pass into the realms of darkness. When Mr. Hua read these words, he shivered and shook, as if iced water was being poured down his back, and, thinking of his old mother and his young children, his tears began to flow. At that juncture an angel in golden armor appeared, holding in his hand a document written on yellow silk, before which the judges all performed a respectful obeisance. They then unfolded and read the document, which was nothing more or less than a general pardon from the Almighty for the suffering sinners in purgatory, by virtue of which Mr. Hua's fate would be set aside, and he would be enabled to return once more to the light of day. Thereupon the judges congratulated him upon his release, and started him on his way home. But he had not got more than a few steps of the way before he found himself plunged in total darkness. He was just beginning to despair, when forth from the gloom came a god with a red face and a long beard, rays of light shooting out from his body and illuminating the darkness around. Mr. Hua made up to him at once, and begged to know how he could get out of the cave, to which the god curtly replied, Repeat the sutras of Buddha, and vanished instantly from his sight. Now Mr. Hua had forgotten almost all of the sutras he had ever known. However, he remembered a little of the Diamond Sutra, and, clasping his hands in an attitude of prayer, he began to repeat it aloud. No sooner had he done this than a faint streak of light glimmered through the darkness, and revealed to him the direction of the path. But the next moment he was at loss how to go on, and the light forthwith disappeared. He then set himself to think hard what the next verse was, and as fast as he recollected it, and could go on repeating, so fast that the light reappeared to guide him on his way, until at length he emerged once more from the mouth of the cave. As to the fate of the two servants who accompanied him, it is needless to inquire. End of chapter 118 Chapter 119 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Chapter 119. Mr. Willow and the Locusts. During the Ming Dynasty, a plague of locusts visited Cheng Yen and was advancing rapidly towards the Ai district, when the magistrate of that place, in great tribulation at the pending disaster, retired one day to sleep behind the screen in his office. There he dreamt that a young graduate named Willow, wearing a tall hat and a green robe, and of very commanding stature, came to see him, and declared that he could tell the magistrate how to get rid of the locusts. Tomorrow, said he, on the southwest road, you will see a woman riding on a large jennet. She is the spirit of the locusts. Ask her, and she will help you. The magistrate thought this strange advice, however. He got everything ready, and waited as he had been told, at the roadside. By and by, along came a woman, with her hair tied up in a knot, and a serge cape over her shoulders, riding slowly northwards, on an old mule, whereupon the magistrate burned some sticks of incense, and seizing the mule's bridle, humbly presented a goblet of wine. The woman asked him what he wanted, to which he replied, 
Lady, I implore you to save my small magistry from the dreadful ravages of your locusts. Oh, said the woman, that scoundrel Willow has been letting the cat out of the bag, has he? He shall suffer for it. I won't touch your crops. She then drank three cups of wine and vanished out of sight. Subsequently, when the locusts did come, they flew high in the air and did not settle on the crops, but they stripped the leaves off every willow tree far and wide, and then the magistrate awaked to the fact that the graduate of his dream was the spirit of the willows. Some said that this happy result was owing to the magistrate's care for the welfare of his people. End of chapter 119、Chapter、one hundred and twenty of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume Two by San Ling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935, Mr. Tung, or Virtue Rewarded. At Qingzhou, there lived a Mr. Tung, president of one of his six boards, whose domestic regulations were so strict that the men and women servants were not allowed to speak to each other. One day, he caught a slave girl laughing and talking with one of his attendants, and he gave them both a sound rating. That night he retired to sleep, accompanied by the valet de chambre in his library, the door of which, as it was very hot weather, was left wide open. When the night was far advanced, the valet was awaked by a noise at his master's bed, and opening his eyes, he saw, by the light of the moon, the attendant above mentioned pass out of the door with something in his hand. Recognizing the man as one of the family, he thought nothing of the occurrence, but turned round and went to sleep again. Soon after, however, he was again aroused by the noise of footsteps, tramping heavily across the room, and looking up, he beheld a huge being, with a red face and a long beard, very like the god of war, carrying a man's head. Horribly frightened, he crawled under the bed. And then he heard sounds above him as of clothes being shaken out, and as if someone was being shampooed. In a few moments, the brutes tramped once more across the room and went away. And then he gradually put out his head, and seeing the dawn beginning to peep through the windows, he stretched out his hand to reach his clothes. These he found to be soaked through and through, and on applying his hand to his nose, he smelt the smell of blood. He now called out loudly to his master, who jumped up at once, and by the light of a candle, they saw that the bedclothes and pillows were alike steeped in blood. Just then, some constables knocked at the door, and when Mister Tung went out to see who it was, the constables were all astonishment, for they said a few minutes ago a man rushed wildly up to our yamen and said he had killed his master, and as he himself was covered with blood, he was arrested. And turned out to be a servant of yours. He also declared that he had buried your head alongside the temple of the god of war, and when we went to look there, indeed was a freshly dug hole, but the head was gone. Mister Tung was amazed at all the story, and on proceeding to the magistrate's yamen, he discovered that the man in charge was the attendant whom he had scolded the day before. Thereupon, the criminal was severely bambooed and released. And then Mister Tung, who was unwilling to make an enemy of a man of this stamp, gave him the girl to wife. However, a few nights afterwards, the people who lived next door to a newly married couple heard a terrific crash in their house, and, rushing in to see what was the matter, found that husband and wife, and the bedstead as well, had been cut clean in two, as if by a sword. The ways of the god are many indeed. But few more extraordinary than this. End of chapter one hundred and twenty. Chapter one hundred twenty-one of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio.
Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio. Volume 2. By San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935. The Dead Priest. A certain Taoist priest, overtaken in his wanderings by the shades of evening, sought refuge in a small Buddhist monastery. The monk's apartment was, however, locked, so he threw his mat down in the vestibule of the shrine, and seated himself upon it. In the middle of the night, when all was still, he heard a sound of someone opening the door behind him, and looking round, he saw a Buddhist priest covered with blood from head to foot, who did not seem to notice that anybody else was present. Accordingly, he himself pretended not to be aware of what was going on, and then he saw the other priest enter the shrine, mount the altar, and remaining there some time embracing Buddha's head and laughing by turns. When morning came, he found the monk's room still locked, and, suspecting something was wrong, he walked up to a neighboring village, where he told the people what he had seen. Thereupon the villagers went back with him and broke open the door, and there before them lay the priest weltering in his blood, having evidently been killed by robbers, who had stripped the place bare. Anxious now to find out what had made the disembodied spirit of the priest laugh in the way it had been seen to do, they proceeded to inspect the head of the Buddha on the altar, and, at the back of it, they noticed a small mark, scraping through which they discovered a sum of over thirty ounces of silver. This sum was forthwith used for defraying the funeral expenses of the murdered man. End of chapter 121 Chapter 122 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935. Chapter 122. The Flying Cow. A certain man, who had bought a fine cow, dreamt the same night that wings grew out of the animal's back, and that it had flown away. Regarding this as an omen of some pending misfortune, he led the cow off to market again, and sold it at a ruinous loss. Wrapping up in a cloth the silver he received, he slung it over his back, and was halfway home when he saw a falcon eating part of a hare. Approaching the bird, he found it was quite tame, and accordingly tied it by the leg to one of the corners of the cloth in which his money was. The falcon fluttered about a good deal, trying to escape, and by and by, the man's hold being for a moment relaxed, away went the bird, cloth, money, and all. It was destiny, said the man every time he told a story, ignorant as he was, first, that no faith should be put in dreams, and, secondly, that people shouldn't take things they see by the wayside. Quadrupeds don't usually fly. End of chapter 122《Of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. By San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845-1935. to The Mirror and Listen Trick. At I Tu, there lived a family of the name of Cheng. The two sons were both distinguished scholars, but the elder was early known to fame, and, consequently, the favorite with his parents, who also extended their preference to his wife. The younger brother was a trifle wild, 
which displeased his father and mother very much, and made them regard his wife, too, with anything but a friendly eye. The latter reproached her husband for being the cause of this, and asked him why he, being a man like his brother, could not vindicate the slights that were put upon her. This piqued him, and setting to work in good earnest, he soon gained a fair reputation, though still not equal to his brother's. That year the two went up for the highest degree, and, on New Year's Eve, the wife of the younger, very anxious for the success of her husband, secretly tried the mirror and listen trick. She saw the two men pushing each other in jest, and heard them say, You go and get cool, which remark she was quite unable to interpret for good or for bad, so she thought no more about the matter. After the examination, the two brothers returned home, and one day, when the weather was extremely hot, and their two wives were hard at work in the cookhouse, preparing food for their field laborers. A messenger rode up in hot haste to announce that the elder brother had passed. Thereupon his mother went into the cookhouse, and calling to her daughter-in-law said, Your husband has passed. You go and get cool. Rage and grief now filled the breast of the second son's wife, who, with tears in her eyes, continued her task of cooking, and suddenly another messenger rushed in to say that the second son had passed too. At this, his wife flung down her frying pan and cried out, Now I'll go and get cool. And as in the heat of her excitement she uttered these words, the recollection of her trial of the mirror and listen trick flashed upon her, and she knew that the words of that evening had been fulfilled. End of chapter 123。chapter 124 of strange stories from a Chinese studio, volume 2。this librivox recording is in the public domain。strange stories from a Chinese studio, volume 2。by san ling pu。translated by herbert allen giles。eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five the cattle plague chen hu feng of mengsheng overpowered by the great heat went down and lay under a tree when suddenly up came a man with a thick comforter round his neck who also sat down on a stone in the shade and began fanning himself as hard as he could perspiration all the time running off him like a waterfall Chen rose and said to him with a smile, If, sir, you were to remove that comforter, you would be cool enough without the help of a fan. It would be easy enough, replied the stranger, to take off my comforter, but the difficulty would be in getting it on again. He then went on to converse generally upon other matters, in a manner which betokened considerable refinement, and by and by he exclaimed, what I should like now is just a draught of iced wine, to cool the twelve joints of my sesophagus. Come along then, cried Chen. My house is close by, and I shall be happy to give you what you want. So off they went together, and Chen set before them some capital wine, which he reproduced from a cave, cold enough to numb their teeth. The stranger was delighted, and remained there drinking until late in the evening, when... All at once it began to rain. Chen lighted a lamp, and he and his guest, who now took off the comforter, sat talking together in dishabille. Every now and then the former thought he saw a light coming from the back of the stranger's head, and when at length he had gone off into a tipsy sleep, Chen took the light to examine more closely. He found behind the ears a large cavity, partitioned by a number of membranes, and looking like a lattice, with a thin skin hanging in front of each, spaces being apparently empty. In great astonishment, Chen took a hairpin and inserted it into one of these places, when pfft, out flew something like a tiny cow, which broke through the window and was gone. This frightened Cheng, and he determined to play no more tricks. Just then, however, the stranger waked up. Alas, cried he, you have been at my head and have let out the cattle plague. What is to be done now? Chen asked what he meant, upon which the stranger said, There is no object in further concealment. I will tell you all. 
I am the angel of pestilence for the six kinds of domestic animals. That form which you have let out attacks oxen, and I fear that for miles round few will escape alive. Now Chang himself was a cattle farmer, and when he heard this was dreadfully alarmed and implored the stranger to tell him what to do. What to do? replied he. Why, I shall not escape punishment myself. How can I tell you what to do? However, you will find powdered ku chan, an efficacious remedy. That is, if you don't keep it a secret for your private use. The stranger then departed, first of all piling up a quantity of earth in a niche in the wall, a handful of which, he told Chen, given to each animal might prove of some avail. Before long the plague did break out, and Chen, who was desirous of making a little money by it, told the remedy to no one, with the exception of his younger brother. The latter tried it on his own beasts, with great success, while on the other hand those belonging to Chen himself died off to the number of fifty head, leaving him only four or five old cows, that shewed every sign of soon sharing the same fate. In his distress, Chen suddenly betaught himself the earth in the niche, and, as a last resource, gave some to the sick animals. By the next morning they were quite well, and then he knew that his secrecy about the remedy had caused it to have no effect. From that moment his stock went on increasing, and in a few years he had as many as ever. End of chapter 124「Chapter 125 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. to The Marriage of the Virgin Goddess At Kuai Chi, there is a shrine to the plum virgin who was formerly a young lady named ma and lived at tung wan her betrothed husband dying before the wedding she swore she would never marry and at thirty years of age she died her kinsfolk built a shrine to her memory and gave her the title of a plum virgin some years afterwards a mr chin on his way to the examination happened to pass by the shrine and entering it he walked up and down thinking very much of the young lady in whose honour it had been erected that night he dreamt that a servant came to summon him into the presence of the goddess and that in obedience to her command he went and found her waiting for him just outside the shrine i am deeply grateful to you sir said the goddess on his approach for giving me so large a share of your thoughts, and I intend to repay you by becoming your humble handmaid. Mr. Chin bowed in assent, and then the goddess escorted him back, saying, When your place is ready, I will come and fetch you. On waking in the morning, Mr. Chin was not over-pleased with his dream. However, that very night every one of the villagers dreamt that the goddess appeared, and said that she was going to marry Mr. Chin, bidding them at once prepare an image of him. This the village elders, out of respect for their goddess, positively refused to do, until at length they all began to fall ill. And then they made a clay image of Mr. Chin, and placed it on the left of the goddess. Mr. Chin now told his wife that the plum virgin had come for him, and putting on his official cap and robes, he straightway died. Thereupon his wife was very angry, and, going to the shrine, she first abused the goddess, and then, getting on the altar, slapped her face well. The goddess is now called Chin's virgin wife. End of chapter 125 <laughs> Chapter 126 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Harry Benjamin. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. Chapter 126 The Wine Insect. A Mr. Lin of Chong Shan was extremely fat and so fond of wine that he would often finish a pitcher by himself. However, he owned about fifty acres of land, half of which was covered with millet, and being well off, he did not consider that his drinking would bring him into trouble. One day, a foreign Buddhist priest saw him and remarked that he appeared to be suffering from some extraordinary complaint. Mr. Lin said nothing was the matter with him, whereupon the priest asked him if he often got drunk. Lin acknowledged that he did, and the priest told him that he was afflicted by the wine insect. Dear me, cried Lin in great alarm, do you think you could cure me? The priest declared there would be no difficulty in doing so. But when Lin asked him what drugs he intended to use, the priest said he should not use any at all. He then made Lin lie down in the sun, and tying his hands and feet together, he placed a stoop of good wine about half a foot from his head. By and by, Lin felt a deadly thirst coming on, and the flavour of the wine passing through his nostrils seemed to set his vitals on fire. Just then, he experienced a tickling sensation in his throat, and something ran out of his mouth and jumped into the wine. On being released from his bonds, he saw that it was an insect, about three inches in length, which wriggled about in the wine like a tadpole, and had mouth and eyes all complete. Lin was overjoyed, and offered money to the priest who refused to take it, saying all he wanted was the insect, which he explained to Lin was the essence of wine, and which, on being stirred up in water, would turn it into wine. Lin tried this, and found it was so, and ever afterwards he detested the sight of wine. He subsequently became very thin, and so poor, that he hardly had enough to eat and drink. End of chapter 126 Recording by Harry Benjamin Chapter 127 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Songling Pu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935, Chapter 127, The Faithful Dog. A certain man of Lun Gan, whose father had been cast into prison, and was brought almost to death's door, scraped together one hundred ounces of silver, and set out for the city, to try and arrange for his parents' release. Jumping on a mule, he saw that a black dog belonging to the family was following him. He tried in vain to make the dog remain at home, and when after traveling for some miles, he got off his mule to rest a while. He picked up a large stone and threw it at the dog, which then ran off. However, he was no sooner on the road again than up came the dog, and tried to stop the mule by holding on to its tail. His master beat it off with the whip, whereupon the dog ran barking loudly in front of the mule, and seemed to be using every means in its power to cause his master to stop. The latter thought this a very inauspicious omen, and turning upon the animal in a rage, drove it away out of sight. He now went on to the city, but when in the dusk of the evening he arrived there, he found that about half his money was gone. In a terrible state of mind, he tossed about all night, 
Then all of a sudden it flashed across him that the strange behavior of the dog might possibly have some meaning. So getting up very early, he left the city as soon as the gates were open, and though from the number of passers-by he never expected to find his money again, he went on until he reached the spot where he had got off his mule the day before. There he saw his dog lying dead upon the ground, its hair having apparently been wetted through with perspiration, and lifting up the body by one of its ears, he found his lost silver. Full of gratitude, he bought a coffin and buried the dead animal, and the people now call the place the Grave of the Faithful Dog. End of chapter 127《Chapter 128 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. — Chapter 128. An Earthquake. In 1668 there was a very severe earthquake. — Footnote. The exact date is given the seventeenth of the sixth moon, which would probably fall towards the end of June. End footnote. I myself was staying at Chi Xia, and happened to be that night sitting over a kettle of wine with my cousin Li Tu. All of a sudden we heard a noise like thunder, travelling from the southeast in a northwesterly direction. We were most astonished at this, and quite unable to account for the noise. In another moment the table began to rock, and the wine cups were upset. The beams and supports of the house snapped here and there with a crash, and we looked at each other in fear and trembling. By and by we knew that it was an earthquake, and rushing out we saw houses and other buildings, as it were, fall down and get up again, and amidst the sound of crushing walls we heard the shrieks of women and children, the whole mass being like a great seething cauldron. Men were giddy and could not stand, but rolled about on the ground. The river overflowed its banks, cocks crowed, and dogs barked from one end of the city to the other. In a little while the quaking began to subside, and then might be seen men and women running half-naked about the streets, all anxious to tell their own experiences, and forgetting that they had on little or no clothing. I subsequently heard that a well was closed up and rendered useless by this earthquake, that a house was turned completely round so as to face the opposite direction, that the Chi Xia Hill was riven open, and that the waters of the Yi River flowed in and made a lake of an acre and more. Truly, such an earthquake as this is of rare occurrence. End of chapter 128《Chapter 129 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Maya. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 by Song Ling Fu, translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Making Animals The tricks for bewitching people are many. Sometimes drugs are put in their food, and when they eat, they become dazed, and follow the person who has bewitched them. This is commonly called Ta Xu Pa. In Qiangnan, it is known as Che Xu. Little children are most frequently bewitched in this way. There is also what is called making animals, which is better known on the south side of the river. One day a man arrived at an inn in Yangzhou, leading with him five donkeys. Tying them up near the stable, he told the landlord he would be back in a few minutes, and bade him give his donkeys no water. He had not been gone long before the donkeys, which were standing out in the glare of the sun, began to kick about and make a noise, whereupon the landlord untied them and was going to put them in the shade, when suddenly they spied water and made a rush to get at it. So the landlord 
let them drink, and no sooner had the water touched their lips than they rolled on the ground and changed into women. In great astonishment, the landlord asked them whence they came, but their tongues were tied, and they could not answer. So he hid them in his private apartments, and at that moment their owner returned, bringing with him five sheep. The latter immediately asked the landlord where his donkeys were, to which the landlord replied by offering him some wine, saying, The donkeys would be brought to him directly. He then went out and gave the sheep some water, on drinking which they were all changed into boys. Accordingly, he communicated with the authorities, and the stranger was arrested and forthwith beheaded. End of chapter 129, Making Animals Chapter 130 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2 By San Ling Pu Translated by Herbert Allen Giles 1845 to 1935 cruelly avenged a certain magistrate caused a petty oil vendor who was brought before him for some thrifling misdemeanor and whose statements were very confused to be bambooed to death the former subsequently rose to high rank and having amassed considerable wealth set about building himself a fine house on the day when a great beam was to be fixed in its place among the friends and relatives who arrived to offer their congratulations, he was horrified to see the oil man walk in. At the same instant, one of the servants came rushing up to announce to him the birth of a son, whereupon he mournfully remarked, The house not yet finished, and its destroyer already here. The bystanders thought he was joking, for they had not seen what he had seen. However, when that boy grew up, by his frivolity and extravagance, he quite ruined his father. He was finally obliged himself to go into service, and spent all his earnings in oil, which he swallowed in large quantities. End of chapter 130《ハプロー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・ファンタジー・
He was a miserable-looking creature with a very ragged coat, but nevertheless possessed of a refined and courteous air. The general begged him to be seated, an offer which he accepted, being all the time extremely deferential in his manner. "'I suppose you are pretty good at this,' said the general, pointing to the board. "'Try a bout with one of my friends here.' The stranger made a great many apologies in reply, but finally accepted, and played a game in which, apparently to his great disappointment, he was beaten. He played another with the same result, and now, refusing all offers of wine, he seemed to think of nothing but how to get someone to play with him. Thus he went on, until the afternoon was well advanced, when suddenly, just as he was in the middle of a most exciting game, which depended on a single place, he rushed forward, and throwing himself at the feet of the general, loudly implored his protection. The general did not know what to make of this, however. He raised him up and said, "'It's only a game. Why get so excited?' To this the stranger replied by begging the general not to let his gardener seize him, and when the general asked what gardener he meant, he said the man's name was Ma Cheng. Now this Ma Cheng was often employed as a lictor by the ruler of purgatory, and would sometimes remain away as much as ten days, serving the warrants of death. Accordingly, the general sent off to inquire about him, and found that he had been in a trance for two days." His master cried out that he had better not behave rudely to his guest, but at that very moment the stranger sunk down to the ground and was gone. The general was lost in astonishment. However, he now knew that the man was a disembodied spirit, and on the next day, when Ma Cheng came around, he asked him for full particulars. The gentleman was a native of Hu Xiang, replied the gardener, who was passionately addicted to Wei Qi, and had lost a great deal of money by it. His father, being much grieved at his behavior, confined him to the house, but he was always getting out and indulging the fatal passion, and at last his father died of a broken heart. In consequence of this, the ruler of purgatory curtailed his term of life, and condemned him to be a hungry devil, in which state he has already passed seven years. Footnote. One of the pretas, or the fourth of the six paths, gati, of existence, the other five being one, angels, two, men, three demons, five brute beasts, and six sinners in hell. The term is often used colloquially for a self-invited guest. End footnote. And now that the Phoenix Tower is completed, an order has been issued for the literati to present themselves and compose an inscription to be cut on stone as a memorial thereof, by which means they would secure their own salvation as a reward. Footnote. An imaginary building in the infernal regions. End of footnote. Many of the shades, failing to arrive at the appointed time, God was very angry with the ruler of purgatory, and the latter sent off me, and others who are employed in the same way, to hunt up the defaulters. But as you, sir, bade me treat the gentleman with respect, I did not venture to bind him. The general inquired what had become of the stranger, to which the gardener replied, he is now a mere menial in purgatory, and can never be born again. Alas, cried his master, thus it is that men are ruined by any inordinate passion. Footnote. Mencius reckoned to play Wei Chi for money among the five unfilial acts. End of footnote. End of chapter 131. Chapter 132 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Chuck Williamson, Columbus, Ohio. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845 to 1935. Chapter 132. The Fortune Hunter Punished. A certain man's uncle has no children, and the nephew, with an eye to his uncle's property, volunteered to become his adopted son. When the uncle died, all of the property passed accordingly to his nephew who thereupon broke faith as to his part of the contract. Footnote. That is, in carrying out the obligations he had entered into, 
such as conducting the ceremonies of ancestral worship, repairing the family tombs, etc. End footnote. He did the same with another uncle, and thus united three properties in his own person, whereby he became the richest man of the neighborhood. Suddenly he fell ill, and seemed to go out of his mind, for he cried out, So you wish to live in wealth, do you? And immediately seizing a sharp knife, he began hacking away at his own body until he had strewn the floor with pieces of flesh. He then exclaimed, You cut off other people's posterity and expect to have posterity yourself, do you? And forthwith, he ripped himself open and died. Shortly afterwards, his son too died, and the property fell into the hands of strangers. Is not this a retribution to be dreaded? End of chapter 132「Chapter 133 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by San Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845-1935. Life Prolonged A certain clove merchant of Changqing was stopping at Tainan when he heard of a magician who was said to be very skilled in casting nativities. So we went off at once to consult him, but the magician would not undertake the task, saying, Your destiny is bad. You had better hurry home. At this the merchant was dreadfully frightened, and, packing up his wares, set off towards Changqing. On the way he fell in with a man in short clothes, like a constable, and the two soon struck up a friendly intimacy, taking their meals together. By and by the merchant asked the stranger what his business was, and the latter told him he was going to Changqing to serve summonses, producing at the same time a document, and showing it to the merchant who, on looking closely, saw a list of names at the head of which was his own. In great astonishment he inquired what he had done that he should be arrested thus, to which his companion replied, I am not a living being, I am a lictor in the employ of the infernal authorities, and I presume your term of life has expired. The merchant burst into tears and implored the lictor to spare him, which the latter declared was impossible, but, added he, there are a great many names down, and it will take me some time to get through them. You go off home and settle up your affairs, and, as a slight return for your friendship, I'll call for you last. A few minutes afterwards they reached a stream where the bridge was in ruins, and people could only cross with great difficulty, at which the lictor remarked, You are now on the road to death, and not a single cask can you carry away with you. Repair this bridge and benefit the public, and thus from a great outlay you may possibly yourself derive some small advantage. The merchant said he would do so, and when he got home, he bade his wife and children prepare for his coming dissolution, and at the same time set men to work and made the bridge sound and strong again. Some time elapsed, but no lictor arrived, and his suspicions began to be aroused, when one day the latter walked in and said, I reported that affair of the bridge to the municipal god, who communicated it to the ruler of purgatory. And for that good act, your span of life has been lengthened, and your name struck out of the list. I have now come to announce this to you. The merchant was profuse in his thanks, and the next time he went to Taiyang, he burned a quantity of paper ingots, and made offerings and libations to the lictor out of gratitude for what he had done. Suddenly, the lictor himself appeared and cried out, Do you wish to ruin me? Happily, my new master has only just taken up his post, and he has not noticed this, or where should I be? The lictor then escorted the merchant some distance, and, at parting, 
bade him never return by that road but if he had any business at taing to go thither by a roundabout way End of chapter one hundred and thirty three chapter one hundred and thirty four of strange stories from a chinese studio volume two this librivox recording is in the public domain strange stories from a chinese studio volume two by san ling pu translated by herbert allen giles eighteen forty five to nineteen thirty five the clay image on the river i there lived a man named ma who married a wife from the wang family with whom he was very happy in his domestic life ma however died young and his wife's parents were unwilling that their daughter should remain a widow but she resisted all their importunities and declared firmly that she would never marry again it is a noble resolve of yours i allow argued her mother but you are still a mere girl and you have no children besides i notice that people who start with such rigid determination always end by doing something discreditable and therefore you had better get married as soon as you can which is no more than is done every day but girl swore that she would rather die than consent accordingly her mother had no alternative but to let her alone she then ordered a clay image to be made exactly resembling her late husband and whenever she took her own meals she would set meat and wine before it precisely as if her husband had been there one night she was on the point of retiring to rest when suddenly she saw the clay image stretch itself and stepped down from the table, increasing all the while in height, until it was as tall as a man, and neither more nor less than her own husband. In great alarm she called out to her mother, but the image stopped her, saying, Don't do that. I am but chewing my gratitude for your affectionate care of me, and it is chill and uncomfortable in the realms below. Such devotion as yours, cast its light back on generations gone by and now i who was cut off in my prime because my father did evil and was condemned to be without an heir have been permitted in consequence of your virtuous conduct to visit you once again that our ancestral line may yet remain unbroken every morning at cockrow her husband resumed his usual form and size as the clay image and after a time told her that the hour of separation had come, upon which husband and wife bade each other an eternal farewell. By and by the widow, to the great astonishment of her mother, bore a son, which caused no small amusement among the neighbors who heard the story, and as the girl herself had no proof of what she stated to be the case, a certain beetle of the place who had an old grudge against the husband, went off and informed the magistrate of what had occurred. After some investigation, the magistrate exclaimed, I have heard that the children of disembodied spirits have no shadow, and that those who have shadows are not genuine. Thereupon they took Ma's child into the sunshine, and lo, there was but a very faint shadow, like a thin vapor, the magistrate then drew blood from the child and smeared it on the clay image upon which the blood at once soaked in and left no stain another clay image being produced and the same experiment tried the blood remained on the surface so that it could be wiped away the girl's story was thus acknowledged to be true and when the child grew up and in every feature was the counterpart of ma there was no longer any room for suspicion End of chapter 134. Chapter 135 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Sun Ling Pu. 
Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Chapter 135. Dishonesty Punished. At Chiao Chao, there lived a man named Liu Hsichong, who was steward to His Excellency Mr. Fa. When already over forty, a son was born to him, whom he loved very dearly, and quite spoilt by always letting him have his own way. When the boy grew up, he led a dissolute, extravagant life, and ran through all his father's property. By and by he fell sick, and then he declared that nothing would cure him but a slice off a fat old favorite mule they had, upon which his father had another and more worthless animal killed. But his son found out he was being tricked, and, after abusing his father soundly, his symptoms became more and more alarming. The mule was accordingly killed, and some of it was served up to the sick man. However, he only just tasted it and sent the rest away. From that time he got gradually worse and worse, and finally died, to the great grief of his father, who would gladly have died too. Three or four years afterwards, as some of the villagers were worshipping on Mount Tai, they saw a man riding on a mule, the very image of Mr. Liao's dead son, and on approaching more closely, they saw that it was actually he. Jumping from his mule, he made them a salutation, and then they began to chat with him on various subjects, always carefully avoiding that one of his own death. They asked him what he was doing there, to which he replied that he was only roaming about, and inquired of them in his turn at what inn they were staying. For, added he, I have an engagement just now, but I will visit you to-morrow. So they told him the name of the inn, and took their leave, not expecting to see him again. However, the next day he came, and tying his mule to a post outside, went in to see them. "'Your father,' observed one of the villagers, "'is always thinking about you. Why do you not go and pay him a visit?' The young man asked to whom he was alluding, and at the mention of his father's name, he changed color, and said, "'If he is anxious to see me, kindly tell him that on the seventh of the fourth moon I will await him here.' He then went away, and the villagers returned and told Mr. Liao all that had taken place. At the appointed time, the latter was very desirous of going to see his son, but his master dissuaded him, saying that he thought from what he knew of his son that the interview might possibly not turn out as he would desire. Although, added he, if you are bent upon going, I should be sorry to stand in your way. Let me, however, counsel you to conceal yourself in a cupboard, and thus, by observing what takes place, you will know better how to act, and avoid running into any danger." This he accordingly did, and when his son came, Mr. Fa received him at the inn as before. "'Where's Mr. Liao?' cried the son. "'Oh, he hasn't come,' replied Mr. Fa. "'The old beast! What does he mean by that?' exclaimed his son, whereupon Mr. Fa asked him what he meant by cursing his own father. "'My father!' shrieked the son. "'Why, he's nothing more to me than a former rascally partner in trade, who cheated me out of all my money, and for which I have since avenged myself on him.' What sort of a father is that, I should like to know? He then went out of the door, and his father crept out of the cupboard from which, with the perspiration streaming down him and hardly daring to breathe, he had heard all that had passed, and sorrowfully wended his way home again. End of chapter 135 Recording by Todd Chapter 136 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Chuck Williamson, Columbus, Ohio. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. 1845. To 1935. Chapter 136 The Mad Priest. A certain mad priest, whose name I do not know, lived in a temple on the hills. He would sing and cry by turns without any apparent reason. And once someone saw him boiling a stone for his dinner at the autumn festival of the ninth day of the ninth moon. Footnote. On this day, annually dedicated to kite-flying, 
picnics, and good cheer. Everyone tries to get up to as great an elevation as possible, in the hope, as some say, of thereby prolonging life. It was this day, the 4th of October, 1878, which was fixed for the total extermination of foreigners in Fu Chao. End footnote. An official of the district went up in that direction for the usual picnic, taking with him his chair and his red umbrellas. After luncheon, he was passing by the temple, and had hardly reached the door, when out rushed the priest, barefooted and ragged, and himself opening a yellow umbrella, cried out as the attendants of a mandarin do when ordering the people to stand back. He then approached the official, and made as though he were jesting at him, at which the latter was extremely indignant, and bade his servants drive the priest away. The priest moved off, with the servants after him, and in another moment had thrown down his yellow umbrella, which split into a number of pieces, each piece changing immediately into a falcon and flying about in all directions. The umbrella handle became a huge serpent, with red scales and glaring eyes, and then the party would have turned and fled but that one of them declared it was only an optical delusion and that the creature couldn't do any hurt. The speaker accordingly seized a knife and rushed at the serpent, which forthwith opened its mouth and swallowed its assailant whole. In a terrible fright, the servants crowded round their master and hurried him away, not stopping to draw breath until they were fully a mile off. By and by several of them stealthily returned to see what was going on, and on entering the temple they found that both priest and serpent had disappeared. But from an old ash tree hard by they heard a sound proceeding, a sound as it were of a donkey panting, and at first they were afraid to go near, though after a while they ventured to peep through a hole in the tree which was an old hollow trunk. And there, jammed hard and fast with his head downwards, was the rash assailant of the serpent. It being quite impossible to drag him out, they began at once to cut the tree away, but by the time they had set him free, he was already perfectly unconscious. However, he ultimately came round and was carried home, but from this day, the priest was never seen again. Footnote. This story is intended as a satire on those puffed-up dignitaries who cannot even go to a picnic without all the retinue belonging to their particular rank. End footnote. End of chapter 136. Chapter 137 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Lufer. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Pu Song Ling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. Feasting the Ruler of Purgatory. Footnote. From time immemorial, the Chinese have employed a combination of two sets of characters, numbering ten and twelve respectively, to form a cycle of sixty terms for the purpose of chronological notation. The birthday on which any person completes his cycle is considered a very auspicious occasion. At Qinghai there lived a young man named Xiao, whose family was very poor. On the occasion of his mother completing her cycle, he arranged a quantity of meat offerings and wine on a table in the courtyard, and proceeded to invoke the gods in the usual manner. But when he rose from his knees, lo and behold, all the meat and wine had disappeared. His mother thought that this was a bad omen, and that she was not destined to enjoy a long life. However, she said nothing on the subject to her son, who was himself quite at a loss to account for what had happened. A short time afterwards, 
the literary chancellor arrived. Footnote. The examiner for the bachelor's, or lowest degree. And young Chow, scraping together what funds he could, went off to present himself as a candidate. On the road, he met with a man who gave him such a cordial invitation to his house that he willingly accepted, and the stranger led him to a stately mansion, with towers and terraces rising one above the other as far as the eye could reach. In one of the apartments was a king, sitting upon a throne, who received Shao in a very friendly manner, and, after regaling him with an excellent banquet, said, I have to thank you for the food and drink you gave my servants that day we passed your house. Xiao was greatly astonished at this remark, when the king proceeded. I am the ruler of purgatory. Don't you recollect sacrificing on your mother's birthday? The king then bestowed on Xiao a packet of silver, saying, Pray accept this in return for your kindness. Xiao thanked him and retired, and in another moment the palace and its occupants had one and all vanished from his sight, leaving him alone in the midst of some tall trees. On opening his packet he found it to contain five ounces of pure gold, and after defraying the expenses of his examination half was still left, which he carried home and gave to his mother. End of chapter. Chapter 138 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christy Lufer. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Pu Song Ling. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles. The Picture Horse. A certain Mr. Chai, of Lin Ching, was too poor to keep his garden walls in repair, and used often to find a strange horse lying down on the grass inside. It was a black horse, marked with white, and having a scrubby tail which looked as if the end had been burnt off, and though always driven away, would still return to the same spot. Now Mr. Tsai had a friend, who was holding an appointment in Shanxi, and though he had frequently felt desirous of paying him a visit, he had no means of travelling so far. Accordingly, he one day caught the strange horse, and, putting a saddle on its back, rode away, telling his servants that if the owner of the horse should appear, he was to inform him where the animal was to be found. The horse started off at a very rapid pace, and in a short time they were thirty or forty miles from home. But at night it did not seem to care for its food, so the next day Mr. Chai, who thought perhaps illness might be the cause, held the horse in and would not let it gallop so fast. However, the animal did not seem to approve of this, and kicked and foamed until at length Mr. Tsai let it go at the same old pace, and by midday he had reached his destination. As he rode into the town, the people were astonished to hear of the marvelous journey just accomplished, and the prince sent to say he should like to buy the horse. Mr. Chai, fearing that the real owner might come forward, was compelled to refuse this offer. But when, after six months had elapsed, no inquiries had been made, he agreed to accept eight hundred ounces of silver and handed over the horse to the prince. He then bought himself a good mule and returned home. Subsequently, the prince had occasion to use the horse for some important business at Lin Ching, and when there it took the opportunity to run away. The officer in charge pursued it right up to the house of a Mr. Tsang, who lived next door to a Mr. Chai, and saw it run in and disappear. Thereupon he called upon Mr. Tsing to restore it to him, and on the latter declaring that he had never even seen the animal, the officer walked into his private apartments, where he found, hanging on the wall, a picture of a horse by Tzu Ang, exactly like the one he was in search of and with part of the tail burnt away by a joss-stick. It was now clear that the prince's horse was a supernatural creature, but the officer, 
being afraid to go back without it, would have prosecuted Mr. Tsing had not Chai, whose eight hundred ounces of silver had since increased to something like ten thousand, stepped in and paid back the original purchase money. Mr. Tsing was exceedingly grateful to him for this act of kindness, ignorant, as he was, of the previous sale of the horse by Tsai to the prince. End of chapter Chapter 139 of Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nemo. Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, Volume 2, by Song Ling Pu. Translated by Herbert Allen Giles, 1845 to 1935. Chapter 139. The Butterfly's Revenge. Mr. Wang of Chan Shen was in the habit, when a district magistrate, of commuting the fines and penalties of the penal code, inflicted on the various prisoners, for a corresponding number of butterflies. These he would let go, all at once in the court, rejoicing to see them fluttering hither and thither, like so many tinsel snippings, borne about by the breeze. One night he dreamt that a young lady, dressed in gay-colored clothes, appeared to him and said, your cruel practice has brought many of my sisters to an untimely end, and now you shall pay the penalty of thus gratifying your taste. The young lady then changed into a butterfly and flew away. Next day, the magistrate was sitting alone over a cup of wine when it was announced to him that the censor was at the door, and out he ran at once to receive his excellency with a white flower that some of his women had put in his official hat, still sticking there. His Excellency was very angry at what he deemed a piece of disrespect to himself, and, after severely censuring Mr. Wong, turned round and went away. Thenceforward, no more penalties were commuted for butterflies. End of chapter 139